since then um, we've been holding an LCB annually and our um, participation has really grown partly because the last three years we've been virtual, fully virtual. So this allows a lot of people from around the world that couldn't participate before um, be here and, and be part of this community. Um, but the other, uh, I think, factor is that we're able to offer MLCB free of charge. So there is, you know, it's um, completely free to participate and that's because of our generous sponsor. So we'll thank uh, our sponsor at the end as well. Um, so also the, the number of submissions um, to MLCB has been growing over the years. So back in like 10 years ago, we typically got around 40 to 50 submissions. And from those, we could select a small number for oral, oral presentations. The last few years, this has increased um, significantly, although we had some um, a little bit of a pandemic gap, which we tend to be recovering from now. So this year, we got around 100 submissions. Um, 16 of those were selected for oral, oral presentations. And um, we have a few really exciting spotlight presentations as well. Um, the last two years, we've also allowed this option to submit full, publicate, full um, submissions of eight-page papers for publication in the PMLR slash MLCB proceedings. And the uptake of this has been increasing rapidly. So this year we had a, a much larger number of um, papers that were submitted to this track. And uh, 11 of these were selected based on um, reviews for publication in the PMLR proceeding. And you should um, watch out for that. That will come, become available early in January. It's also always fun to see what's remained the same and what's changed. So we can look at the word crowd cloud of all the title of submissions back in 2004 and the ones from last year. Um, so if you um, look at this picture, do two pictures very closely, you'll see some of the similar phrases and keywords, but they're also new stuff. So data is much more prominent. Deep learning is much more prominent. We have a whole new area of um, research based on single cell genomics. So we can also ask the same thing, what, have, what changed between last year and this year? And again, as expected, you see a lot of similar um, keywords and phrases, but there are some differences. Um, so timely, we have multimodal learning and multimodal um, and kind of directions. We have language models, um, spatial genomics, um, but also some of the terms from back in 2004 are starting to come back. And this is kind of interesting too. So there's protein-protein interactions that were, I think, were absent last year and now they're making a comeback and graphs on networks um, seems to also be making a comeback. Um, so uh, we're very thankful for the program committee and area chairs that help us review all the submissions in a timely way and put together the program that you see um, today. So uh, um, special thanks to all of our area chairs. I'm David Kelly from Calico, Hun Chu from Broad MIT, Jason Ernst from UCLA, Manu Seti um, from Fred Hutch, Maria Chikina from UPIT, Peter Ku from Cold Spring Harbor Labs, Sebastian Lemu from um, UDEM, Yuli from McGill and Sushmita Roy from University of Wisconsin. So our area chairs and program committee really help us to review all the submissions that we receive and um, kind of, as, as you'll see that really high quality of um, presentations that are selected. And finally, um, this is the plan for the next two days. We're gonna have three really exciting keynotes starting from Anshul Kundaji's talk um, and then two other keynotes, Smita Krishwami and Mohammed al Qurashi tomorrow. We have um, 16 oral presentations, 10 spotlight talks. We have two poster sessions. So all poster presenters are encouraged to present uh, both today and tomorrow. Um, and we also have a very exciting industry panel that um, is tomorrow at 9 a.m. So I'm gonna pass it to Suen, who is gonna introduce our um, very exciting first keynote speaker. Thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, so... Um, I'm actually not sure if we need the introduction. Everyone knows Anshul. He's extremely visible in the field, but I just want to be formal. So Anshul Kundaji is a faculty member in genetics and um, com computer science at Stanford University. Uh, his lab develops machine learning methods for large scale integrative analysis and functional genomics to decode um, regulatory elements and pathways across diverse cell types and tissue to understand their role and you know, normal functions and diseases. And he completed a PhD in computer science um, from Columbia University and it was a postdoc at Stanford um, and research scientist at MIT and abroad. And, and uh, he was basically running this you know, large uh, functional genomic consortia 
um, and ENCODE and then Roadmap um, Epigenomic Project. And he received a, a number of prestigious awards, including this Chen Award of uh, Excellence um, and the NIH Director's New Innovative Award and then, and then Sloan Award. And now he's a member of NIH Director's Ad uh, Advisory Committee for AI um, in Biomedical Research and currently part of the NHGRI Genomic uh, Data Science Working Group. So today um, he's going to tell us about his work on uh, deep neural, you know, deep learning um, for this regulatory sequence code. Thank you, Suvin. <clears throat> Can I share my screen? Okay, let's see. Right, uh... Okay, great. Do you see the Do you see the big screen? Okay, awesome. Uh, let me just switch this. Okay, so um, firstly, um, I'm super excited to give a talk at my favorite conference ever. <laughs> uh, I've been an organizer for a long time, and of course, uh, very kind of the organizers to uh, invite me to present uh, this year. Um, so originally, I thought of like, I had an ambitious plan of like, in 40 minutes, showing you uh, a gallery of like, all the kinds of stuff you can do with deep neural networks and genomics. And I almost got there, but I couldn't do do it successfully in forty minutes. So I I thought I'd rather like focus and uh, present you know like one story and uh, slightly more machine learning focused, um, and more on the modeling side of things. So my title talk is slightly different, and I'm going to talk about um, relatively new work. Uh, you know, it's almost um, should be almost out in a few weeks. Um, uh, this is really um, a new kind of uh, neural network model. Uh, which is trying to learn the sequence basis of chromatin accessibility at single cell res at single base resolution, not yet single cell resolution. <laughs> and this is really a uh, fabulous work done by uh, Anushri uh, in collaboration with with Anna. So, um, all right. So, just to give you some uh, initial introduction, as you know, uh, we're talking about uh, DNA elements that regulate uh, transcription. Um, these are typically uh, sequences of DNA that uh, encode um, sequence motifs and complex syntax and grammar. And these sequence motifs uh, um, act as landing pads, binding sites for various uh, regulatory proteins called transcription factors. And you know, one of the really exciting things um, uh, and unknown things as yet is actually um, what is the precise sequence code of these elements? Uh, how has evolution effectively resulted in this complex code? Um, and uh, you know there are sequence motifs, as I mentioned before. Um, they are not deterministic words; they are fuzzy. Uh, they have uh, all kinds of variation, um, and there's a soft and hard syntax included in the in the sequence. So there's distances constraints, orientation constraints, and so forth. And whenever these proteins uh, bind uh, DNA, they produce uh, what's called accessible chromatin. So they push the nucleosomes apart um, and create accessible chromatin. And collectively, you know, the combination of nucleosomes, transcription factors, the various histone modifications uh, on these uh, nucleosomes and uh, chromatin, they constitute the state of regulatory DNA. So um, the talk today is really going to focus on decoding regulatory DNA, and we're going to focus on a specific type of assay called um, chromatin that, that measures chromatin accessibility, uh, specifically um, ATAC-seq and, and DNA-seq. Uh, these are uh, assays that use uh, enzymes like the TN5 enzyme uh, or the DNAs enzyme. Uh, they cleave essentially a DNA in open chromatin, so you get fragments and reads from the genome that are enriched in regions that are bound by these transcription factors. Right, so you get these beautiful signals over the genome um, in whatever cell type or cell state of interest. And then we really want to understand um, the underlying driver, you know, causal sequence code that's uh, resulting in all this beautiful dynamic activity across the genome and across cell types and cell states. And so um, typically the way this is modeled as a machine learning task is uh, given su uh, one such track of DNA seq or attack seq data, um, you can um, you essentially get training data for free. So you have the sequence of the genome, 3 billion base pairs if it's the human genome, and then you've got a, a, a coverage track of signal from the sequencing experiment. And uh, you can bin these um, the genome into into little chunks. Let's say thousand or two thousand base pairs each, or hundred base pairs each. Um, and then um, what you end up getting is uh, millions of pieces of sequence mapped to labels. And these labels could be either 
a binary, uh, like using some kind of uh, you know, peak caller or something to label uh, regions as bound or unbound or accessible and accessible. Um, uh, or you can keep them continuous values too. So it basically transforms into a classification or regression task where your goal is to map sequences to labels. And there's been tons of really exciting work in this space uh, and continues to be. So uh, one, one key difference with respect to sort of the model I'm presenting today is um, most previous models either um, operate on the genome at relatively low resolution, you know, 200 base pairs or so, um, and often will use um, binary scalar labels. So they will take a sequence and summarize it into a scalar label, you know, uh, plus one, zero, um, or some kind of uh, uh, summation of read counts or enrichment in that region. So uh, especially with DNA-seq and attack-seq experiments, there is a lot of loss of information through this process. And the reason is because when proteins bind DNA, they produce, um, they essentially protect the DNA from cleavage from the enzymes. And so they produce these very beautiful characteristic footprints often. And so the shapes of the profiles actually contain really exquisite information about the protein DNA binding interface. And by sort of, if you take this, this sort of high resolution signal and you summarize it into a scalar, you're actually losing a lot of information. So, um, you know, uh, what determines these footprint shapes? Well, there are several components, um, TFs bind sequences, and there's something called residence time of the transcription factor. That determines, for example, how deep the footprint is. Um, but there are many other, other aspects too. So affinity of the underlying motif sequence uh, can, can actually affect uh, the shape of the footprints and the depth. Um, you can have effects of nearby sequence uh, context, you know, through syntax and cooperativity. Uh, transcription factor concentration can certainly affect occupancy and therefore footprint uh, profiles. And then of course, all these uh, experiments, they are, they are done using specific enzymes and each of these enzymes have various sequence biases. So uh, the observed data that you get from the experiment is not just biology, but it also is definitely a function of, uh, of enzyme preferences. And so you need to really account for all of this and can we use neural networks to really you know, tear apart all this information. So uh, the model I'm going to introduce to you is based, based on um, uh, the BPNet model that we published in 2021. Uh, we call this Chrome BPNet. Um, initially, you might think, well, this looks exactly like BPNet. Yeah, that's because it actually is. Uh, it takes in a 2KB uh, sequence input, and um, you have uh, a series of uh, convolution layers. These are dilated convolution with residual connections. And you have about eight, eight or nine of such residual blocks. And what they allow you to do is eventually obtain a receptive field that is uh, basically 2KB. So, you know, a, an output position, uh, the output uh, of, the, of the neural network at the final layer uh, effectively gets to see uh, 2KB. So it's, it's a reasonably, um, you know, full length receptive field. But the key aspect of uh, BPNet and Chrome BPNet is we don't map sequences to scalar values. We actually map them to the profiles at single base resolution. So the 2KB sequence is mapped to a thousand base pair uh, profile uh, of read counts, of raw read counts at single base resolution. And what we do is we break up the prediction task into uh, uh, the profile prediction task into, into two subtasks. One task is to predict the, the scalar, the total counts, or the log of the total counts uh, of reads uh, over the 2KB sequence. Um, so that's a simple number. That's like how people have done it previously. Just summarizes the sequence of the scalar. But then what we do is there is another loss function here. And that loss function tries to um, model, the uh, tries to um, account for the, uh, the profile at single base resolution. So this is a multinomial loss function. And it really is trying to um, penalize the model to accurately predict uh, the probability of observing reads at individual basis. So you might you might think, why are we doing this? Like, why not just uh, you know predict? Like, you could use a Poisson loss function, for example, at every base pair that could help. You'll see why it is actually very useful to break the signal into these two complementary properties: the total number of reads falling on the sequence, and then how those reads are precisely distributed over every position. Uh, in the in the in in the sequence, so one is capturing shape, and the other is capturing magnitude, and we're sort of separating these two uh, orthogonal components uh, out, right? 
Um, and, and so you, you know, you use the standard uh, mean squared error loss function for the total counts and you use a multinomial loss function uh, for the profile um, and you fit this model across, um, you know, peak regions of the genome as well as background, okay? So the model actually does really well. This is an example of uh, attack seq data and this is DNA seq data for the same cell type. This is GM1287 and LCL uh, at single base resolution. You can see the observed and predicted reads at single base resolution almost look identical. The predictions look almost identical to the observed data. So this model is really, you know, doing really quite well. Um, but let's quantify this. So um, if you look at the count head, we, I'm going to talk about the count head and the profile head often. The count head predicts the scalar total counts, and the profile head predicts the probability distribution of counts uh, at single base resolution. Okay? So for the total counts, uh, what are each point here is a region in the genome. Uh, these are uh, peak regions as well as um, um, a large number of background uh, sequences matched for GC composition. Uh, and here you're seeing on test data, held out chromosomes, uh, the observed counts and the predicted counts. And you're seeing we're doing pretty well, it's 0. 0.7. This is like an average model. Uh, we often get anywhere ranging from 0. 0.65 to 0. 0.8 in that, in that zone. Um, on this plot, um, wait, why is there no, okay, there you go. Um, uh, on this plot, I'm showing you uh, another performance metric, which is capturing the profile prediction task. So remember the profile prediction task is uh, the, the observed profile and the predicted profile uh, probability distributions or sequences, uh, two KB sequence or one KB uh, sequences. So what we're doing is we're comparing two probability distributions, the observed uh, distribution of reads uh, across the sequence and the predicted distribution of reads. So we can use, for example, a Jensen Shannon distance and the lower the better, right? That would mean the predicted profile is very similar to the observed profile. And this blue distribution is showing the distribution of the Jensen Shannon distance or um, uh, all the all the bins um, in this plot at single base resolution. But then how do we calibrate this? So how do we know if this is good or bad? Well, we can take pseudo replicates. So we can take the, the actual data, we can sort of subsample reads and get um, you know, pseudo replicates and we can measure the similarity in, uh, in the profiles or the distance um, between pseudo replicates. So that's sort of the upper bound, right? That's about as, as good as you can do. You just resample the reads, how similar are the profiles. So that's the red distribution. So we are, we are not that far away, we're partially overlapping it. And then what's the lower bound? Well, you can have two lower bounds. One is a random profile. You just shuffle the profiles. Uh, that's obviously like a trivial lower bound. So that's the gray distribution. And then you can take the average profile. You just take the average observed profile over all peak regions and use that to predict um, in, uh, use that as a predictor, that's the green distribution, right? So we are, we are actually pretty far from both bounds, lower bounds, and we're quite, quite close or overlapping at least uh, replicate concordance, right? So we're pretty happy, so it looks pretty nice. Um, all right, so now that we have a model, we can try to do stuff with it. So the first thing you can do is you can take a profile and we want to understand you know, what in the sequence is driving the profile. So uh, we use DeepLift uh, and the new implementation DeepShap from, uh, from uh, Suin's lab, uh, which is really nice, very efficient, uh, generalizable implementation. So we've actually now deprecated DeepLift. We don't actually develop on it anymore. We just use Suin's DeepShap, which is fantastic. Um, so what we do is we take the profile and we take the logits at each position. We compute a, a weighted sum of the logits and we backpropagate it through the model. And what we end up with is um, we're using um, these uh, deep sharp, um, we get end up the end up with these deep sharp contribution scores that give us like an additive decomposition of the contribution of every base in the sequence uh, to the profiles. Now we can do this for the count head and the profile head. So remember we have two heads, right? So you can backpropagate the log counts, or you can backpropagate the sum of the logits or the profile. And I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of show you uh, interpretations from both heads. It's quite interesting to see what's going on. Um, so here's an example of what happens. Uh, so this is again, a region of the genome. Here are some peaks. You take this peak and you zoom in and you see this is the observed profile at single base resolution, the predicted profile, again, really similar, right? Like incredibly accurate. Now we look under the hood and we look at what the model says is driving the counts, the total counts. And you see, oh, look, cool, a CDCF motif. Very nice, very clean attributions, right? 
Now you look at the profile head and you see something mm, not so uh, nice. There's obviously the CDCF motif again. Uh, it's the same model, just has two heads, it's the same data. We're interpreting the total counts against the shape. When you look at the total counts at CDCF, when you look at the shape, you, you see CDCF, but you see a bunch of other stuff jumping up and down. And if you try to match this to any known motifs in the, in the literature, it doesn't match anything. So something's off, something's weird. Like the, the count head and the profile are not agreeing. And there is something else driving profile shape than counts. So uh, we try to figure out what's going on. Is this just an artifact in this region or is it happening genome wide? So we can take, um, we can take all our sequences in the genome. Uh, we can, uh, all our peak regions in the genome, uh, we can use deep lift or deep shaft to get uh, contribution scores of every base. And then we use TF Modisco, um, which is a, a, a motif discovery method. What it does is it takes these deep lift or deep shaft profiles. It highlights, uh, identifies regions of high importance, uh, which we call secrets, and then we cluster these using a, a graph uh, clustering algorithm. And um, we collapse these, um, these um, um, aligned and similar uh, clustered uh, secrets into non-redundant motifs, okay? So um, we can do this for the count head. So we, let's take a tag seek and GM12878. When we do this for the count head, we get beautiful motifs. These are the top, top 10 or 15. There's, there's a bunch, there's about 40, 30, 35 to 40 motifs that pop out. So all of this makes a ton of sense. These are all classic LCL motifs. But if we do this for the profile head, uh, something really weird happens. So like you see these, um, these motifs, which again, don't match any transcription factors. Uh, you do see some TF motifs, uh, CDCF, SPY1, drunks, and so forth, but uh, it's completely dominated by these other motifs. And these motifs, eventually, when you learn, when you consolidate them using TF Morisco, you realize that this is, in fact, exactly uh, the enzyme preference bias of TN5. So here you see the beautiful advantage of splitting the signal into profiles and counts. If you did not do that, you would just think everything's working fine because th the total counts appear to be unaffected by bias. On the other hand, the profile shape is extremely affected by bias. It seems to be completely done. Like the TN5 motifs are almost orders of magnitude more prevalent um, in the profile head important scores uh, than uh, the, uh, the actual TF motifs, right? So this is a problem, but it's not a surprise, but it's kind of nice to see the neural network really decomposing the signal in these ways and that we can tear it apart. Um, so people have, of course, found enzyme bias before, and they've found ways to correct it. So how do you how do you estimate enzyme bias? Well, you can do two things. You can perform a naked DNA TN5 transposition experiment where you just take naked DNA and you you attack it with TN5, and you get you know cuts across the genome. And if there were no bias, you would get a random distribution, right? Uh, but if, but if there is a bias, then you would get preferential cutting at positions where the enzyme likes to cut. There is another option where you can take the actual attack seek data set. And if you go outside peak regions, right, the background of the genome, that is also essentially giving you some uh, version of enzyme bias because outside peak regions, there should be uh, no other sequence preference other than the preference of TN5, right? There aren't transcription factors or anything like that. But the nice advantage of this chromatin background is you're looking at the background of T the background transposition bias of TN5 in the presence of chromatin, right? Whereas this is on naked DNA. So they could be the same or may not be the same. And let's see. So what people have done typically is taken this kind of data and you just learn a position weight matrix or a KMR model. Uh, you know, wherever you see the reads, you, you place a window of sequence and you, you just compute up, you know, just aggregate small KMRs, you align them precisely at the read centers. You can come up with these uh, position weight matrices, PWMs or DWMs or KMR models. So this is a hint attack method and the Tobias method. So you end up with very simple, uh, you know, PWM or KMR representations of the bias. And then what you do is you uh, take this bias motif and you scan the entire genome and the bias motif predicts bias at single base resolution. The reason you do this is because the experimental bias is very sparse. It's not deep enough to get really high resolution signal. So you hence you learn a sequence model of the bias and then you just impute a bias at single base resolution. This sounds great. So uh, what people typically do is they will compute this bias track for the genome 
and then they'll use some kind of explicit statistical correction. You'll take the observed signal, you'll get an expected signal from a rescaled, arbitrarily rescaled bias track, and then they will do some kind of subtraction or log ratio, right? Uh, this is the classical way of doing bias corrected footprinting in the literature. So what we said is, okay, you know what? Uh, our Chrome VPNet model is completely learning bias in the profile head. Why don't we just use to bias or, 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 or hint attack, let it do the correction and let's just fit to the corrected data, right? Why are we bothering with trying to model the data in its rawest form? So we did that. We actually took, um, uh, we did fitted the exact same model, but this time, instead of looking at the raw data, we took uh, a TN5 KMR PWM corrected uh, attack seek track. So from hint attack or Tobias. And then we did the same thing again. We ran deep lift and Modisco on this sort of corrected model. And unfortunately, um, it doesn't actually work. So it, it partially corrects the bias, but you still have huge amounts of uh, TN5 reference. You can see the motifs got shorter and smaller because it sort of works, but it doesn't completely eliminate, eliminate the bias. So one nice thing you notice is the neural network acts like a very nice test bed. If you have a bias correcting approach and you want to really test. So, so far when people have reported bias correction, they can't really prove that the bias is gone or not. You know, you just sort of visualize footprints and they look better and you say, okay, it's corrected bias. We can actually now just fit a neural network to that bias corrected track. And if there is no bias, you should not see it in the deep shaft scores and you should not see it in Modisco, right? So you, you can see partial correction happening. So this is not really great. The other thing we found is, and maybe others have found this too, is if you take naked DNA and you learn a simple bias PWM for a taxi from naked DNA, you pick up a motif. If you learn it from background chromatin from various attack seek data sets, they're actually not the same. So naked DNA preferences of TN5 are not exactly the same as TN5 preferences in chromatin. So if you use naked DNA, uh, you know, TN5 um, bias model to correct the data, it's going to insufficiently correct it because there is additional bias that this PWM cannot correct for. However, even if you use a background corrected PWM or chemo model, it's the same thing. It doesn't like hint attack and Tobias cannot completely correct the signal. Okay. So what can we do? Well, use a neural network, right? Why do you need to stick to a PWM or a chemo model? So what we do is we just learn a bias model. We take the BPNet model, uh, a Chrome BPNet model, but we simplify it. We make it into a much smaller, uh, smaller capacity model. And we train it, instead of training it on peaks, we just train it on the background, okay? We train on the rest of the genome and let it learn sequence bias. And when we now interpret this model, we actually see something really cool, that TN5 bias is not just captured by one motif, there are actually at least five or six motifs. And it's a complex recognition code, just like any other protein, TN5 doesn't bind a position weight matrix. It actually binds a complex sequence recognition code and a neural network beautifully captures it and DeepShap and TF Modisco perfectly pull out the various uh, you know, versions of the TN5 bias. This is the reason why a simple KMR or PWM model don't fully correct the data is because the recognition code is more complex, right? The same way a simple PWM or KMA model doesn't capture transcription factor binding or attack seek very accurately. It's the same reason. It's, it's an oversimplification of the sequence preference. All right, so now we have a nice bias model. So now what can we do? Well, now we have a bias factorized Chrome BPNet model. I think this is a very powerful approach, okay? So I highly suggest, uh, you know, you, you take this idea and apply it to everything you see in genomics. Uh, the, the, the neural network can essentially be self-correcting, okay? You know, what we're doing is we're learning the bias from the experiment, right? You do an ataxic experiment, you get a bunch of reads, you train a bias model on the background, you get a bias model, you freeze it, okay? And now you have this kind of residual architecture where this was the, the, the bottom half was the original Chrome BPNet model, right? What we're doing, we're going to have two parallel paths from sequence to profile. One path goes through the bias model and that bias model is pre-trained and frozen. And then you, are, you have uh, the, the original Chrome BPNet model, right? This is, this is free. You're going to learn parameters for this model. But the final output is essentially a combination of these two, right? So you're trying to explain the profiles and the counts as much as possible from the bias model and any residual signal that you cannot explain you know, by using the frozen bias model, 
that is learned by this component of the model, right? So it's a two phase training process. You first train the bias model, you freeze it, you fit the bias model to the data, then you freeze that entire component. And now you activate this module and you train it. It's simple residual subtraction. So what we've done is we've learned bias for free and we've learned how to correct it for free as well. The neural network can make adjustments to the scale and the magnitude and can do any kind of transformation it needs to do to do the best possible bias correction it can do. And when we do that, it works beautifully, right? So this is the same profile head. And now if you, if you operate the bias, uh, if you train it this way and then you disconnect the bias track, right? You just set this component to zero. So basically now you subtracted out the bias and you take the residual signal, you deep shaft that and you run Modisco on that bias corrected signal you end up with just classic TF motifs and the count head and the profile head completely agree, okay? So beautifully now you can see uh, by breaking the uh, data into these two components and then by running a bias correction, uh, a bias factorized model, you can self correct the data, okay? And you can see this correction beautifully. If you take these, uh, those TN5 motifs that I showed you, those five or six motifs, what you can do is you can take the model, you can create synthetic sequences and you can dump TN5 motifs in them. And you can just propagate these synthetic sequences through the model. This is Chrome PPNet without bias. You see that, you see these spikes? Clearly the model is responding to these motifs, right? These TN5 motifs, these big spikes, uh, fake footprints. If you take the TN5 bias model, you see that the spikes are exactly what you see in the Chrome PPNet model, right? So these spikes you're seeing are exactly coming from TN5. And once you take the bias factorized model, where you subtract out the bias and you now make predictions uh, with using these motifs, you end up with completely flat tracks, complete bias correction, almost perfect. Okay, so now you can run this on many different uh, data sets and you pick up beautiful TF motifs. Um, you know, for LCLs, KFI 62 fg 2s very sanitized specific motifs, right? Now, I would just want to show you how um, amazing the correction actually is. So. Here I'm showing you, uh, you know, uh, four different motifs. These are four different transcription factors that have very sanitized specific activity, at least three of them. NF kappa B is very specific to GM12878, which is an LCL. GATA1 is very specific to KFF62. HNF4 is very specific to HEPG2. These are not even expressed in the other cell lines. And SP1 is consistently expressed in all three cell, cell lines. So what you see is uh, if you don't do bias correction, you see these quickly, the red profiles are the uncorrected predicted profiles. They look almost identical across the four different, three different cell types, you know, for, for each motif. The black ones are the bias corrected ones. You see these beautiful footprints pop up and they are super cell type specific. You see a kind of a moderately deep footprint for NF kappa B, a shallow footprint for GATA1, an ultra deep footprint for HNF4, and SP1, you know, identical footprint across all of them, right? So you can get these really beautiful bias corrected marginal footprints at single base resolution, and you get uh, really nice cell type specificity from them. Uh, let's see this correction in action. So um, this is the same locus I showed you before. Remember these, uh, these weird noisy signals from the profile head? So this is the uncorrected data. Now this is the bias model. You notice this noise that you see at the edge is exactly what you pick up from the bias model, right? So the deep shaft is really decomposing the bias. You see the CDCF motif is not showing up in the bias model, because obviously CDCF has no effect on uh, TN5 bias. Um, and now this is the residual model. This is a bias factorized model. This is the latent footprint that was hiding under this data, right? This is the observed data, these spiky crappy reads. You might think this broad thing is the footprint. It's not. The footprint actually is this beautiful narrow footprint hugging the motif. And you know you see this residual footprint pop up at single base resolution at individual enhancer at, at an individual regulatory element. And just to show you, uh, this is what hint attack does. This is the corrected profile doesn't really do a good job. And this is what Tobias does. Right? So you can really see the difference between using a neural network for bias correction in terms of not just the imputed footprints but also the interpretations against uh, pre-processed. Uh, corrected model from a PWM or a KMR bias correction, right? So very dramatic. And, and I, we picked, I, you know, I picked this locus because uh, everyone knows what a CDCF footprint looks like, and this is really a gold standard in some sense. 
Now, what's also amazing is um, if you do this for like, you can do exactly the same thing, not just for taxi, you can do it for DNA seq. You can do it for any enzyme. It doesn't matter, right? Like you can, you can just learn the bias from the background and then correct it, um, self-correcting neural network, right? So here I'm showing you a taxi and DNA seq data for the same cell line. And this is a particular region in the genome. This is the smooth attack seq track. This is the attack seq track at single base resolution. This is the predicted attack seq track uncorrected at single base resolution. This is the corrected attack seq track. You can see these beautiful footprints popping up, right? This is the deep shaft scores, the profile and the count head. You can see exactly identical, very similar. Now this is DNAs. Again, at low resolution, it looks kind of, kind of similar to attack seq, right? At high resolution, you can notice that the, the DNA's track is very different from the attack seq track. They look completely different. There's no similarity. But once you do correction, notice how the footprints align beautifully and the deep shafts are literally identical. So when people say DNAs and attack are different, they're only different because the enzymes are different. Like the enzyme bias is different. Uh, what they're really capturing is essentially chromatin accessibility. And the latent signal, the bias-free signal, is what the neural network can pop out after you do bias correction, respectively for DNA seq and attack seq. Uh, I'll skip this slide, but globally, you know, you can see huge improvements in similarity between DNA seq and attack seq after bias correction. You can see Jensen Shannon divergence, uh, you know, dropping really massively, and the deep shafts also look extremely similar. You can also use this to compare footprints of TFs. Uh, although DNA seq and attack seq reveal the same underlying biology in terms of the sequence uh, uh, motifs that drive the footprints, they do have different enzymatic properties. DNA seq is much smaller. The DNA enzyme can go in and make much finer grained uh, footprints. And so it's the same motif. This is the footprint that's learned from attack seq. This is the footprint that's learned from DNA seq. This is again attack seq, DNA seq. So you can see that they capture the same footprints, but the footprint shape. Uh, after bias correction is still a function of the enzyme, the architecture of it, but the underlying causal signal that's learned by the model from sequence is the same, right? So we can kind of disconnect uh, enzyme properties from the underlying sequence code. Uh, all right, I'm almost out of time or I'm running out of time. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to just show you one quick thing and then, uh, then leave some time for, for questions. Um, so just to show you, so, you know, I showed you everything so far um, for high read depth data. So that was like 100 million, 200 million, 500 million read data sets. What happens on actual low coverage data, like single cell ataxy, right? Uh, so what we did is a, is a read, uh, read depth uh, subsampling experiment where we take a very deep data set. We subsample it from 500 million reads to 250 million, 100 million, 50 million, 25 million, 5 million. And we train the model on these different read depth data sets, and then we compare their predictions. So you can see the observed data starts getting really sparse, right? At 5 million reads, there are basically like five reads or something in this region. But look at the predicted profiles, beautiful, right? They are all imputed extremely nicely, and the underlying deep shafts are almost completely intact. So a 5 million read data set is giving you signal after prediction bias correction, pretty much the same as a 572 million read data set. This is very encouraging because this tells us that we can potentially now apply this to you know, sparse single cell pseudo bulk uh, samples. And just to formalize this, you can see this dramatic reduction in Jensen Shannon distance for the observed data between 500 million reads as you subsample the data. But if you look at the predicted profiles uh, before and after correction, there's beautiful imputation and you get very little loss in Fidelity. Same for the deep shafts as well. They look nearly identical. And footprints stay intact as well. At 5 million reads, you can get footprints that are essentially almost identical to what you get at 500 million reads. So this is pretty amazing. And you, you get some loss, you can see, of motifs. These rare motifs start disappearing. But it's still amazing that at 5 million reads, you can pick up very similar biology as you could at 250 million. Okay. All right, so uh, I have run out of time, so I'm going to stop and just uh, jump to. Uh, thank you to, so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, very quickly, you know, Chrome VPNet uh, can accurately um, uh, model attack seek, DNA seek, and I didn't get to show you, but you know, you can imagine single cell attack seek at single base resolution. 
I think the, the coolest thing is the uh, bias correction aspect of this model. It's self-correcting. You can train it on the data itself. So if you have changes in the experimental protocol, you just learn the bias, right? You, you change the enzyme, you learn the bias. And once you do bias correction, you get beautiful motifs, motif instances, footprints uh, at individual regulatory elements at single base resolution. These are not aggregate footprints, right? I'm showing you footprints at, at individual basis at individual uh, elements. Uh, you can see how the model beautifully reduces discrepancies between DNA seq and attack seq. Uh, we can predict uh, profiles, footprints, driver motifs with high fidelity. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't show you this, but uh, the model is also sensitive to TF concentration and affinity of motifs. That's really fascinating. Uh, and um, I didn't get to show you this either, but we have a novel uh, variant effect prediction score uh, based on changes in profile shape at single base resolution that is actually state of the art. In fact, Chrome VBNet beats and pharma uh, at, at uh, many prediction tasks. Um, so that's that's a summary of the method. And again, thanks to uh, Anushri and Anna for this fantastic work and uh, various other lab members for various contributions and the funding sources. Thank you. Thank you so much for your excellent talk, um, Anshu. So I see uh, many, you know, questions in this, you know, the the chat window. Um, so let's go over one by one. I uh, to remind you about the time. We have twelve minutes until the next talk. So um, Anshu did excellent in, you know, um, adjusting the pace. Okay, so the first question, Dominic Otto, uh, does accessibility, accessibility modulate uh, biased binding or can one assume biased binding produce, pro, produces a context signal regardless of accessibility? A great question. So you know, the decomposition of the model of the output into counts and profiles and then really understanding how sequence uh, and bias affects these two components tells us something. It tells us that... Um, uh, that the enzyme bias is conditional. So what I mean by that is, uh, if you look at overall signal, uh, peak regions, for example, regions of enrichment of ataxic reads is entirely driven by proteins, okay? Not, not TN5. So TN5 can't go and like open chromatin and cut it there. Uh, it, it does have a, obviously an enzyme bias. That's how we're learning it from the background. But um, regions of enrichment, like the total counts that you see, um, have are completely bias free, which is why models people have trained before in the literature, right? Like like Bassett, Basenji, and Forma, all of them work because they're primarily count models. They don't really learn the the bias. Uh, condition. So now, if a protein goes and opens chromatin, now it's fully accessible to TN5. Now, if you if you enter one such zone, a peak region, and you look at the profile distribution, right? The distribution of reads, not the counts how the reads get distributed in that sequence, that is almost entirely bias, right? So you can believe the counts, so that's the coming from primarily the proteins, but the profiles will fool you because the profiles are coming entirely from TN5 bias, uh, almost entirely from TN5 bias. You, you saw the correction, right? The CDCF example I showed you, there's just a humongous, it's like magic. It's like this latent footprint pops up, which was not there before, right? Um, so that's nice. That's a nice property of the enzyme, right? In the sense, if it was really bad, a really bad enzyme would be creating peaks in regions where it's not supposed to, right? So you'd see a bias in the count head as well. What's very exciting actually is uh, this is a nice way to test any assay. So for example, if you take ChIP-seq data, right? ChIP-seq data, which is used to uh, profile transcription factor binding, the bias is opposite. There isn't a profile bias. The bias is affecting the count head. The reason is because, uh, you know, uh, the chip seek experiment tends to um, just uh, create fragments in open chromatin regions, irrespective of where the transcription factor binds, right? So it actually creates peaks, regions of strong signal in regions where um, the transcription factor isn't even bound. So in that scenario, like in chip seek data, the bias is inverted. The count head gets affected, the profile head does not, right? And so any experiment you do, you can use this trick to figure out how is the bias affecting different components of the model. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, and Irene Capolo, uh, by the way, everyone said, you know, thanks for the great, great talks. I'm not going to read that for times. <laughs> <laughs> for the corrected model, what were some of the most interesting results from the TF Modisco uh, from the profile head that you did not find from the count head? I had a similar question. 
Ah, that's a great question. So um, usually, at least for a taxic DNA seq, um, we do not see dramatic differences in uh, motifs. Like there aren't presence, absence. Like there aren't motifs that are driving cows. There aren't driving profiles. Um, in Chipsy data, we do see such examples where you have motifs entirely driving counts, uh, but they're not actually affecting the profile shape itself. What we do see is a relative contribution of different motifs uh, in terms of the contribution strength. Remember, everything we are making doing is quanti quantitative, right? So you can look at the deep sharp scores and you can look at the Morisco, um, you know, deep sharp scores, and you can tell, you know, what is really, what's the effect size of a motif? So there are clearly differences in the rankings or effect sizes or motifs in the count versus the profiles. Okay, I don't have a slide to show that now. So for example, uh, CTCF has huge effects on 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 profile, you know, um, shapes. But if you look at genome wide, you know, other other pioneer factors that really open chromatin typically have a much stronger effect on the counts, right? So after bias correction uh, for attack seq and DNA seq, the count and profile heads basically learn the same motifs. The relative ranking switch around. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Bernardo Armida, um, after correcting for enzyme bias, are the profile uh, profile contrib contribution globally similar to the count contribution, or do they differ depending on the types types of regulatory elements? Do you find biological or syn syntax differences between the two outputs? Yeah, globally, they end up looking very, very similar. As I mentioned, there are changes in the relative contributions, but you usually pick up the same elements, but uh, you know, uh, you can really tear apart what's driving. So, okay, so one thing I should say is there are many transcription factors that don't traditionally footprint, okay? By that, I mean, you don't see like a nice dip in the shape. Uh, those motifs still impact the profile shape. That's the beautiful advantage of a neural network that doesn't force some kind of definition of a footprint. Typically a footprint is something that, you know, you, you see like a valley and a peak, right? And then there's, there are claims that certain transcription factors do not footprint. In our models, we do not see motifs that cannot be captured by profile shape at all, okay? So every motif that affects counts also affects shape. Many of those motifs do not have classical footprints. They don't produce these nice valleys, right? but they're clearly having an impact on the shape and the model is sensitive enough to pick them up, okay? So regarding your question, I would say um, the profile and count head deep shafts look very similar. Uh, you can quantitatively compare them, Jensen Chan and divergence and so forth, um, but their relative magnitude of motifs can change because some, again, if you have CTCF, for example, it will have a huge impact on the footprint uh, shape, but may not have as much an impact on the magnitude, right? So the relative heights change. Okay, great. So um, next question is from uh, Pooja uh, Kathail. I'm curious if you have explored how the model performs compared to gene expression prediction models such as Enformer for variant interpretation. Yay, thank you. you let me show you my that slide, which I wanted. <laughs> okay, so here is a head-to-head -head comparison between um, Chrome BPNet and Forma and Delta SVM on DSQTL detection. So here what we're doing is our gold standard are variants in the genome that affect DNA-seq allelic imbalance um, in lymphoblastoid cell lines. And um, you're looking at the area under the precision recall curve. We're trying to classify DSQTLs against uh, corresponding uh, matched background SNPs. And you can see um, there's huge class imbalance. So a random baseline would have a precision, average precision of 0.02. Delta SVM has an average precision of 0.19. That's this curve right here. Uh, this is Enforma. Uh, the DNA is head of Enforma. Uh, it is, it's, it's much better than, uh, than Delta SVM. It's 0 0.34, 0 0.33. This is Chrome BPNet uh, with DNA seek and attack seek, and we are uh, quite a bit better. You can see the curve is substantially above Enforma. And there's a reason why uh, account head does about the same as Enforma. This is our profile head, okay? The profile head is beautiful. I'll show you one quick example. This is what you can do. You can actually see at single base resolution what a SNP does, right? So here I'm showing you, here's the genetic variant. Uh, this is the effect it has on SPI1 chip seek at single base resolution. Beautiful, right? You can see this dramatic change in the profile shape. This is DNA seek, this is attack seek, this is the deep shafts. Right? So we have basically a new metric. It's very simple. 
It's just a Jensen Shannon divergence between the reference profile and the alternate profile times the sign of the log ratio of the counts. So we're taking sign into account. We want positive and negative effects. Uh, but the effect score really is the Jensen Shannon divergence at single base pair resolution between reference and alternate allele predicted profiles. And that is what gives this awesome boost. Cool. Thank you. Um, so uh, next question is from Max Liberet. Uh, do you need to incorporate bias correction into the neural network? It seems like you could simply sub subtract the NN predicted bias from the signal and then use the bias corrector as a pre-processing step. Yeah, yeah so usually we, um, so that's a great point. So you don't always have to train a bias model. We are often pre-train a bias model from some reference data set and then we can just apply it to all the others, right? So you freeze that bias component. However, you risk, um, you know, there are, there are batch effects, right? So uh, an example is like over the years, the ATAXI protocol, you know, went from the original Fluidine protocol to Omni attack and now the single cell attack, all of those have subtle differences, okay? And what's awesome is if you take a bias model trained on protocol one, and you apply it to hundreds of data sets that use the same protocol, you just get free bias correction. You can just take a pre-trained bias, bias model and just do correction. But if the protocol changes, you can clearly see the bias correction doesn't work as well. And you just refit a new bias model to the new protocol and it just works fine. We've even been able to transfer across species. So you can train a bias model on the human genome and you can apply it to the mouse genome. If it's the same ATAXI protocol, it works great. DNA-seq is a big problem, actually, because DNA-seq actually, uh, you know, they, they hyper-optimize the, uh, the, the enzymatic protocol, like the DNA's concentrations and so forth. And so um, you really, for DNA-seq, you really should train a model for every data set because uh, there are all these batch effects, subtle effects of bias, like different kind of biases based on the uh, protocol. DNA is not an easy experiment. Um, and, and I think uh, the bias, models show that is the case. Like they have all these subtle biases depending on how the experiment was done. But you're right, you don't need to train a bias model every time. You can just train one and then use it. Cool. Yeah, so uh, next from uh, Ted Reese, uh, what effect on pipeline workload or performance would a bias correction have? Uh, very little. So as I said, you can pre-train a bias model. So basically you don't even need to do anything. You just, we have a library of bias models from thousands of ENCODE experiments. We'll release that in a few weeks. And you can just, you can just take one of them and apply them. And we have, we have an automatic detector now, right? So we can tell you if the bias correction is working. That's the best part. We have, we have a diagnostic that's built in. So you can train with a pre-trained bias model. Um, we can tell you if it's doing bias correction sufficiently well. It's completely automatic. And if it does not, it just retrains its own bias model. Right? So it's it's completely end-to-end. -end. Um, it can it can be efficient or it can be slightly less efficient. But overall, you know, the whole training procedure takes like uh, I think about four or five hours on a sim simple consumer GPUs. You don't need TPUs, you don't need anything, like a regular GPU. Uh, and you're seeing that we can get performance as high or better than much, much bigger models. But all our models are single task. They're trained on, the screen on individual data sets. Nothing is multitask, very cheap, very small models, easy to transport, easy to, easy to store, easy to interpret. Um, a small model like a Chrome VPNet model is also very fast. You can interpret the whole genome you know, in a few hours right? Uh, with DeepShap and then Modisco. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, now it's 10 o'clock. There are three more questions, but I'm sure you can you can answer. You know, you can type your answer there. There are three um, short questions. Awesome. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, so we are gonna now turn to this next session uh, where we will have four oral presentations, 20 minutes each. Um, so you know the you will you know the work the same. We will, if we have a question, we will you know visit all these questions after at the end of the talk. Uh, otherwise, please you know type your questions in the chat, and the speaker is going to answer. Okay, so the first um, oral presentation. Um, uh, so it, it is about you know selecting deep neural networks that have a consistent feature attributions. Do we have a speaker here? Okay, great. Yes. Hi. Uh, I'll share my screen. 
Can everybody see this now? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Anshul, for the great presentation. Um, okay, so hello, everybody. My name is Chandana Rajesh, and I'm a grad student in the Ku Lab. My talk will be about selecting deep neural networks that yield consistent attribution-based interpretations for genomics. And this is joint work uh, with Antonio Maidanek and also other members of the Ku Lab at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. So building on what Anshul has just presented on, uh, we've seen many applications of deep learning in, uh, in genomics by taking DNA sequences as input and predicting functional activity, like chromatin accessibility or transcription factor binding. And while their improved prediction and perf uh, performance is impressive, one of the main benefits of deep learning is that we can interpret them to uncover important features the model has learned. So for example, we know that the transcription of a gene is put into motion by the binding of TFs to DNA. By interpreting a high-performing deep learning model, we can uncover motif syntax, which is the identity, positions, and arrangement of TF binding sites that drive model predictions. So just to give some more context, um, here's a pretty standard pipeline for deep learning analysis in genomics. So typically we get some high throughput functional genomic sequencing data like ATAC-seq. We then go on to train a large pool of candidate models, which might have different architectures, hyperparameters, and initializations. You might have tens or even hundreds of model variations here. And after training, we then pick the optimal model from the pool based on validation performance. And we interpret that model using attribution maps, which highlight important nucleotides in a given sequence. From these attribution maps, we can form hypotheses about putative motifs and motif syntax. And then we can validate these motifs either in silico with methods like global importance analysis or experimentally. So with steps four and five in mind, we see that this intermediate step of model selection is critical because this choice will affect the downstream analysis later on. Right now, we just select the model with the highest validation performance, but as we'll see later, this might not necessarily be the best approach. But before we get into that, um, here are a few examples of saliency maps from a neural network trained on ATAC-seq data. The details of the specific data set and models aren't important right now, but I'll get into that later. So you can see that the attribution maps are quite human interpretable. So there are a lot of motifs that we can visually see pretty easily, and they're recurring from sequence to sequence, which is strong support that they are indeed important. So these motifs would make good candidates to perform downstream in silico experiments to probe motif syntax. And now here are saliency maps from a different model that yields similar prediction performance. Um, so these saliency maps are from the same exact region, so you can uh, directly compare the left to right for each row. And strikingly, these saliency maps look very different despite having similar performance. Now, you may think that this might just be for saliency maps, but this happens for other attribution methods too, including integrated gradients, smooth grad, and deep shap. But importantly, in the current model selection paradigm, we'd probably choose the model on the right for attribution analysis because its validation performance is slightly higher. But um, as you can see, this wouldn't be a fruitful analysis. So how can this be? Um, why are attribution maps so noisy sometimes? While there are several reasons, including learning low quality features, shortcut representations, and off simplex gradient noise, we think that the major source of noise is due to benign overfitting. And this is a phenomenon that occurs when a model overfits the training data, but still generalizes well on the test set. And how can this happen? If you take, for example, this toy diagram on the left, the data points are shown and the ideal fit is shown in red. If a neural network fits this function in black, then it can still generalize well on the test data because it hugs the ideal fit. However, the saliency maps are now completely unre unreliable. So a sequence that lies along this function might give a steep positive slope, but a small neutral mutation can move along this function and the gradient can be totally different. So this highlights a critical problem that we face that was not obvious before that the standard approach for model selection doesn't guarantee interpretability with attribution analysis. And again, the reason why this is so important is that uh, attribution analysis is central to generating good hypotheses for downstream and silico experiments in order to um, uncover motif syntax learned by a deep learning model. So in light of this challenge, we need a better way of, uh, to choose models that are amenable to our existing model interpretability tools. And we need another metric that can quantitatively inform us of this. But the problem is that since we don't have ground truth in practice, it's difficult to come up with a quantitative measure of how interpretable attribution maps are to a human. 
And one thing that we noticed is that uh, one property we use to assess how good an attribution map is qualitatively is the consistency of the salient motifs. So um, in other words, the degree to which attributed features recur across attribution maps. But humans are slow and biased, so it's uh, difficult to parse through hundreds of attribution maps. So our contribution here is that we came up with two approaches to measure this consistency. Now, I should mention that um, Anshul's group has developed TF Modisco, which clusters these recurring patterns for motif discovery. And we're doing something similar here, except um, our goal is to quantify a summary statistic, which we can then use to select models for downstream analysis. So um, again, our contribution is that we came up with two information-based approaches to measure the consistency of motifs in attribution maps. The first approach uh, compares the distribution of Kamer frequencies within salient positions versus other places. And the second approach compares attribution score embeddings. Um, and I'll elaborate more on each method in the next few slides. Uh, we then evaluate how well each method can identify models that are both high performing and whose attribution maps exhibit favorable properties of human interpretable motifs. We'll show this first quantitatively on a synthetic data set and then qualitatively on an attack seek data set. So method one is what we consider to be the simplest approach. Um, we compare the Kamer frequencies within high uh, attribution positions and compare it to the Kamer frequencies at all positions. So in step one, we take each attribution map and set some threshold above which are considered uh, high attribution positions. And ref we refer to these as attributed Kamers. We then count subsequences and aggregate it into a single global Kamer distribution. We also calculate the global Kamer statistics for all positions, and we refer to this as uh, genomic Kamers. In step two, we compare the two distributions using the kolbeck leibler divergence, or KLD, which is a measure of relative entropy. So the intuition for this method is that in consistent attribution maps, the attributed Kamers in important positions should have a sparse distribution compared to the baseline genomic Kamers, which should appear more or less uniform or maybe with some slight Kamer biases. On the other hand, noisy attribution maps should yield Kamer frequencies that look more similar to the genomic Kamer baseline. So while method one works in the sequence space, method two measures consistency in the attribution space. So this method is a bit more involved with some heuristics, but it turns out to be quite effective. So hear me out. Um, so we start with a simple embedding by taking a window of size K and summing the attribution scores across nucleotide channels. And this is like a mean pool with a stride of one. Next, we go from a 4D Euclidean space to 3D spherical coordinates using Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. And this is enabled by a previous observation by Antonio that involves a gradient correction that was presented last year at MLCB. The idea is that we have an extra degree of freedom that can be removed upon the gradient correction. And now we can visualize these, uh, this in three dimensions. But we found that the symmetry of this plot aligns better, um, aligns better in spherical coordinates. And in this space, the radial information is more minimal. So in step three, we further reduce it down to two dimensions using the two angular components and weight the data in the space according to the inverse of the radius. And finally, we can compare it to some uninformative prior and calculate the KL divergence. So the intuition for this approach is that we are uh, embedding information about each highly attributed position with local context. So if this context is part of a motif, this should amplify the information. But if this context is random, this will be reflected in the embedding. Thus, we anticipate that the clusters will uh, appear in this embedded space. So we first evaluate these metrics on models trained on a synthetic data set. And we generated synthetic sequences by embedding motifs in a uniform sequence model, which means that the nucleotides are equal probable. So for positive class sequences, we randomly choose three to five motifs from a pool of core motifs from the JASPER database. And we do the same for negative class sequences, except the pool of motifs also includes 100 non-overlapping background motifs. Then we randomly split the data set into training, validation, and test sets with a 0 0.7, 0 0.1, and 0 0.2 split. And these models were trained by Ethan, um, a former high school student, and Rohit, uh, a former postdoc in the lab. The baseline network used in the study is a block of four convolutional layers and one fully connected layer. 
And their original study focuses on the issue of benign overfitting, which again happens when the model overfits on training data, but still has good validation performance. So they explored many regularization methods that have been um, that have been shown to improve attribution maps in computer vision, but are underexplored in genomics. And I don't have time to go into each one of these regularizations, but they're described in our appendix if you're interested. So all in all, they trained about 320 models using these different regularizations, as well as different first layer activations. Also, one thing to note is that because we know where we embedded motifs, we can quantify the interpretability of an attribution map using the signal to noise ratio or SNR. Signal is the average attribution score where motifs are embedded, while the background is the average of the top 10 highest false positive attribution scores. And here is a scatter plot of the validation performance of these models against the attribution SNR. Each dot is a different model. And notice that we don't see much correlation here. And this underscores the issue that predictive performance doesn't guarantee more reliable attribution maps. But now when we plot um, our consistency metrics against, against SNR, we see that models with a high KLD also tend to have high attribution SNR and vice versa. So now if we take these two different models that yield a uh, very similar generalization AURC, but very different S uh, attribution SNR, uh, we can look at their saliency maps and we see that the model with the higher KLD visually looks more consistent with the ground truth, which is shown at the top. So overall, this suggests that both methods to quantify consistency contract the attribution SNR, even in the absence of ground truth. And one interesting thing that we noticed was that the intermediate representations of each consistency method can be used to reveal information about consistent motifs. So using those same two models, you can see that for uh, model one, there are tight clusters that represent the same KMER, but in model two, they appear to be more dispersed. I'm only showing method two here, but method one also contains similar information, and we should be able to extract motifs uh, in principle. So cluster analysis of these could potentially reveal motifs, which is similar to TF Modisco, but in these cases using a different approach. So next we tested these consistency methods in an uh, in vivo attack seek data set. And these models and data set come from Shushan Amber who trained 26 different models, each of which take a 2KB long DNA sequences as input and predict chromatin accessibility profiles for 15 different human cell lines. And they created four major variations of models. So models can ha have either a ReLU or exponential activation in their first layer, and they can be trained either for a quantitative regression or binary classification. So like with the synthetic uh, task, these models all have good predictive performance, which you can see from this genome track right here. And more details about the specific models are in Shushan Amber's paper, if you're interested. So here's a scatter plot of the prediction performance, which is measured by Pearson correlation, versus the KLD for method one at the top and method two at the bottom. Each dot represents a different model. And again, when you look at the scatter plot, it's difficult to identify which model we should be interpreting, but ideally one with a high Pearson correlation and high KLD. So using our metrics, we further investigate three models that have similar validation performance, but different KLD values. And both consistency methods rank the models the same, but uh, method, T, uh, method two appears to be a little more sensitive. So now if we take a closer look at their saliency maps, we notice that the model with the higher KLD tends to have less spurious noise and visually captures known motifs better than the other two models that have lower KLDs. And even though these models have similar predictive performance, it looks like it may be more straightforward to make claims about motifs and motif syntax using the top model. Of course, we don't have ground truth, so we're not positive that model one is more reliable, but this is the nature of real data. What could be done now is to follow up these hypotheses with in silico experiments like GIA, and this can un uncover global importance of motif interactions. So in summary, um, we have this problem that in the current method of model selection, uh, we rely on validation performance alone. So it fails to identify models that are amenable to attribution an analysis. We've proposed that uh, um, the consistency of motifs in attribution maps is a promising approach to quantify a qualitative property that aligns with what we consider to be interpretable attribution maps. And we demonstrated that these methods work on synthetic and attack seek data. This shows that KLD might be beneficial as a secondary metric, 
in addition to validation performance for model selection. So moving forward, consistency is certainly an important property, but solely relying on consistency is not also not the whole story, since we should prefer models that consistently learn a broader set of motifs. So we would like to develop additional metrics that capture other favorable properties like motif diversity, and this should enhance our multivariate approach to model selection. Also, as I mentioned earlier, the consistency metrics inherently aggregate consistent motifs. So further cluster analysis should facilitate motif discovery. And this would add to the existing tools we have, such as TFMO Disco. And finally, another interesting future direction would be to incorporate KLD into training, either as part of the loss function or as regularization, so that we can optimize models to learn uh, consistent motif patterns throughout training. So that concludes my talk. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in the Cool Lab and uh, for their helpful input at various stages of this project and the conference organizers for giving me the chance to present this work. Um, one last thing, if you're interested in this kind of research, the Cool Lab has open positions for postdocs, so feel free to contact us. All right, so um, I'd like to invite any uh, suggestions for possible directions or any other questions, and thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Chandana. Um, so let's see if there are questions from the, the attendees. It was a very clear talk. <laughs> yeah, I just have a quick question. So depending on the actual, you know, attribution methods, and then there are two categories. One is removal based. You remove a feature, so Shap Shapley value, um, Shap you know, falls into that category. Uh, you remove the features and the see the impact of it versus, you know, propagation based. Uh, you use a gradient information. And then is there, a, is there any difference between the two categories in terms of the consistency? Um, so we did check on a few of the different attribution methods that there are um, that you mentioned. So we tried this on in silico mutagenesis, um, expected grad, in grad, and smooth grad. And we did find that our method is robust across the, the broader set of the attribution methods. Um, here, we're only showing the salience, the uh, salience maps here, but we did try on the other ones too. Okay. Thank you. Uh, does Sarah have a question? I have a question. Sorry, as a panelist, I don't think we can post the Q&A, so I'll ask my question live. Uh, thank you so much for the nice talk. I was wondering, so the local interpretation, if you average them across many instances, does that remove some of the noise? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so when we did our um, that local embedding across uh, the nucleotide channels, the reason we did that was so that we could uh, incorporate some of the, uh, like, uh, some of the nucleotide content that is commonly observed in motifs. So one thing we noticed was that in, in vivo data, the uh, intermediate representations, those scatter plots would become very crowded. So enc encoding this type of information was a way to kind of separate out that crowdedness and give some more uh, like diversity in terms of the composition of the clusters that we were able to get. So it's, it's um, as you mentioned, it's a way of uh, removing noise, but it's also a way of uh, separating out clusters. Okay, uh, so so James, do you have a question? Too? You can't really, you can type, right? Yeah, just let, let's be quick. James. Okay. Very nice talk. So do you have a sense of how um, during the different training epochs, how the consistency changes? Um, thank you for the question. Um, so this was actually applied after uh, models were trained already, not incorporated while models were training. So I actually don't have the, that information right now, but that, that is um, something we definitely plan to work on in the future, which is to incorporate this type of metric into um, a loss function or as a form of regularization so that we can see um, how this would change across different epochs during training. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shandana. Thank you. Okay, so the next speaker is, is it Feng Rui? Yeah, you can start uh, sharing the screen. So um, Feng Rui is gonna uh, talk about the pre-training for prediction of a genomic data sets across species. Um, hi, thank you for the intro. 
Uh, hi, my name is Fang Rui, and I am an undergrad at Boston University, and I am going to present our paper, Pre-Training for Prediction of Genomic Dataset Across Species. Uh, this is joint with Jenna Song and I, my advisor, Ashok Katkowski. I think it is remarkable that all of my cells share the same genome, but yet perform very different functions. Researchers have found that this occurs because of the non-coding regulatory elements that turn gene on and off in specific contexts. For example, an enhancer such as the one shown here might recruit proteins called transcription factors to a gene promoter to promote transcription of a particular gene in appropriate contexts. Research over the last decade has also identified features that mark non-coding DNA segments with particular functions. If we turn to the example of an enhancer, they are often accessible in regions that lack histones, and they are bounded by transcription factors, and they are near histones that are decorated with specific chemical modifications. The genomic features of non-coding regions can be assayed by a number of different assays, including some of the ones shown here. We can also access gene expression in different contexts. There are tons of genomic data has been made, generated by individual labs or consortia, such as the ENCODE project and the Roadmap Epigenomic project, across many different cell types and developmental time points. But even with the thousands of data sets available, we are still far from experimentally assaying the effect of every sequence variant, including those that changes during evolution and in disease context. So a question that we and many others in the fields are interested in is whether we can use all of the genomic data set we have right now to generate a machine learning model that can accurately predict genomic features, including gene expression, gene expression and the accessibility of different non-coding regions. Recently, some deep learning models have been published that can predict the results of genomic assays with remarkable accuracy. One of these are the informer model, the, which is a transformer-based uh, machine learning model that can predict the results of genomic assays directly from the DNA sequence. One, in, one advantage that this informer model has is that it can take very long DNA sequences and thus perhaps can learn the long-range interaction of the distance non-coding regulatory regions. Um, however, there are still some limitations that impede this kind of the um, method uh, development. So firstly, it is computationally expensive. The informer model has 249 million parameters and was trained on 64 TPU cores. It cannot be fit into the common GPU types, like for example, the Tesla V100 GPU. Also, its training time was 64 times three TPU days, which has a high computational cost. Secondly, the informer model was trained with large human and mouse genomic data sets, where the human data set has 34K sequences with 5K experiment tracks, and the mouse one has 29K sequences with 1,000-ish tracks. However, for the most for most other species, they are less studied. They are less experiment conducted using those species, thus they have smaller training data set size. In order to solve those two limitations, we proposed two approaches. We modified the informer model to make it smaller and able to train on the common version Tesla V100 GPU. And also in order to deal with the problem of lack of large data set for most other species, we pre-trained our model on a species with large data set, which is human, and then transfer it for, to the niche species. For our first approach, which is the modification on informer model, we aim to remove, reduce the model size and make it fit into the V100 GPU, and then also make it still preserve comparable accuracy. 
The original informer model has a convolutional module with seven convolutional blocks, a self-attention module with 11 self-attention blocks, and then a cropping layer and a final point-wise convolutional layer, and then a linear layer. Our first modification is reducing the number of self-attention from 11 to 5. We made this change out of necessity because our GPU cannot support more than five self-attention layers. And after this change, our correlation value is now 0.525. However, we made the next two modification that improve this value. Our second, second modification is removing the final convolutional pointwise layer. We observe that after removing that layer, the accuracy in fact improve. And we suspect that there might be some redundancy of the layers in the informer model. Our third modification is removing the linear layer in the self-attention block. Conventionally, every self-attention layer is followed by a linear, finally a fully connected linear layer. And we observe that after removing that linear layer in each self-attention block, the accuracy also improved. And also the number of parameters in the self-attention module is decreased by 25%, which also helped with reducing the training time. After these three modifications, our model can be fit into the commonly available Tesla V100 GPU without much loss of correlation value. And also we only trained for three GPU days uh, with 10 epochs. For the second limitation, in order to deal with the problem that most species do not have a large training data set size, we it pre-trained our model on an organism with large data set and then transfer it to niche species. By transferring and, and, and fine tuning, we mean changing the last linear layer of the model pre-trained on human data set to a linear lay, a new linear layer for each specific species and then train the new model for each species. We first train our model on the same human data set that informer model used, the input is 196,000 base pairs DNA sequences uh, with the one hot encoded one. Um, the target output is around 5,000 tracks of experimental results of non-coding DNA regions. We later changed the last linear layer and then fine tune our model on chicken, cow, mouse, pig, and rhesus dataset. Our target output is either ATAC-C dataset with multiple tracks or the H3K4ME3 CheapSeq single track dataset. The ATAC-C identifies regions of open chromatin and h 3 k for ME3 is a histone mark, and they are both commonly found at non-coding sequences that act as promoters or enhancers. We first test whether the pre-training improves data sets with multiple tracks. We use the pre-trained model on the ATAC-C data set for mouse, cow, and pig from diverse tissues, including muscle, cerebellum, liver, and lungs. Compared to the model that is trained from scratch, our model with pre-training have substantial improvement in correlation value. They were each improved by 12%, uh, 16%, and then 29%. And another question we want to ask is whether it also improved prediction for single track target output. To answer that question, we use another experiment. We pre-train, we use our pre-trained model and transfer our model to single track H3K4ME3 ChipSeq cerebellum dataset for rhesus, mouse, and chicken. Again, we see that there are significant improvements with our pre-trained method. Um, they are each improved by 41%, 6%, and then 69%. 
it, impro it proves that our cross-species pre-training method improves both multiple and single-track experiment prediction. Other than the improvement in accuracy, our pre-training method also highly reduced the training time. In general, for all tasks, the pre-trained model reaches the best correlation value obtained by the non-pre-trained model using 3 to 50 percent of the amount of time. Like for example, the pig ATAC seat model with no pre-training requires uh, 13.4 hours to reach uh, a 0.63 training Pearson correlation coefficient, while the pre-trained version requires only less than one hour to reach the same Pearson correlation coefficient. This reduction of training time will reduce the GPU resources needed and save the training cost. In conclusion, our paper focuses on overcoming the limitation of large memory and training resource usage for previous large DNA machine learning models, and also the gap of the data set size for niche species. We overcome those limit to two limitations by ablating redundant layers in the informer model, and also use the pre-training to fill the gap of data set size. For future direction, we plan to both improve training efficacy and also find biological insights using our model. We want to identify additional modification that improve our training efficiency. We are curious about how much and what kind of data the, that's the pre-training process actually require. We also posit from these results that models incorporating newly generated human data do not have to be trained from scratch, but could be built cheaply by fine-tuning these existing human models. About the finding biological insights using our model, we are interested in finding changes in model weights during fine-tuning and understand the difference between different species. We also want to train our model to experiment with how changes in the sequence influence the regulatory regions. And that is all our presentation. I want to thank my mentor, Professor Ashok Kakowski and Janet Song for all their mentorship and support. And also I am applying for PhD programs right now and I'm from Boston University and I am an undergrad senior. I am a math and CS double major. Uh, I'm interested in machine learning, neuroscience and biology and I really wanna go to grad school. So if you have an opening in your lab, like I would really love to chat and feel free to scan the QR code and take a look at my resume. And I will also have a poster later. So feel free to come by. <laughs> Okay, thank um, yeah. you so much. Thank you so much, Feng Rui. Um, so there's a, I see a question there in the in the chat. Uh, so Yun Hee Jung, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. And have you tried to uh, directly use transformers without convolutional blocks? I wonder if the convolutional block uh, helped the transformers. Oh, okay. Thanks for the question. Um, that's a great question. Um, we actually use those convolutional blocks in order to reduce the sequence size because you know for the self-attention layers the compute the memory usage of that is like really large if you directly use the like the, the giant sequence length like it will not be like affordable like we can like maybe we can also try other methods to also reduce the sequence length um, but yeah, like in our experimental setting, like the sequencing is like super long. So we have to use some kind of method, like for example, convolutional method to make it smaller. Cool, thanks. Okay, I don't, I don't think I see more questions there. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Fang Rui. Uh, again, Fang Rui is a... Uh, undergrad student Boston University applying for graduate school. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, thanks. So the next speaker is um, is Gon Gonzalo. Uh, I'm terrible at this. Gonzalo Bene Guess. Apologize if I mispronounced. And you can um, you can start sharing your screen, Gonzalo. Gonzalo's. Gonzalo. Yeah. So he's gonna give a talk about DNA language model for uh, zero shot predictors of a non uh, non coding variant effects. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So I'm very excited to share our experiments uh, on DNA language modeling. Uh, so, Gonzalo, can you please, uh, yeah, can you please uh, start uh, to speak a little louder compared to the previous speakers? I don't, I don't, I don't hear you very well. Okay. Thank you. I'll try to be closer. Yeah, or cl close to the microphone, please. Thank yeah. you. So this is a joint work with Sanjit Batra and Yun Song, UC Berkeley. And first, uh, overview of mask language modeling, which was uh, popularized by BERT. So the idea is to take an input sequence, mask certain proportion of the words, and predict them from the context. And the idea is that this same BERT network via transfer learning can be used for uh, several downstream tasks. For example, you can take an input sequence and just change the last layer into a spam classifier. And the motivation is that there's usually a lot of uh, unlabeled data available, but only uh, more precious, uh, smaller labeled data sets. So by training, pre-training, you can learn a good representation of the data and be more data efficient. And naturally, this has uh, also been very, uh, pretty successful in biology. For example, protein language models have been shown uh, improvements in diverse tasks, such as fluorescence prediction or 3D structure prediction. And DNA language models have been showing improvements in promoter prediction or epigenetic track prediction. Another application that is not uh, that important in natural language processing but is uh, very useful in biology is a zero shot variant effect prediction. The idea is that if the model uh, gives uh, a low probability to an amino acid variant, then this is likely gonna be deleterious or pathogenic. And it's called zero shot because you directly use the same uh, mass language model without any additional fine tuning. And this uh, happened to be the producing state-of-the-art results uh, in the case of uh, missense or protein variants in, in humans. Now it is uh, still hasn't been applied in the case of uh, non-coding DNA variants. So that is the, the gap that uh, we wanted to fill in this project. So here's a, an overview of, of a gene where we have in red the coding region that is transcribed and translated into protein, but it doesn't constitute more than 1% of the human genome. It is surrounded by introns and translated regions, promoters and enhancers, all which dictate where and when the protein will be expressed. And no coding variants account for the majority of associations with complex human diseases. And they also underline several crop domestication and improvement traits. So in our project, uh, we developed GPN, Genomic Retrain Network, which is a straightforward application of mask language modeling. In this case, to small windows of DNA, just 512 base pairs. We mask certain proportion of the positions and we predict them from the context. At the end, we have four probabilities for each of the nucleotides. And we train it using a reference genome. And then we can evaluate uh, um, a variant by uh, computing a simple uh, log odds ratio between the alternate and reference allele. And also, we can use the last layer of the network as an embedding of the sequence that takes into account the surrounding context. Now, a uh, disclaimer, we did all our experiments on the small genome of the 
plant Arabidopsis, which still has the same number of genes as human, but the information is much more uh, tightly packed. So it is likely that when applying to more complex genomes, uh, then the parameters of the model might need to change uh, a lot. This being said, we set to interpret what the model is learning. So first, we took the model embeddings and we averaged them over 30 base pair windows in a one megabase window. And then we projected this with human. And we can see is a pretty clear separation of the annotated gene regions of the genome. And what this suggests, on one hand, it is good to know that the model is learning interpretable features of the genome and not some obscure uh, feature. On the other hand, this uh, re represents uh, a new way of interpreting a genome by understanding what are the different clusters. Some of these could mean a new, uh, new unexplored uh, regions of the genome. For example, this cluster over here at the top right. And we did some uh, interpretation. First, uh, we performed a laden clustering. Uh, obtaining eight clusters in this region. And here on the bottom left are the compositions of each cluster. And the first uh, five clusters are the ones that have the majority of uh, intergenic, CDS, uh, intron, 3' UTR, and 5' UTR. And you can see cluster three has a, it's the one that is more mixed. It has a mixture of a triple UTR and intergenic. This uh, reflects that the model uh, finds it hard to distinguish between these two regions. Although some proportion of these could be uh, misannotated regions as well. And the cluster on the top right is uh, enriched in repetitive elements. And the cluster seven is uh, enriched in from other regions. But again, this is just one megabase. So imagine what we could do when uh, clustering uh, whole genomes, even from multiple species. What are the, the patterns that we could see? Now, another way to interpret the model uh, was to look at uh, a more uh, local and very specific regions. For example, a splice donor. Here is the, the exon is on the left and the and the intron starts here on the right. So for each position, independently, we masked it and computed the model probabilities. For example, the model uh, predicts a G with high confidence and a T with high confidence at the splice, canonical splice donor site. Whereas more deep into the intron, uh, the model is producing a, predicting a more uh, uniform distribution. And this way, by looking at the profile, you can, uh, this is a way of highlighting uh, important functional motifs in the genome. On this other example, we look at a transcription factor binary site. On the bottom is the previously known logo, and on the top is the, the logo derived from the model probabilities. You can see how it predicts uh, the main nine uh, positions pretty well, as well as uh, with some degree, the, also the, flank, the less important flanking regions. So now this is uh, another way of uh, validating that the model learns important features of the genome. But it could also be used for as an, another application, perhaps with more sophisticated tools such as TF Modisco, this could be used to, to mine important uh, motifs from a genome. Now, for our main application, which is a very effect prediction, we computed the GPN score, that again is just the log odds ratio between our alternate and reference allele. For, in this case, for uh, all uh, possible uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in a certain region, and we uh, divided by the annotated consequences from ensemble. And what we see is that the, for example, splice donor or stop gain 
this kind of uh, variance that really disrupt the open reading frame, they have a much lower uh, GPN score, meaning that they are uh, considered to be unlikely by the model. And also, missions variants have, are given a lower score than synonymous variants. Still, there is not much difference among all the variants at the bottom, but we think that this is one uh, line of evidence that the model understands deleteriousness or pathogenicity. As another way to, to understand this, we took a look at uh, allele frequency in 1001 Arabidopsis genomes. We took all, all the variants and divided it into 100 bins from the lowest to the highest GPN scores, and we computed the allele frequency, average allele frequency at each bin. And we can see uh, uh, a, a, a positive correlation in this case, so continuously increasing. So what, what we think this suggests is that the allele, uh, the variants that have a low allele frequency may be under negative selection, and the model is capturing the deleteriousness leading to the negative selection. Now, to quantify this a bit more, we calculate an odds ratio, comparing rare versus common variants and pathogenic versus benign uh, GPN scores, taking an arbitrary threshold. For example, we consider the lowest 0.1% to be pathogenic. And we see that rare variants are enriched in pathogenic scores. Now, we vary this threshold starting from considering the bottom 10% to be uh, pathogenic to the bottom 1%, to the bottom 0.1%, as given here, 2.73 odds ratio, which is uh, higher than other uh, methods we were comparing to, such as uh, FASTCONS and philo -P which are conservation scores that use uh, the whole genome alignment of 18 species, as well as DNA BERT, which is a language model trained on the human genome, and also some additional models that use, uh, also use functional genomics data. Now, when we look at specific kinds of variants, such as 3'UTR, the model doesn't do, our model doesn't do as well, nearly as well as here. So there is a lot of room for improvements. But we think that this is a competitive approach that merits further research. So to summarize, we found that DNA language models learn the structure of the genome, some interpretable features such as gene regions or functional motifs. And we have found that the language models are an effective way to score variants all across the genome. And we think that this is uh, particularly useful for non-model organisms, that they don't, they don't have functional genomics data or even alignments in certain cases. And still, our model is 200 times smaller than the largest uh, protein language model. So we think that there can be huge improvements from scaling up the model. Now, some open questions. We need to, to fit in more data for training larger models. And it is still uh, unclear how to balance data from different genomic regions, different individuals, and different species. And I think that data is the, the key point. Now, for uh, some more uh, like long-term goals, is thinking about how to obtain a good representation of a whole gene or even a whole genome with a final goal of predicting gene expression that we know uses, can use like 200 kb uh, long-range interactions or even polygenic risk scores that effectively incorporate all the variants all across the genome. This is some of the challenges that I think there's uh, important questions for, for many years to come. So I would like to thank you. And uh, we have made uh, available a uh, preprint, our code and our model in Hugging Place. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. Um, the speakers in this session is doing extremely well on the on the time. <laughs> okay, great. I see one question right now. Um, it is from uh, Philip uh, Fredkin. Um, okay, thanks for the interesting talk. Have you done an e evaluation where you train the model on just the protein coding regions, including introns and promoters instead of the whole genome? Uh, do you think uh, there would be a quantitative degradation in performance? I think uh, we haven't done it yet. Uh, I think that is one of the most interesting questions. Uh, in the case of this uh, uh, genome, uh, if we just train it on coding region, for example, it will overfit. Uh, so we think that maybe if we add more species, for example, it is very interesting to see if uh, maybe it's better to have one model per each gene region. That may just be the case, but we don't know yet. Cool. Um, there is another question. So you Yunha Huang. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Is there a reason why you, you used convolutional layers instead of a transformer self-attention layers? Yeah, so uh, we, I guess convolutions have the advantage of being uh, like linear complexity. That is, I think, uh, that can be very helpful in genomics. Uh, as eventually we want to, to use longer sequences. Uh, but even with this same uh, sequence length, uh, we found that transformers were converging slower, uh, more slower, uh, more slowly. Uh, but perhaps uh, in the end, maybe with more data uh, and more uh, computes, transformers can win. In the end, it is still unclear. Yeah. Okay, uh, David Knowles. Yeah, uh, great, great talk. It's really nice work. Um, I was wondering, for the transcription factor uh, binding motif that you're finding, are there a bunch of other transcription factor binding motifs that you're finding as, as well? Do you have a sense of sort of how comprehensive is the model's understanding of gene, regula gene regulation in Arabidopsis? Yeah, uh, so, yeah, great question. I don't think we have a, a comprehensive understanding. Um, we did some experiments where we basically computed like a median entropy in each, like in over in certain like small windows of the genome, and we saw that there is enrichment with the in annotated transcriptional factor binding sites in like low entropy regions. Uh, but still, I think we we do have to do quite a bit more of exploring uh, and understanding where it fails and where it succeeds. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. All right. Okay, so the next uh, oral pre presentation will be uh, done by Yusuf. Are you the speaker? Are you here? Okay. Yes, yeah. yes I'm here. Start sharing yeah. your screen. So Yusuf uh, from Stanford is going to talk about predicting transcriptional outcomes of novel multi-gene uh, perturbations. Are you seeing the presenter or the? Um, we are seeing the presenter mode actually, not the, okay. yeah, right. swap, yes. Yeah, Cool. great. Uh, all right, uh, thank you. Thank you for attending and thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about our work. Um, so my name is Yusuf Rahani and um, I'm a PhD student at uh, Stanford University. And today we'll be talking about our project on predicting transcriptional outcomes of novel multi-gene perturbations. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Christian Huang and Yuri Leskovich. So one of the leading textbooks in the field of molecular biology uh, begins with these lines. Um, in many ways, we understand the structure of the universe better than the workings of living cells. Um, we, uh, we still cannot predict how a cell will behave if we mutate a previously unstudied gene. Uh, so I'm just going to move my thing up. Okay. okay. And in many respects, um, this is very similar to the problem that we're trying to solve in our project, which is what is the gene expression response of perturbing a combination of genes that you've not seen experimentally perturbed previously? So this problem is also central to a number of biomedical applications beyond just fundamental biology. So for instance, in the field of drug discovery, uh, knowledge of multi-gene perturbation outcomes can identify therapeutic targets that could reverse disease phenotypes. 
It can lead to the discovery of genetic interactions such as synergy and epistasis. For instance, synthetic lethality is an interaction where the knocking down of a pair of genes can lead to the death of a cell, while each gene perturbed individually may not. And such interactions can have significant impact on the discovery of cancer therapeutics or even in identifying resistance mechanisms for drugs. Also within the field of regenerative medicine, re-engineering cells has shown great potential in the design of cell therapies and also in reversing phenotypes linked to aging. So knowledge of perturbation outcomes can help the design of, uh, improve the design of such experiments. So one of the key challenges that's preventing existing experimental approaches from answering these questions is the combinatorial explosion in multi-gene perturbational space. So there are four times 10 to the eighth pairwise combinations of all known protein coding genes. And when we consider larger combination sets of two or more genes, um, then we see that the number of unique combinations increases by several orders of magnitude. Therefore, the ability to infer perturbation outcomes for the vast majority of perturbations is inevitably a computational problem. So the first step for us was to formulate this problem mathematically. So on the left here, you see um, the representation of a, an unperturbed cell shown in green with gene expression values G1 through Gn. And we apply a perturbation to some subset of the genes shown here on the left. So in this case, we're perturbing gene two and gene four. So the expression of gene two is being increased and that of gene four is being decreased. And when we say perturbing, this could be any form of gene editing, such as say CRISPR-A or CRISPR-I. And so the goal for our model is to be able to predict the gene expression outcome of this perturbation. So it's essentially just a simple function that takes as input the unperturbed gene expression, again shown here in green, the applied perturbation shown in red, and then it predicts the post-perturbation gene expression across all genes. So this idea of learning the underlying transcriptional relationships between genes is not a new one, and it's been studied quite extensively, especially within the gene regulatory network literature. So one approach to solving this problem would be basically you infer the underlying gene regulatory graph, parameterize it, and then use it to predict transcriptional outcomes um, when you perturb some upstream genes. So what happens to the genes downstream? But however, recent benchmarking studies have shown that gene regulatory network inference struggles with large data sets, especially single cell data sets. And also most existing implementations are not able to capture complex nonlinear effects of perturbation. And many of them will often assume um, additive relationships between genes. So there's been some recent work using um, uh, neural networks and latent, space, latent variable based methods to skip the network inference step entirely um, using methods such as an autoencoder. However, these approaches will also map, um, these approaches will um, often use uh, non-meaningful representations of genes, such as using a one-hot encoding. And so what this does is that, say you've trained your model on perturbing gene two and gene four, um, you may not be able to predict what will happen if you perturb gene three. Um, and this is just a challenge that one-hot encodings often uh, create. And so what we wanted to do was really combine the best of both of these approaches, where we can leverage our prior knowledge of how genes are interconnected and also use large data sets using um, deep learning. And so the way that we do that is using graph neural networks. And what graph neural networks allow us to do is to use deep learning to learn complex relationships from large single cell data sets, but also constrain the learning process using prior knowledge of how genes should be related to each other. And the end result is that we're able to extend our predictions to new genes and new perturbations that were not seen experimentally perturbed when we were training our model. So we call this approach Graph Enhanced Gene Activation and Repression Simulator, or GEARS for short. And it's essentially a deep learning model that's constrained by prior knowledge of gene-gene relationships. So in the next five slides, I'll describe how our model leverages prior knowledge of biology at many different levels and how this improves our model's performance and allows us to extend to new domains in predicting perturbation outcomes. So as mentioned previously, the input to our model is the unperturbed gene expression for genes G1 through Gn and the applied perturbation. So the first step for us is to initialize multidimensional embedding vectors for each gene, um, again, G1 through Gn, and each gene's perturbation, which we represent using P, so P1 through Pn. And the goal of using these multidimensional embedding vectors for each gene is that it allows us to better capture gene-specific heterogeneity in terms of how they respond to different perturbations. So this is very different from most existing single cell expression data, uh, ex expression analysis methods, which will represent each gene as a scalar in the latent space. And so we're giving the model more room to capture complex uh, relationships between genes. Um, and the other advantage of using the embedding vectors is that we can use them to simulate perturbations through combining embeddings in the latent space. So for instance, in this case, we're perturbing genes G2 and G4, 
Um, and so what we do is we take the perturbation vectors for perturbing gene two, which is P2, and that for gene four, which is P4, and we add them to each of the gene embedding vectors from G1 through Gn. And this simulates the effect of applying this perturbation latent space and also shows how our model is actually generalizable to an arbitrary, arbitrary number of uh, perturbations. Next, we use these embedding vectors to enforce um, prior knowledge of how, they sh how the genes are related to one another. And so for this, what we do is we make use of a gene co-expression graph for gene embeddings, and we use a gene ontology graph for gene perturbation embeddings. So for each node in both of these graphs corresponds to a gene. And so in this, in this graph, each node is also a gene, but it's representing the perturbation of that gene. And here it's representing that, gene, this, that specific gene. And the, uh, the, the node embedding vectors in the gene co-expression graph are simply the gene embedding vectors. And the node embedding vectors in the perturbation graph are the perturbation embedding vectors. Now, the intuition here that we're relying on is that genes that are co-expressed should respond to similar perturbations similarly. And genes that are involved in the same pathway should produce a similar effect upon perturbation. And this is an effect that we also see in single cell perturbation data sets. So for instance, we can see here that several genes that are co-regulated will often respond similarly to different perturbations. And genes that are involved in similar pathways will often produce similar effects upon perturbation. And so what we're doing is we're leveraging this um, inherent feature of genes to allow our model to extend predictions to new genes that have not been seen at the time of training. Um, the next step for our model is to incorporate cross-gene effects. So up until this point, um, we've been looking at the effects of ap applying a perturbation at the level of single genes. And so we use what we call our cross-gene layer to allow different embedding vectors to, com uh, to communicate with each other. And so what this, this layer lets us do is better generalize secondary effects of perturbation. So for instance, if G9 is influenced by the expression of G4, but not directly by the expression of um, gene two, then this layer makes it easy for the model to predict that G9 is going to be affected by the perturbation of uh, gene two. And then the final layer in our model is essentially a decoder. Um, so what this does is for every gene, we have a gene specific decoder, which will decode out the final expression state. Um, we'd also like to mention that our, uh, we, don't, uh, the, we don't perform a full reconstruction loss on this term. So what we do is we have each decoder is connected to the original, uh, the, the, the post-perturbed embedding state. And we essentially use this cross-gene layer uh, to condition our output. And so this reduces the learning burden on our model and it doesn't force the model to reconstruct the output from this cross-gene state. It just uses the cross-gene state to condition our output that's just coming from the original uh, perturbation embeddings. All right, so the model is trained on this final loss, which is the final uh, post perturbation gene expression, and um, the, the loss is propagated all the way back to the original embeddings. Um, and so we use a mean squared error loss um, to train the model end to end. So what is this loss? Um, so this loss can be represented as follows. So for every gene, uh, GU, we are um, comparing its predicted expression to its true expression, and we average that across all genes, cells, and perturbations, then we look at this across batches. Another uh, innovation in our approach is that we use something called the autofocus loss. We add an additional term in the exponent, which allows us to focus on genes that are more differentially expressed, as opposed to the vast majority of genes that don't really show a meaningful phenotype upon perturbation. So you can see here that genes that have very low differential expression are given a very low weighting in uh, when computing the loss. And so we focus our attention more on the interesting genes. Another aspect of our model, which makes it more genetic, uh, relevant from a genomics perspective, is that we incorporate a directionality law. So if you use a simple mean square error, then both predictions one and prediction two would be given the same score. However, in most genomics applications, we're very interested in the direction of a perturbation effect. And so what we do is we explicitly force the model to penalize prediction one more than prediction two um, by comparing the signs of the predictions um, uh, to the true sign of the post-perturbation expression. All right, so that's an overview of our architecture and how we train it. So now we can talk a little bit about some of the results. So let's consider a combination of genes here that is being perturbed. So we consider an example where FOSB and CEBPB are two genes that are being perturbed in combination. On the y-axis here, we see the change in gene expression over control, which is shown by the screen dotted line. And then on the x-axis, you see the 20 most differentially expressed genes following this perturbation. And so the black boxes correspond to the true post-perturbation gene expression for each of these genes. And then the red dots correspond to the prediction being made by GEARS. And so you can see that GEARS is doing a very good job of capturing um, the true post-perturbation effects, both in cases of upregulation and downregulation. 
Um, another interesting point to note here is that the gene CEBPB was not seen, <clears throat> excuse me, experimentally perturbed at the time of training. And so this is a, a very novel setting where um, we are able to extend our predictions to genes that were not experimentally perturbed, but we can still make uh, accurate predictions for. So we formalize this setting a little bit more um, in this slide. So for instance, consider any, any two gene perturbation in your test set um, consisting of two genes X and Y being perturbed in combination. So there are three possible settings in your training set. You could have perturbed X and Y individually and seen both of those perturbations in your training set, or you could have seen either X or Y perturbed, and so that would be a harder setting, or you could have seen neither of the two genes perturbed, and that's the hardest setting. So as we go from left to right, we're seeing the hard difficulty of generalization increasing. And for these last two cases, GEARS is the only deep learning based approach that's able to make these predictions. And what we find is that our performance is, uh, uh, we offer a significant improvement in performance across all these three generalization conditions. So we compare to two benchmark models. We compare to a linear model that is essentially a parameterized co-expression graph. Um, and we also compare to a deep learning based approach that doesn't use any prior knowledge of uh, how genes are related and also uses a different architecture. And we find that our approach is able to outperform by over 45% across all these different uh, settings. So we were beyond just predicting the absolute value of, of gene expression, we were also interested in being able to detect is GEARS learning something meaningful about a, a combinatorial perturbation, or is it simply adding together naively the effect of these single gene perturbations? So on the y-axis here, we're seeing the same change in gene expression over control, which is here at the black line. And here we're considering the perturbation uh, PTPN12 plus ZBTB25. So this is a, again a two gene combination. So the Y hatched bar, the yellow hatched bars here show you the effect of just perturbing each gene individually. So we see that this bar here on the top shows the effect of just perturbing PTPN12. And this one on the bottom shows the effect of just perturbing this gene. And so a naive model would just say, oh, the, the effect of the combination is just the sum of these two individual effects. But the reality when we look at the actual post perturbation data from the experiment is that there's actually a synergy just take interaction taking place, which is much higher than the, naive, than the naive additive sum. And what we see is that GEARS is able to detect this synergistic interaction and it's able to predict this, uh, this effect. So we looked across the top 10 most um, uh, interesting interacting uh, genes, and we found that GEARS was able to detect these interaction effects in many different forms, in the form of synergy as shown here, in the form of suppression, or in the case of HISDH1C, and also in the case of neomorphism, where single genes are showing no effect, but the combination is actually showing something completely new. So beyond just thinking about this at the level of individual genes, we also thought about this at the level of the full transcriptome. So we can represent here each gene's full transcriptional effect as a vector. So one perturbation could be the perturbation vector X, and then another perturbation effect could be represented in transcriptional space by Y. And so X here is causing the cell to become more square-like, Y is causing it to become bigger. And so a simple naive uh, additive effect would just be a bigger square-like cell. And so you can also show this using vector representation where it's simply the resultant of the two single effects. But what we find in reality is that most interactions, most combinations uh, produce some kind of nonlinear effect between the two um, interacting perturbations. So you might see that the phenotype is actually much greater than what you would expect through a simple uh, uh, naive combination or in the case of synergy, or it might be much lesser in the, than the result in the case of suppression, or it might be a completely novel phenotype that's unexpected in the case of neomorphism and so on. And so we quantified these different um, uh, and non uh, unexpected interaction effects and went back to our original data of 130 different combinations and tried to see how well we could detect the strongest interactions. And what we found was that in, in the case of all five subtypes, we were able to significantly improve our precision in detecting these interaction effects. And we were also twice as accurate at detecting the most of the strongest, uh, the strongest interactions. So finally, I just wanted to talk about what our bigger goal with GEARS is. And what we really hope this tool to be is an in silico experiment experimentation tool that allows researchers to significantly expand the information that they gain from running a perturbational screen and also help in guiding the design of new screens so that they can be more informative. So consider a screen on the left here where you're perturbing genes G1 through G5 singly, and you're also perturbing some combinations of these genes. So we'd like for GEARS to be able to train on this data and make predictions for all the other pairwise perturbations that were not seen at the time of training and basically give you much more um, value for your experiment. So we applied this to, again, the same data set with 236 different scene perturbations. Each dot here corresponds to the transcriptional effect of performing a perturbation. And you can see that many of these perturbations meaningfully cluster in, in biological space. 
And then when we apply um, gears to this training data, we're able to make predictions for all pairwise combinations of the single genes in this data set. So that gives us 5,400 uh, pairwise combinations. And you see that they also sort of meaningfully cluster within this space. And most interestingly, we're also able to detect new clusters that were not present in the original uh, in the original data, which um, allows us, uh, which gives us confidence that gears is able to generalize to new um, to new uh, areas of the space. Okay, so in summary, we present the first computational approach to reliably predict outcomes for perturbing combinations of genes not experimentally perturbed before. We're also uniquely positioned to multiply information gained from perturbational screens and also guide the design of future experiments. Um, so thank you for listening, and here's the, the links to our code and uh, the preprint. Um, I'd like to thank my advisors, Yuri and Steve, for their help in this project, and also Kushin, uh, my collaborator in this work. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you so much. I see one question uh, by Will uh, Bill Noble. Can you can you please explain the loss again? I didn't understand uh, what the additional value in the exponent depends on in terms of the indices on the three summations. So let's let's go back to the loss. Sure. Uh... Yeah, so essentially, um, if you look at uh, single cell perturbational data, most of the genes actually don't do anything. Um, uh, upon perturbation, there's no effect of applying that perturbation on the gene. So there, there's just like, uh, it's, it's just like noise. And so what we want our model to do is to not be affected by those genes that are not causing a significant effect, uh, that are not causing a significant, uh, that are not being significantly affected by the perturbation. And so we want the model to focus more on those genes that have a higher difference. And so as you can see here, this, this orange line corresponds to, so for instance, if we set gamma to be two, this orange line corresponds to uh, the mean square error um, if you have uh, basically an exponent of two plus two, which is four, as compared to um, a, a regular mean square error loss, which is the blue line. And so you can see that this orange line is essentially um, giving less importance to these um, less differentially expressed genes, but it's giving a much higher importance to the genes that have a much higher uh, differential expression. And we've done some ablation experiments that show that this significantly improved uh, the performance of our model. Okay, um, thank you so much. Okay. Um, well, given, so I, I have a quick question. So given that, you know, interoperability was a, was a sort of a theme in the previous talk, I'm just curious, have you uh, tried attributing back to the input, to the input space? Um, so you mean, explaining um, your prediction right yeah that's an interesting point um we're actually really interested in exploring like how the graph helps in in making the predictions and whether that can give us more interpretability um at the moment we've not um explicitly looked at a lot of interpretability approaches um i guess we have added an uncertainty term to our model which uh, allows us to uh a, to make um, an estimate of how much uncertainty we have with each prediction um, but we've not ex uh, explicitly explored um, interpretability as such. We have also found that like um, in some of the experiment, ablation experiments we did, we found that the connectivity of genes within these graphs really influences their performance, the performance uh, downstream. So if you have genes that are not well connected in these, um, in, in for instance, in the gene ontology graph, it tends to perform more poorly um, than a gene that is more well connected. So that kind of fits our intuition that these graphs are, are are adding additional information. But yeah, we haven't done any work uh, beyond that. Okay. Uh, I, have, I, have a, I have a question, but I'm, it won't let me raise my hand for some reason. Um, so, yeah, yeah we'll start. Um, maybe I missed it. Did you talk about um, the for single okay is it only me who thought that you you cut out was it david yeah okay, sorry so, i didn't understand the question right so why why don't you david you uh you dm your question to either me or yourself why we'll handle uh, the next question. David, we couldn't hear you. Is he even here? Okay. <laughs> okay. In the meantime, let's uh, so so anonymous attendee asked, um, have you tried to um 
uh, look backwards, for example, you have an expression profile. Can you uh, predict that combination was used? What combination was used? Yeah, that's a really good point. I think what you're getting at is, can we think of the inverse problem, which is you have um, a profile that you'd like to get to. What is the ideal perturbation that will get you there? Um, that's We're really excited about that direction. Um, and it's definitely a harder problem because you kind of have to like search through your latent space to find the best uh, perturbation that will get you there. Um, so we've not uh, we've not specifically addressed that, at least not in our work at the moment. Um, but yeah, we're very interested um, in looking at how we can do that. Um, you know, perhaps there are uh, approaches that can optimize over the latent space. And there's many work, uh, there are many previous works that have done something similar and then can potentially help us identify what's the best perturbation or the best multi-gene perturbation that will get us to our desired outcome. Yeah, it's 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 exciting, but we haven't looked at it. There's another question. Okay, there's another question, sorry, yeah. So technical question, which GNN framework did you use and why? Yeah, we experimented with a number of different frameworks and we ended up going with a, a, a sort of like a vanilla graph convolutional network. I think the reason for that might be that our graph at the moment is not uh, particularly complex. It's quite large, but it's not particularly complex. We have only uh, edges of only one type. Um, and we've also sort of, in the, within the gene ontology context, we've only looked at direct parents. We haven't brought in like the full hierarchy. Um, but I think this, this work was more like a proof of concept that this idea works and that there is a lot of extra information that can help. And I think as, as next steps, we're really interested in like making this graph like more heterogeneous um, and thinking about ways in which yeah, we can use more complex architectures or some form of pre-training to uh, better, uh, better improve performance. But at the moment, we're just using a, graph, a regular graph convolution architecture from uh, PyG. Thank you so much. So the last question from David Knowles. Uh, can you use this for denoising data sets? These are denoising. Hmm, that's interesting. So, sorry, how would, uh, I guess, uh, can you elaborate again, a bit more? Yeah. If I, yeah, if I cut off again, I can uh, try to elaborate. So a lot of these, like, uh, crop seek and similar data sets are pretty the measurements themselves are pretty noisy and you know you're obviously mostly focused on predicting for patients that you haven't done but i'm wondering whether you have another use case would be actually getting better estimates of perturbations that you do have uh, I see. Yeah, that's actually a good point. So yeah, maybe, I mean, I guess theoretically, if you have a well-trained model, yeah, you could perhaps um, uh, identify whether a perturbation was successful, if that's what you're asking, like whether it achieved the desired effect. Um, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that would be an aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a good point. In fact, it's also one of the challenges we face when training such models is the assumption that like the perturbations were doing exactly what you want them to be doing. Um, and that the distributions are nice and like uh, you know um, uh, well well formed and and that the and so the, there's definitely a lot of assumptions we make while training that um, uh, that that assume these things. But but yeah, you're right. I think being able to detect uh, detect when there's like a deviation from from these uh, assumptions and there's noisy data set or failed perturbations, um, I think that would be uh, an interesting application for a well trained model. Yeah. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay, thank you so much. Let's thank all the oral speakers. It was extremely selective, actually, you know, being uh, selected as an oral. It was also very selective, um, the, the spotlight as well. So in the next 25 minutes, we are gonna hear about um, the, the papers that were selected for spotlight presentation. So five minutes each, and then we'll start with uh, TNU. Uh, okay, yeah, I can hear, I can share my screen, I think. Hi, Professor, nice to be here again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so I think I can start now. Yeah, can I see, can I see yes. my screen? Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, I can see your yeah poster, yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's great, yeah. So hello everyone, this is Tianyu from Yale University, and today I will present our work focusing on the multi-omic single cell data integration. And this work is jointly finished with Grant Greenberg and Professor Anna Shawlani from ULC. So we know that the biotechnology related to single cell technique is actually a kind of breakthrough in the genetics research. 
And with such kind of biotechnology, we actually can access plenty of multi-omics data from the DNA accessibility to the protein level data. So such access can actually provide a multi-layer picture for the cell heterogeneity analysis. However, there still exists a very challenging and interesting problem is how to integrate this data together. I mean, to perform the data analysis simultaneously and jointly. So the data in integration is actually a kind of initial steps, which is uh, accepted as a general solution in this kind of problem. So to formalize our task, we can see uh, uh, this picture. And actually our problem is how can we integrate the two omics data from the same cell into a joint embedding space? So this is come from assumption based on the share the similarity manual void distribution. And another challenge we actually face is how to balance two conflicting targets. The first thing is we intend to do is to remove the batch effect. The second one is to preserve the biological information. And in our research, actually we are some higher wise in the biological information preservation part. And I will illustrate this point later. And for our method part, we utilize the cross trend vector contest modification VE. And we can see that our model actually contains two parts, uh, two encoder decoder structures. And if we take S1 here as the single cell ATAC sequence data and S2 as single cell RNA sequence data, so our first step is to utilize the encoder to encode this multi-omics data into a encoder space. And then we find the nearest neighbor in this code books based on the vector quantize operation. And we utilize the nearest neighbor in the code books to perform the training for the decoder part. And we calculate reconstruction laws based on these two pairs data. And the reason we choose the cross-trend VAE is because if we don't use cross-trend VAE and vector quantize modification, we will face the posterior collapse problem existing in the VAE training process. So the vector quantized code books are showing the red figure. So if we take the green point as the output of the encoder and the purple point as a point in the code books, we actually find the nearest neighbors existing in these code books. And the posterior collapse is a problem existing in the training process of VAE. So the definition is the variables of the latent space representation are not involved in the reconstruction process. And I will display the effects uh, in the later presentation. And the, so the solution is very intuitive because the cells are actually discrete. So it is very natural to model, uh, to model quantized latent space here. And the vectors in this code books are actually the estimators based on the mean squared errors for the output of the encoders. And we add us a proof in our paper. And for the loss function parts, uh, we actually have two sides of the loss function. The first one refers to the vector quantized loss function, and it contains three parts. The first one is the general reconstruction loss. The second one is the vector quantized loss. We use it to re restrict the latent space data. And the third one is the commitment loss. It actually can ensure our training process is as smooth as possible. And the second one is a parity information loss. So actually, finally, we combine this loss together and then finish our training process. And for the experiments part, we can take a look at this table for the uh, performance and confirmation about based on the select data set we have. So in this table, we can see that our model CVQ VAE achieves very highest score based on some kind of matrix focusing on the cell type. For example, the NMI cell label, cell cycle focusing on the bioinformation preservation and the connectivity focusing on the um, batch effect removal. And actually the model includes its performance is very close to our design, but if we compare it based on the running time, so our method is more efficient than their model. And for the embedding visualization part, we can see that if we do not add a vector quantized modification here, if we directly train a VAE model, we can see that the cell are actually messy. We cannot distinguish the cell type labels. But if we add the vector quantized modification here, we can see that the cells with the same cell type are actually classified into a same cluster and we can observe the borderline here. And the batch effect has also been reduced a lot. And for example, related to the biological information preservation analysis, we can take the trajectory analysis as an example. So here we can calculate the trajectory score based on the single cell RNA sequence data and the single cell ATAC sequence data. And if we can display this kind of scores based on our joint embedding space, we can see that the cells are co-embedded here if they have a similar score. And we can also observe a trajectory direction based on this kind of uh, integration. And for the future work, the first one we intend to do is to perform the integration of the control groups and disease groups for the data analysis, focusing on some kind of disease. And the second one, we intend to generalize a more rigorous proof of preventing the posterior collapse based on the vector quantized modification. And if you're interested in our models, code and proofs, you can scan this QR code or just use this link to access more information. And many thanks for listening. Yeah, so my presentation ends. I'm very happy to hear some comments and questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, TNU. Uh, the next presenter is, uh, is there any question? Sorry. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So no, great. No. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So next presenter is uh, I believe T N E. The paper number thirty two. Is there a presenter here? Energy-based modeling of a single cell data annotation, no? Looks like you might have joined as an attendee instead of a panelist. Uh-oh, okay. So, okay, so now let's let's move on to the next one until um, until the presenter finds yeah, the right link. Oh. Upgrade him, if, uh, him or her. Um, if, if you see them on the participant list, the um, moderators yeah. can up upgrade them to panelists. Maybe, yeah. Okay. Okay. Somebody else needs to do it. Let's, you know, we, we, we have a very tight schedule. How about we move to the next paper and until the presenter joins? Okay. So the next speaker is a Jing, um, Jing Ji. Are you ready to present? Uh oh. I think Tianyu is here now. Is, is that is that who we are? Oh, TNE said I'm here. Right. Okay. Oh, TNE is there. Okay. So what should I do? So who is gonna? So who who is the speaker for the spotlight? Who is ready now? Uh, okay, I, Kilian, I, I'm, yes. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm paper 42. I don't know if, um, okay. if Jing Jai was uh, meant to present or not. Oh, but, sorry. Uh, yeah. But I'm here. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. So let's move on to this topological techniques for classification okay. of tumor immune data. Great. Um, yeah. Give me one second. Okay. And then I see TNE. So you are going to be the next. I mean, after Gillian. Let's go. <laughs> Ah, sorry, got slides to share. Um, uh, does this look good? Great. Um, okay, yeah, so um, our group is uh, from the uh, Department of Mathematics at Oxford University, largely from the uh, Ludwig Center for Cancer Research and the Center for Topological Data Analysis. The first three authors on this paper um, were a group of a brilliant undergrad and master's students, so I'm very excited to be here to share their work. Um, our goal was to uh, begin to develop a pipeline for topologically analyzing um, 2D spatial configurations of cells from uh, multiplex data, but uh, we began by analyzing an agent-based model developed by Josh Bull and Helen Byrne in previous work. Um, the model um, varied uh, three parameters, so agent-based, the cells uh, all had individual rules they were following, and we uh, varied, I believe, the uh, extravasation rate, the chemotactic sensitivity, and the critical threshold for um, when the phenotype of macrophages begins to change. And they exhibit a range of qualitative behaviors, but for classification purposes, we were most interested in the formation of perivascular niches um, around the blood vessels. And uh, we're trying to predict them as early in the time series as possible. So we have about four, 500 time series data um, at uh, 10 hour time steps. So to analyze this data, we used a method that's now pretty standard in the field of topological data analysis. It's called persistent homology. So uh, for a particular cell type and the um, spatial coordinates of those cells at a particular moment in time, um, we use a simplicial complex to encode the proximity relationships of the cells. So if two cells are near to each other, then they're connected by an edge. And um, if uh, clusters of cells are near to each other, they have a higher dimensional simplex between them. And the homology of each of these simplicial complexes in the zeroth and first dimensions encodes respectively the clusters and holes in that simplicial complex. Persistent homology on top of that tracks the evolution of these clusters and holes either as the time series moves along. Um, so out of our four methods and many variations, two of these have a time series component, 
or just the spatial relationships at increasing radius. So um, that's what I have pictured in this diagram that um, as a radius around each cell increases, we are encoding uh, further and further distance relationships between the, the cells. And then we vectorize this in a persistence image, which is pictured on the right. And then we fed all of these persistence images into a logistic regression classifier um, and got some pretty interesting results. So um, we used what we thought were pretty strong benchmarks, um, the number of tumor cells or macrophages in the simulation, the distance between the tumor and the nearest blood vessel, and the macrophage phenotype ratio, which is a pretty commonly used metric for for this prediction um, and is increasingly available with advanced imaging techniques. And we, we found some nice results that you know come to the poster later and I'll say more about. Um, basically, uh, we were able pretty early on to, uh, to do this classification based on just the arrangements of macrophages and their evolution through the beginning stages of the model. And at a later time, the, um, the filtrations that we have for the tumor cells were able to pick up um, some some nice shape information like the boundary regularity and um, number of components and stuff like that. So uh, more details come see the poster. There's only so much I can say in five minutes, but thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Gillian. Uh, now, Tiani, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Let me share my screen. Yep, can everyone see my screen? Okay, perfect. So. Yes. Um, I will be introducing our work on energy-based modeling for single cell data annotation. So this work is brought to you by Tianyi, Philip, Lazar, and Leo. So cell type annotation is a crucial step in single cell analysis workflow. So when dealing with a fresh data sets, we mainly focus on two things. First, we would like to identify cell types that appear in the data sets, and second, if there's any unobserved cell types or any cells that has abnormal expression profile, we will, we will like to flag them for further investigation. So in the context of machine learning, this will be framed as a out of distribution detection problem or OOD detection for short. In addition, generative modeling is rarely been used for single cell OOD detection and recent advances of energy-based models enable data hybrid modeling. Finally, as a fact, researchers are building large-scale single-cell reference datasets. Therefore, in this work, we introduced energy-based models to single-cell data hybrid modeling for cell type annotation. I will briefly introduce the energy-based models. So EBM is a family of probabilistic model inspired by physics, and the core equation of an EBM is listed here. So an EBM basically maps the data points to its energy value E theta x via the Boltzmann distribution, and E theta is the energy function. Our work, more specifically, is based on the joint energy-based model, or JAM for short, which uses a softmax classifier as the energy function. So such formulation allow us to accomplish data hybrid modeling to elaborate by saying data hybrid modeling, we can generatively detect OOD samples while annotating cell types. In other words, we will be training a model that accomplish a generative task and a discriminative task simultaneously. GEM is a pretty compelling and effective model, but it's pretty difficult to train due to divergence, and we observe the problem become more serious in the single cell domain. Below, I enclosed a training curve for GEM in on one of the single cell data sets, and we observe that when the model is starting to make progress, the accuracy drops significantly and the model just diverge. So this is a schematic diagram of our model. So all the elements in black is the original GEM formulation and our work applying additional regularization on the generative laws. So more specifically, we're using loss clipping with the exponential linear units, as well as a stochastic regularization, which is similar as a dropout unit at act on the generative laws. We ran experiments on two classic datasets, a pancreatic datasets and the PBMC datasets, 
We ran scan pi workflow to pre-process the data sets and use Harmony to integrate the reference and query pairs. Here I enclose partial results for our model. We mainly benchmark our model against three classes of models, EVMs, a neural net classifier, and some biological tools. So we found that energy-based models overall has the best and balanced performance, and they have better performance than threat on single cell annotation. Second, we found generative score for OOD has better capability than the classic discriminative score. And finally, we found that our manipulation to jam improves the performance, but it sacrifices the calibration. To summarize, in this work, we present a family of single cell data annotation tool based on recent advances of energy-based models. We develop a customized instance of energy-based model for single cell annotation. We also explored the generative modeling for OD detection. We further demonstrate that EBMs outperform existing tools. And finally, those EBMs can also be deployed into other related computational biology problems, for example, the multi ohm analysis. Thank you all for listening, and please find more details in our poster and paper. OK, thank you so much, Tiani. Uh, the next speaker, uh, I, don't, I don't see a question on the chat. By the way, there is a question to Gillian. So Gillian, you can uh, answer uh, that question there. OK, so uh, let's see. The next, next speaker is uh, Maria. Are you here? OK, great. Yeah, I'm here. Um, what was... Oh, hi. Yes. So hello. Um, I'm Maria. I am a PhD student at Caltech in the Pachter Lab, and I'm going to be presenting my work on using neural networks to approximate models of transcriptional dynamics. So as some background and motivation, um, experimental techniques have advanced to allow the quantification of multiple modalities or molecular species in single cells. So for thousands of cells and thousands of genes, we can now quantify um, levels of nascent or unspliced RNA, spliced mature RNA proteins, um, and with the anticipation that this is going to be extended in uh, future experiments, experimental techniques to allow quantification of many modalities. And so the question is, how are we going to treat this data? How are we going to sort of integrate this in order to discover something about the underlying um, system of uh, transcription in cells? And so one way we can do this is by using or proposing a biophysical hypothesis about the method or the system of transcription. So for example, DNA can be transcribed with some rate K to produce nascent RNA, which can be spliced and degraded at some other rates. And this can be formalized using chemical master equation models, which track the probability of microstates of these species over time. And these chemical master equation in some cases can be solved for steady state distributions of say mature and nascent RNA molecules given theta, this, these underlying biophysical parameters. And then data can be used to infer parameters about the underlying transcriptional dynamics of these cells. Now the challenge or the problem is that for some experimentally validated models of transcription, which are, are not even very um, complex, there is no analytical solution for these chemical master equation models. So this, this model um, that, that we are working on of birth transcription is uh, that nascent RNA is uh, transcribed in bursts according to a geometric distribution, spliced according to a Poisson process with some rate beta, and um, degraded according to another Poisson process. And burst transcription has been observed in um, experiments. And uh, the problem is that this the chemical master equation has no analytical solution for the joint distribution, although the marginal distribution for a nascent RNA is um, a negative binomial distribution. And the joint distribution for nascent immature RNA can be solved using numerical methods, such as generating functions, but this is just uh, computationally intensive and it's just inefficient for inferring parameters in single cell studies where we have thousands of uh, data points. So we developed a technique to efficiently approximate these joint distributions, giving some, given some input um, biophysical parameters. So it's, our technique involves 
first defining a set of unweighted kernel functions for um, the marginal mature distribution, and then using a neural network to predict weights for these distributions, multiplying the weights by the kernel functions and adding them together to um, approximate a marginal distribution for mature RNA given a nascent value and some biophysical parameters. And then because there is a known solution for nascent RNA, we can multiply the analytical solution by the approximation to recover a joint distribution for nascent and mature RNA, and then train this by minimizing um, the KL divergence between our approximations and high quality generating function solutions, which as I said before, we, we can get generating function solutions, it's just computationally expensive. And so our approximations are accurate and orders of magnitude faster than the generating function solutions. So on the left, we have just qualitatively for four different sets of biophysical parameters, the uh, generating function solution and our approximation technique, and it's a lot faster. And if you want quantitative results, you can look at our preprint or come talk to me at the poster session. And the future directions are to actually use this to infer parameters given single cell data and to also further extend this approximation technique to multiple modalities. Um, thanks to everyone in my lab. And yes, come talk to me later if you're interested. OK, thank you so much, Maria. I don't see any questions. Um, so let's turn to the next speaker, Jacob Schreiber. Uh, thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jacob Schreiber. I'm a postdoc working with Anjul Kandaje at Stanford. So several years ago, a group of heroes met as a response to a call to action, host and design the ENCODE imputation challenge. This would serve as an open challenge for people to develop computational methods to impute the readouts of genome-wide experiments. Here's an example of one. In blue, you have experimental data from a histone chip seek experiment. In green, you have the results from a computational method I developed, and in orange, a baseline method. So this is the type of data that we that the challenge would be working with. In designing this, they uh, in, uh, in designing this, we downloaded around 300 tracks of data from the ENCODE portal. The challenge itself would be divided into two stages. In the first stage, these around 300 tracks would be divided into a training and a validation set, and performance on the validation set would be how we judge the models. This stage was primarily so that people could get their hands on the data and see what they were dealing with. In the second stage, these models would be evaluated on entirely new data that was collected during the challenge. This prospective evaluation would make sure that nobody had access to it or any data leaked or anything. This would ensure that the models were truly generalizable. However, danger beset our heroes almost immediately when we started evaluating these uh, ev evaluating these methods on, um, on the test set data. As you can see here, the average activity, which is a dummy baseline that doesn't involve training at all, outperformed all but the top two performers in the challenge. This was not the case in the first in the first stage. It only happened in the second stage. When we began looking at the data, a problem almost immediately revealed itself. If we look at the actual signal value of the experimental data in blue here, you can see it scaled between zero and 100. But all of the methods, including all of the baseline methods, are on a totally different distribution. That the top one here only goes from zero to 50, but most are likely zero to 25. If we look at this in a more comprehensive manner across all of the assays, we saw a distributional shift on all of the assays. Uh, it's, most, it's most exemplified here by the hck 4 me 31 Note that the x-axis here is a log scale. And so the signal values we were seeing from the test set experiments was significantly different than the ones that we saw in the training and the validation set. And so that messed with all the scale-based measures we were using to rank these methods. What happened? Well, uh, what we first thought is maybe the experiments that were performed during the, that were, you know, collected for the test set were of higher quality than the other ones. But this ended up not being the, the this ended up not being the challenge. That the x-axis here is various measures of quality, the y-axis is the measure of distributional shift, and the green experiments here are the test set experiments. They seem relatively median in terms of the quality. After a long investigation, what we found is that ultimately the problem arose because the test set experiments were paired end, whereas the training and validation side experiments because they were older were single end. But this wasn't because the paired end experiments were simply higher quality than the single end experiments as we originally thought. All of the measures of quality were basically the same. 
Rather, it ended up being an issue in the deduplication step done by Picard on this data. Basically, the issue is this. For single end data, Picard says that only one read can map her position in the genome. For paired end data, Picard says that only one start end pair can map per start end, you know, per uh, pair of loci on the genome. And so this significantly increased the number of reads that could map per peak. And so when we corrected for that, we noticed that not only when we reprocessed the data using single end settings, we noticed that not only did the scale of the signal disappear until the distributional shift went away, but the shape also changed for many of the assays. So you can see here that there's a low correlation between the paired end and single end data for some of these, for some of these assays. And so ultimately, what I want is to serve as a call to action for people. You need to understand how your data is processed. You can't just use data you find on the internet and train some machine learning model and expect that your performance measures are going to work. You need to make sure that your data is all processed uniformly and what exactly that means. And so otherwise, you risk that your conclusions from your models being invalid. If we had just used the settings here as described, the top performing methods may not have been the top performers at all in a realistic setting. So. Uh, thanks to everyone who participated in the challenge and everyone who helped me uh, analyze the data. Come talk to me at my poster if you want to hear more. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let's thank all uh, speakers at the uh, spotlight session. Again, it was extremely selective and congratulations again to be selected. Okay, so we are going to have a lunch break um, for the West Coast time zone and and a, and a break it has been three hours so we are going to stretch go outside have some fresh air and then we are gonna we are gonna resume uh at uh is it 12 40 12 40 yeah 12 40 uh uh the pacific time see you soon Next, is uh, the uh, is uh, the uh, tape uh, not good? Uh, 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 Were you on mute?
All right, everyone, we'll give uh, other people a few more minutes before we get started. All right, everyone, hope you had a good break. Uh, I'm Gerald, the moderator for this session. Um, and so first off, uh, first up will be Prashna, who will be talking to us about how Ensembling improves feature selection for deep learning models. Prashna, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay, sounds good. Um, hello, everyone. I am Prasanna, uh, and today I'm going to talk about my paper on Ensembling Improves uh, Stability and Power of Feature Selection for Deep Learning Models. Uh, this has been in collaboration with uh, Zhao Zhao, James, and GUI from Stanford. Machine learning, especially with deep learning, has demonstrated remarkable progress in recent years. Besides having high performance measures by accuracy and AUCs, its uses in highly critical areas like healthcare requires robust and accurate explanations. Explainability helps in understanding models prediction and discovering causal features. For instance, uh, one might be interested in understanding which set of genes are used by the model for clinical outcome prediction. And such information provides a level of trust as it is convenient to buy into ML systems predictions when the system can explain how it reached its conclusion. This requirement within machine learning has resulted in increased uh, scientific interest in the field of explainable AI, a field that is concerned with the development of new methods that can explain and interpret machine learning models. And this has resulted in wide range of explanation approaches, including analyzing gradients of deep neural networks or looking at sharp values. And similarly, efforts have also been seen around development of numerous machine learning libraries that ensures explainable AI by design. Yet, these attempts toward interpretability have issues as these interpretations are fragile, the interpretations being unstable, different methods resulting in different interpretations or lack of intuitive explanations have been known issues uh, to the ML community. And on top of that, some recent studies have carefully studied this issue within a neural network. For instance, Korbani et al. demonstrated that a slight perturbation to the image pixel shifts its saliency maps or explanation dramatically to features that would not be considered salient by human perception, even though there was no change in models prediction. As we can see here in this last example, the model seemed to be highlighting to the correct reason uh, of LAMA for the original image. And then with imperceptible chains via adversarial perturbation, the explanation seemed to be directing in a completely different reason of the image. Although both uh, in both cases, model was predicting it to be accurate. So in this work, we study this issue of instability in models interpretability for a deep neural network. Unlike previous approaches in the literature, we don't rely on any kind of perturbations and try to understand uh, the severity of the problem, even in a regular settings. 
We then propose a simple framework which essentially creates an ensemble of feature importance score across training path of a neural network to achieve stable interpretations. We consider the application in the task of feature selection as it would provide us with a quantitative measure to validate our approach. And across the simulation studies and three real data applications for feature selection, we demonstrate efficacy of the proposed framework to improve both stability and the power of feature selection for deep learning models. So let's start with some of our findings on this issue of instability in models interpretability. The setup of our study is that we train a neural network multiple times uh, by only varying initialization seeds for same training data set and compute the result on the same test set. We do this for two separate benchmarking data sets, MNIST and CIFAR-10. Uh, we then compute the correlation coefficient between the feature importance scores obtained from those multiple runs. And for feature importance scores, we separately evaluate three different feature importance metrics, simple gradients, uh, deep lift, and line. So ideally, we expect these uh, feature importance scores to have high correlation as they essentially are supposed to do the same task and thus the explanations they provide should be highly correlated with one another. In order to calculate the correlation coefficient, we select the best model on the lowest validation loss in the training path of deep neural network, a common and widely used uh, training procedure. Uh, with the best model obtained from multiple runs, we calculate the correlation coefficient and plot this box plot uh, for two separate data set, MNIST and CIFAR, and we can see that they are not correlated and also they are quite unstable. Instead, when we create an ensemble from feature importance scores obtained across all the epochs, as represented by this uh, simple averaging, we found that such an ensemble helps in stabilizing the interpretations with increased correlation between these random runs. As we can see here uh, in the figure for MNIST, the ensemble represented by AVZ or average increases the correlation significantly. And for CIFAR-10, Although the ensemble was not able to increase uh, correlation by considerable margin, it was still doing better compared to the best model. And in the paper, we also demonstrate that besides the inherent stochasticity in the training of deep neural network, the properties of individual features like uh, signal strength and signal correlation also create instability in feature importance. We see that the standard training setup of deep neural networks and their corresponding interpretations enhance the mistrust in the models. And with an ensemble, we can provide stable interpretations. But interpreting models with stable and incon inconsequential features is also not our goal. As such, we investigate if an ensemble of feature importance scores also help us select important features. With this, we would now like to move toward introducing our proposed uh, unsimiling framework. Uh, let's start with the problem formulation. Essentially, we consider a data set D where we have uh, X representing input data with uh, P features and output Y representing outcome variables. Uh, and we are interested in discovering a set of, uh, set of features P uh, that holds causal link of input data and output labels. In order to find the important features from X, uh, we first consider a standard setup in deep learning training for finding the best model. We consider key different hyperparameter settings for training deep learning models. Uh, these hyperparameter settings could be uh, the choice of lambda values for L1 penalty, uh, depth of neural networks, choice of activation functions, and so on. And for each hyperparameter at k, we train the model for the fixed E epochs and record corresponding uh, cross-validation loss and feature importance score Z at each epoch. In the usual scenario, after training such k different hyperparameter setting, we would see which hyperparameter setting has resulted in the lowest validation loss and then select the model at each specific, at specific epoch and then, then went on with our downstream analysis. And this is represented by this uh, green star here. If, if we would have arranged our loss values obtained at all key settings in the decreasing order of cross-validation loss. 
However, since the loss landscape of neural network training is non-convex with many solutions in different loss basins, in this work, we argue that instead of selecting a single best model, we should also look out for other good models that might have captured the relationship between X and Y and hence can provide us with robust and stable feature selection. In this framework, we propose two strategies to find the good models. First, uh, select top M models based on the lowest cross-validation loss. And note that since we first arrange all the settings together, these top M models could represent models from different hyperparameter settings and at different epochs. In the second strategy, we propose statistical leveraging to find influential Z with the, within the deep learning training regime. The statistical leverage scores have been uh, previously used to determine an influential observation. And to the best of our knowledge, our work is the first to consider such a classical statistical approach to determine the significant feature importance score within the neural network training, uh, training design. Uh, we skip the details of how this work uh, in this slide here, but you could find more details in the paper. Essentially, we combine all the feature importance scores here and calculate each observation's uh, leverage and then use it as, uh, as a sampling weight to obtain our M uh, influential models. We then combine those M feature importance score that we obtained from previous step to create uh, the ensemble of feature importance score, uh, which we call Z ensemble, and use it for feature selection. The feature selection method will then give us set of selected features. Uh, we, there are various approaches to perform feature selection, but in this work, we demonstrate the benefits by relying on a uh, knockoff framework. Knockoff framework has recently emerged as a powerful and flexible method to perform uh, control variable selection. It essentially construct synthetic variables which uh, mimic the correlation structure of the original features. And then by contrasting the original and knockoff data, the knockoff based method allows the selection of important features related to the outcome of interest while controlling the false discovery rate. To sum up, our framework could be uh, thought of as doing hyperparameter optimization in the first step, then using all those hyperparameters, we want to select uh, some M good models, then use those good models to create an ensemble and then use that ensemble to do the feature selection. Okay, now let's go over some of our results. Here we present the setup of our experiments. Here, uh, all of our feature selection ex uh, experiments are based on deep link architecture. Uh, we present the result on both simulated and real world data sets. And considering that we are trying to do the feature selection task, we followed a standard practice of cross validation utilizing all the samples in the data set. And for hyperparameters, we use different values of L1 penalty and consider different depths of neural network. For simulating our data set, we consider linear factor model uh, from which we generate n data points with p features and consider this uh, response, this form of a response, uh, as this, this equation to calculate our response. Uh, here, uh, in order to simulate the coefficient uh, vector beta, we first randomly choose uh, different uh, true signals uh, location and then sample a positive amplitude value for each of those beta j. And for the remaining coefficient values, we set them to zero. In this way, we know which features have the causal link to the response. And for our experiments, we set uh, these different values where we vary the amplitude, uh, amplitude values. So essentially, we have five different data sets. Now for the neural network training, we experiment with three different values of depth, 100 different values of lambda, and then train each network for 300 epochs. So in this way, we have 90,000 different models for each data set to select the feature importance score for uh, the feature selection. We first demonstrate this instability issue of deep learning models in feature selection, which is uh, similar to what we've seen before in the uh, feature importance analysis. Uh, here we calculate the jacquard similarity coefficient to calculate how similar the selected features are. And as we can see that there, there is quite variations between the selected features if we would have gone with the, with the best model, which is a conventional way to select the models. 
Instead, if we try to do everything, uh, including everything across all the epochs or using the uh, proposed strategies in our framework, we can reduce uh, the variations by considerable margin. We then calculate the power of feature selection. Power in feature selection essentially represents percentage of true features that are selected. And here we consider all data sets and all hyperparameter settings. Uh, we present the result in this power analysis over here on A, where we see that ensembling approach uh, achieves better power compared to the standard setup, which is represented by this uh, blue curve across all the signal amplitude values. Second, uh, we try to understand how ensembling helps us achieve better power. And for that, we looked at the obtained power at each training epoch for all hyperparameter settings, that is across all the 90,000 different models. And we plot those obtained power in the decreasing order of validation loss, such that this rightmost point represents the result from the best model. So here, as we can see that the power uh, of 0 0.5 to 0.72 uh, from the conventional approach or by selecting the best model, it's much lesser than uh, the power that we see in this hyperparameter space. And with the ensembling, as we can see here in the C, uh, we can reduce that gap uh, from the best model to the best power. Um, and, and we see that all the ensembling approach is, is doing that. So overall, these results demonstrate that ensembling not only helps in stabilizing the feature importance score, but it also helps us select uh, or improve the power of feature selection. For real data experiments, we consider three different uh, biological data sets, uh, the proteomics data set, breast cancer data set, and PIMA diabetes data set. Here, proteomics uh, is used for binary classification between healthy control and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, similar to simulation setting, we work with uh, different hyperparameter settings uh, resulting in a large number of models. For instance, for our proteomics analysis, we have uh, 4,000 different models resulting from different hyperparameters. Here, the table on the left uh, shows the proposed framework, uh, result from the proposed framework, uh, similar to the simulation studies where we can see that the, the averaging or the unsimiling approaches uh, can select more features. Here in the real data sets, although we don't have ground truth features to compare uh, the, the validity of those features, but since we are doing this feature selection using a knockoff framework by controlling the false discovery rate, here the higher number of features represents more power in feature selection. And in the right over here, we present the cross validation loss uh, and the corresponding selected features for each training epoch for proteomics data set. And here we see that although the validation loss or the decrease, uh, the decrement in the validation loss was quite smooth, but the, the, the number of selected features in each of those epochs where they, they, there seems to be quite uh, variations. And um, as we can see through our proposed framework, we can reduce uh, such variability. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we demonstrate uh, the instability issues in interpretation of deep neural network and their effect on feature selection. And uh, to, to, rem to remedy that, we proposed an ensemble of feature importance using numerous good models in the training path of deep neural network, uh, which shows that we can improve feature selections, stability and power. And in future, we want to extend the framework to other biological data sets and most importantly, to different deep learning architectures. Uh, so with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you all for your attention. So you can find the preprint of the paper if you follow this QR code. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Great, thanks Prasna. Um, are there any questions for Prasna? The first question up. So uh, one anonymous attendee asked, how are the feature importances aggregated to a final consensus? And how are the final set of features defined? Um, so, so we aggregate the, uh, uh, the feature importance, or let's say if we had those M models, 
in order to get one feature importance score from those M models, we simply uh, aggregate them by assigning a same or equal weights to all of them. Uh, I, I hope that was the answer to the first question. Uh, and for the second part, how is then the final selected set of features defined? Um, so uh, we we considered uh, from feature importance score to the feature selection, we use a knockoff framework. Uh, and since our uh, data set are from uh, tabular, we can use that. But in the in the first analysis where we consider the benchmark data sets like MNIST or CIFAR, uh, we, we are not able to uh, do the feature selection. But in the later part of the experiments with the simulation and real data set, since we have a structured data set, we can do a feature selection. Okay, great. Any other questions? Uh, Sarah. Thanks for the presentation. I was wondering what's the overlap between um, the features that are selected by the best model and your averaging ap approach, I guess, and in, in your real life examples. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, uh, yes, there were definitely uh, overlap. Um, the, but as I said, the main issue that we found was the the best model itself depends so much on the stochasticity of the neural network when we train a same network with same data set multiple times the best model themselves would have a different reasons of feature being selected and with the unsampling we see that unsampling helps us try to take a bit of all those uh, features that were selected in different uh, different part of a or different training setup Uh, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay, yeah. okay great. If there is any other questions, feel free to uh, just send them to the Q&A uh, of Zoom. Otherwise, uh, let's thank Prasnagin and uh, let's move on. Um, so next thank up you. is Pierre, uh, who will be presenting on uh, a talk on deep generative modeling for uh, quantifying heterogeneity in single cell omics. Yes, um, actually, I'm here with... Uh... Justin, uh, we're co-authors, and so yeah, we're really happy to be here today. Um, so we're going to talk here about uh, multi-resolution variational inference, or Mr. VI in short, um, that we designed with Adam, and whose purpose is, yes, to um, to assess how sample variability affects gene expression in single cell RNA. And so the, uh, where is the, yeah, the starting point for, for our work was to, um, to realize that single cell uh, change in scale due to two changes. Uh, the first one is like in improvements in the sequencing technologies that allow to minimize the amount of uh, nuisance um, uh, noise that we're going to observe in multi-sample RNA experiments. And the second one is an upscale in, um, in assays, you know, where people are um, gathering hundreds or thousands of uh, samples. And the question now becomes, how do we assess um, how like the variability among those samples is going to translate into meaningful differences in, in gene expression. And so for this purpose, uh, what people have been doing is to look for compositional differences, uh, meaning that after clustering, you're looking for um, differences in, uh, in cluster proportions in every samples and using this as a way to assess how similar your samples are. Um, in the case where you're looking for a, a disease, for instance, you can focus this analysis on a on the comparison of specific uh, groups of, of donors uh, that are your samples and, and figure out like if they are the similar or not and also look for differential expression changes. Um, and so what Mr. VI uh, tries to do is for any given uh, group of cells that we assume is uh, forming like a cell type, um, we want to infer all um, these samples um, are going to to stratify, like uh, what are going to be like the similarities between one another. So the output of uh, this algorithm is a matrix which rows and columns are samples and which tells you to what extent like uh, these samples are similar or not. And so we are arguing that this representation can be can be interesting for a variety of application in this. Uh, large sample regime because it can first be used to look for, um, for um, donor stratification. So you take one cell type and you ask this matrix using clustering uh, what's the stratification of sample is going to be. 
Um, and you can get insight on that. And you can also look across different cell types in your data and look if there is like a systematic uh, stratification pattern that can be interesting to look for. Um, it's also useful if you have like a specific uh, covariate, sample covariate in mind. So case of control uh, where samples are patient, for instance, because in that case, you can, um, you can look for, um, you know, like the distance between samples from the same condition and try to contrast it, contrast it with the distance across condition and see if there is like a, a pattern in which like those uh, samples are, are going to be closer to one another. So um, while this is our goal, like there were like several issues uh, that we faced when we were building Mr. VA. Uh, the first one being that obviously like we do not get out of the samples at once, but they are confounded with, uh, with technical noise uh, that come from the fact that uh, the samples are sequenced at different times uh, across several sites. And if we want to compare them uh, in one go, we need to remove this, uh, this, this noise first. The second one is that we know that the samples are probably going to affect the cell population heterogeneously. Uh, and so we need a model that is going to be able to account for this and capture like heterogeneous uh, cell type responses. And last, um, we, as we said, like uh, there are a lot of analyses where we don't know which groups of samples we want to compare. And so we need, a, we need an approach that's going to be able to, to you know, look for both um, uh, exploratory analysis and um, you know, guided analysis uh, without, uh, like without making compromises. Um, so to answer the first issue, you know, the fact that there is confounding and we need to remove it, we're using latent viable models. Um, and so in particular, like a lot of work before, we assume that every cell has some low dimensional representation Z that is going to capture in our case, the overall cell states uh, of the cell uh, infused by, uh, by samples. But importantly, that's gonna be like independent from, from the technical noise, technical factors like sites. But we're going to try to disentangle this representation a bit more by having like a new layer and uh, explicitly try to capture how samples are affecting the cell states uh, versus what comes from the cell type. And so um, this is the overall like uh, graphical models of uh, Mr. VA. Uh, and so we train it using a variational bias, which means that it's gonna scale pretty well to very large data sets um, and, and, and gonna be pretty fast. So um, next, this cell state latent variable Z uh, is, you know, when we train it, we use uh, this latent hue that is cell type as well as sample IDs. But um, what we can do is uh, like, uh, you know, SCGen is doing, for instance, try to infer what would have been the state of this specific cell uh, if it came from a different sample, not S, but S prime. And this allows us to, in a way, get counterfactual uh, cell states for all of the cells in our data. And we can then use that to go back to our problem on, of inferring like, you know, distance matrices uh, by doing the following thing. You take a cluster of cells that is going to characterize a cell type. You compute for every cell, um, all of the counterfactual cell states that represent like the counterfactual cell states uh, of the cell in a different sample. And you're going to compute um, distance matrices uh, for these cells and aggregate them to get like an overall matrix. And we're then going to use this matrix uh, as a way to, to do like all of the application we talked about. So first of all, like uh, exploratory analysis, when we're going to try to cluster the samples for a given cell type. And analysis where we're going to try to see if like um, um, the a specific um, sample covariate is going to be like seeable from the distance matrix. And I'm not going to let Justin talk about like the evaluation we made for Mr. Vieng. Thanks, Pierre. Uh, I'm Justin, and I'll be talking about how we validated Mr. VA on different data sets to see if it matched our expectations. So first, I want to talk about the semi-synthetic data set that we uh, ran Mr. VA on, and this was taking a real single-cell RNA-seq data set of 12,000 human PBMCs. And then for two different clusters, cluster A and B, so uh, visualizing the graphic on the top left, um, we created in silico gene perturbations. So this is just took the form of selecting random groups of genes and then doubling the gene counts um, in such a way that we have this hierarchical sample structure that we knew ground truth uh, before running the model. So in cluster A and B, we have two different sample structures that we're trying to retrieve just by running uh, Mr. VI without any knowledge about the samples underlying this. So here we have some heat maps of the distance matrices that we get back from the methods. Uh, on the top left, we have the ground truth distance matrix that we're trying to predict. 
And on the bottom, we have two different baselines that we constructed. They're called composition SCVI and composition PCA. And these are just methods that we created that seemed uh, analogous to what studies have been doing in the past. So these basically take two different embeddings, SCVI and PCA, and they compute the distance as a function of compositional sample di differences that we find in subclusters of the data. And we can see that visually, Mr. VI does a better job of uh, reconstructing this distance matrix, albeit a little bit noisy. In this case, uh, the baselines do far worse in terms of trying to capture any structure between the samples that we find in this data set. And more quantitatively, we also compute Robinson Fold's distance metric, uh, the Robinson Fold's distance metric between the trees that we find from hierarchical clustering. And basically this tells you how close two different trees are in their structure, uh, where zero is gonna be where the trees are exactly the same, and one is gonna be where they're completely different. So we can see that Mr. VI does better in both of the clusters uh, than the baselines that we have. And this is pretty impressive just because the cluster A and B have completely different sample structures that we saw before. And Mr. VI is able to predict both of them uh, with better accuracy uh, at the same time when running this model on the data set. Next, I wanna talk about the real data set that we ran Mr. VI on. Uh, this one had 60,000 cells from four different healthy livers. And each of these livers was sequenced with both single nuclei RNA-seq and also single cell RNA-seq. So this was a great data set for us to try Mr. VI on, Mr. VI on because we had this kind of uh, actual ground truth that we could kind of uh, align our expectations with, where we expect samples that came from the same biological donor to look more similar than two different donors that were sampled with the same technology. So essentially we constructed a sample um, categorical covariate as a combination of donor and technology. And we only gave this to Mr. VI and hoping that Mr. VI would be able to retrieve the expected stratification, which in this case is um, saying that the distance between two samples from the same donor are gonna be closer than to the rest. In addition to this, we had added an extra control where we just took one sample and uniformly split it at random into two. And in this case, we expect them to have really very low distance because they're effectively this, the same sample. So looking at the heat maps of the distance mat uh, matrices again, uh, in this case, we don't have a ground truth uh, distance matrix because it's just a real data set and we don't actually know what the distances, relative distances should be. Uh, but in this case, we do have some red outlines over elements that we expect to be very low distance because they came from the same biological donor. And in this case, you can see the baselines don't do a very good job of capturing a low distance between two samples that came from the same donor but different technology, whereas Mr. VI is able to do this very well. And we also portray the U latent representation space uh, in a U map on the right-hand side. And in this case, instead of looking at the distance matrices, we also just want to understand how well is the data being integrated in our model. So we expect this U latent space to be well mixed for both the technological factors as well as the biological sample uh, specific factors. So you can see on the left, we color by biological donor and it's relatively well mixed. Whereas on the right U map, we color by cell type, and this is still pretty well separated, and the cell types are relatively continuous in space. So this is a good sign because while we remove the sample specific effects, we still expect you to retain some shared biological factors, which um, will often, oftentimes present itself in cell types. And lastly, we have a table that compares the silhouette scores between Mr. VI and SCVI. Um, and in this case, higher is going to be better for all of them, where we look at the covariates of technology, sample, and cell type and see how well they mix in the latent space. And we can see that Mr. VI does slightly better in all three of these categories. And this made us really excited because this is another like avenue of interest where um, instead of just looking at Mr. VI for the sample sample distances, we can also think of Mr. VI as a potential better alternative as just an integration tool. Um, in addition to this, we're also looking at how to deal with out of distribution samples. So if a sample doesn't contain a given cell type or a cell state, then how do we deal with that situation in terms of telling the user uh, what the model is learning about the situation? Um, perhaps uh, some measure of uncertainty is what we're trying to provide. And lastly, another future direction that we're looking at right now is how to group cells by distance matrices. So instead of relying on the aggregation of cells from a given cell type that we got from some prior annotation, we can also think about um, 
just looking at distance matrices in a more data-driven manner, how do we group the cells and then look at the different groups of cells in that uh, way instead? And lastly, I just want to mention that all this code is accessible via GitHub and also PyPy. So you should be able to pip install Mr. VI and use it for yourself um, as soon as possible. And this is all implemented using the SCVI tools framework, which made it really easy to develop this uh, method very quickly and iterate on it. And hopefully it would become useful for other people who want to extend this for their own use. And we encourage any, anyone to use this for their own data cases where uh, it makes sense and you have this large data set with sample specific effects. And if you have any issues, please reach out to us on the SEverse discourse, or you can just tag any of the three of us, Pierre, Justin, or Adam, and we'll be happy to try to help. And this concludes our talk. I just want to acknowledge uh, all the people who helped support this project. So Nir Yostev, Elham Azizi, and Michael Jordan helped guide and support the three of us on this project. And also that's to the Yosef Lab and Azizi Lab for um, their great discussions about Mr. VI and generally creating a great environment for us to conduct this research. And thanks for listening. Great, thanks to Pierre and Justin for the great talk. Um, are there any questions? We have five minutes, so plenty of time for questions. So while we're waiting for uh, people to chime in here, uh, I had a quick question for you actually. So do you, so I guess, do you guys have a mechanism through which you can actually determine what's contributing to these samples, these sample wise distance matrices? Like, can you actually tell whether it's average changes in expression or changes in co, like co-expression of genes that's driving the sample distance matrices there? Yeah, so we didn't talk about it, but like it's um, a key part of uh, like of the issue we had when we made this. You know, like how do you make these distances interpretable somehow? And so, um, what those distances are, are, are trying to capture are like overall uh, gene expression changes. And to do that, we had to rely on uh, linear decoders. Um, but that's true that you know, like they're still like pretty unintuitive, and so we haven't. Um, Build in, build this in in the software, but we we want to you know return like a list of uh, top uh, differentially expressed genes uh, that may drive like the distance you observe as a like a, a way to improve like the interpretability of the overall uh, framework. Yeah, right. Thank you. For question. Uh, David. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, very interesting work. Um, I wanted to ask about. So it sounds like you're usually doing this, uh, focusing on one cell type at a time and i was curious what the trade-off is there like how do you decide the right granularity and you know what would you need to do if you want to well, the pros and cons of doing that i guess basically yeah so that's a good question um i think kind of there's a there's, there's definitely a trade-off like you mentioned uh, at the single cell state level you kind of get a level of granularity that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise, and you kind of don't lose any information, um, assuming that the model has been fit correctly. Of course, there's an issue here where if you're at the single cell state level, then you also might be inferring some like noise that you get from samples that you don't have anything as a reference nearby. So if you think right. within the sample, if there's like nothing nearby from a given sample, kind of like referring to the out of distribution problem that I was referring to, um, then you might just be outputting garbage in that case. And we're trying to figure out how to deal with that case, um, either just by throwing out those samples from the analysis or by providing some level of uncertainty in those situations. Of course, if you aggregate over a bunch of cells, then you kind of gain more confidence in the average uh, kind of measure of distance that you get between samples. However, in the most extreme case, uh, like we were seeing before with samples where you just look at cell type proportions, you can think of that as a, the most like aggregate uh, analysis that you mm. can analysis you then you lose kind of like a lot of information that you get from the single cell data. Right, that makes sense. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, thanks to Pierre and Justin again. Uh, so, much, yeah. so next up we have Ethan, who's going to talk about disentangling shared and group specific variation uh, using multi-group VI. Can everyone see my slides? Yeah, that's good. Sweet, okay. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Ethan Weinberger. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington. 
Uh, and today I'll be presenting a project done during the internship this past summer at a V Forgives lab at Genentech, uh, where I was also fortunate to work with Roman Lopez and Jan Christian Hooter. And so yeah, the title of our project is Disentangling the Shared and Group Specific Variations in Single Cell Transcriptomics Data with Multigroup VM. So often to investigate uh, various biological hypotheses, uh, people will simultaneously collect single cell data sets from multiple like, groups in some abstract sense, where here groups could represent different tissues or different species or different cell lines to a few possible kind of grouping examples. And so when we collect data from all these different groups, we often do so with the goals of understanding both like what are the patterns that are shared across groups? And then also, what are the patterns that might be specific to individual groups and not shared? And so if that sounds a little abstract, um, here are just a couple of concrete examples of this kind of multi-group analysis, including this one recent nature paper from 2018, in which the authors studied innate immune cells, responses to various stimuli in different species. And so here, species is the grouping, and the authors wanted to understand what responses were kind of cross species, shared across all the species, versus which were just specific to an individual species. And similarly, there's another recent example from Nature Genetics, in which the authors profiled a bunch of different cancer cell lines. And here their goal was to understand what kind of recurring gene programs were shared across a bunch of these cell lines and represented kind of pan cancer variations. Now, unfortunately, kind of despite the many contexts in which we might want to do this kind of multi-group analysis and kind of deconvolve these shared versus group specific variations, there haven't been too many methods that have been developed to tackle this problem. And so as a result, oftentimes the workflows, these kinds of analyses tend to be uh, kind of ad hoc, and they often involve a lot of manual steps, making these analyses kind of tedious. So for example, in the Nature Genetics cancer paper that I just referenced a couple slides ago, the authors ran non-negative matrix factorization and separately on each individual cell line. And then once they had their learned factors, they inspected the factors and tried to find ones which had shared green, had shared genes across a bunch of different cell lines to figure out these pan-cancer gene programs. So the goal of this project, the goal of our work here, was to take a first step at trying to develop maybe a more principled method for deconvolving these different like shared versus group specific sources of variation in single cell RNA-seq data sets, and hopefully end up with some method that could be reused across a bunch of projects as opposed to each project developing their own workflow. So now before introducing the specific details of our method, I'll formalize our problem here a little bit more. So we're going to assume that we have some set of cells with observed gene expression profiles here, where each cell is assigned to some group gamma. And moreover, we're going to assume that each observed expression profile is generated from two sets of latent variables, where the first set of latent variables Z here represent variations that are shared across all of the groups of data, while the second set, T gamma, represent variations that are specific to this group gamma. And so our goal then is given some observed expression profiles from some cells from the group gamma, we then go back and recover the shared latent factor Z, as well as the group specific latent factors T sub gamma. So there has been some work addressing this problem with a couple methods that have been developed, well, they tend to make pretty strong assumptions in the data generating process. So for example, a couple of initial works have proposed models that take this form here, where they assume that expression profiles can be modeled as the sum of linear transformations of the different sets of latent variables. And another more recent work relaxed this assumption a little bit and allows for still a simple summation, but instead of linear transformations, we now have arbitrary potentially non-linear functions. Although still, despite this being a little more flexible, it still might not be able to capture all the complexities of single cell RNA-seq data. 
And so in this work, we decided to take a more flexible, fully deep generative modeling based approach to our problem. And we developed this new model here that we call multi group VI. And so for simplicity in this concept figure I've got here, we're looking at the specific case of two groups. So the model can pretty easily be extended to some arbitrary number of groups. And so here for this case, we've got three different sets of latent variables. Where here at the top, we've got our shared latent variables that are common to all of the groups or the Z's from before, as well as then two sets of groups specific latent variables. And so following the variational autoencoder framework, the parameters of the posterior distributions for each set of latent variables can be obtained as the output of a corresponding encoder neural network. And then the our generative model that takes latent variable values and outputs gene expression profiles is realized as a single shared neural network that takes in a concatenation of the different sets of latent variables and then maps back to the full gene expression space. And so now uh, to ensure that each set of latent variables actually like captures their corresponding variations of interest. So for example, the shared latent variables actually capturing variations that are shared across all the groups, we used a few tricks. So first, for the shared latent variables, we used parameter sharing in the form of this single shared encoder network that samples from other groups used, which by sharing parameters, we're trying to encourage these latent variables to capture patterns that indeed are shared across all of the groups. And then for the group-specific latent variables, we had only samples from that specific group get passed through the, through the encoder and allowed to vary in the latent space, whereas samples from non-corresponding groups were just hard-coded at zero here. So by doing so, that encourages this latent space really to capture patterns that are present in the corresponding group and not variations that are found in other groups. And beyond this, uh, hard coding at zero, we also found that adding an additional regularization penalty that we talk about in the paper, that like if you were to encode samples from the wrong group into these private latent spaces, we actually beyond hard coding this to zero, uh, we add a penalty that encourages these kind of wrong encodings to be close to all zero vectors. So then all of our networks are jointly trained by maximizing variational lower bound using a count-based loss function similar to that of the SCVM. So to initially validate uh, multi-group BI, we use the splatter framework to generate a data set with some known ground truths. So in this data set, we have five simulated cell types. And each cell within this simulation was assigned to one of two groups. And then each group could cells from each group could express one of two group specific gene programs. And so here in our simulation for our grand truths, our shared variations are those that distinguish the different cell types, while the group specific variations are those that are related to these group specific gene programs. And so we would expect if our model is working correctly, that it would capture these cell type distinguishing variations in its shared latent space with good mixing across the two groups. And in fact, that is exactly what we see with clear separations of the different cell types in our shared latent space and very nice mixing across the groups in the group-specific gene programs. Then similarly in the group-specific latent spaces, we would expect mixing across the shared cell type variations with separation of the group-specific gene programs, and that is Fortunately, what we do see, we've got great mixing across the cell types here, but a nice clean separation of the two group specific gene programs for the group one specific latent space. And then similarly, for the group two specific latent space, we see similar phenomena. And so beyond these uh, qualitative UMAP plots, we also quantitatively benchmarked our approach against some of the previously proposed models I mentioned earlier in the presentation. And so we found that multi-group VI, or here abbreviated MGVI, achieved good separation of cell types, and here higher is better, as well as good mixing across the groups, and here lower is better, compared to baseline models. Well, the baselines do achieve 
decent performance in terms of their shared latent space metrics. Although where we really shined is in the group specific latent spaces, we found that multi-group BI achieved much, much better separation of the group specific gene programs compared to the less flexible baseline methods. And so while this was great to see that we did well in these metrics, unfortunately, our performance here does come at the cost of interpretability. And so to actually get new biological insights from multi-group BI, we needed to develop some additional tools. So in this work, we specifically considered the task of identifying genes for largest group-specific effects. Or in other words, we wanted to identify the genes with variations that are captured by these group-specific T sub gamma variables, as opposed to just the shared Z variables. And so to do this, we developed a procedure using kind of high-level intuitive idea, which was which genes are kind of reconstructed more faithfully if you were to decode using all of the latent variables, so both shared and group specific, as opposed to only using the shared variables and zeroing out the group specific variables. So if you have some genes that are much more accurately reconstructed when you include these group specific variables, they probably have some pretty strong kind of group specific effects. So we can formalize this a bit using the language of Bayes factors where for a given gene and cells from a group gamma, we can compute a likelihood ratio between uh, the likelihoods of decoding with all of the variables versus only the shared variables. And with our simulated data set, we actually had uh, ground truth labels indicating which genes had these group specific effects versus just shared variations. So we were able to evaluate how well this procedure did at capturing the kind of ground truth genes with strong group specific effects. And so we found uh, our method was in blue here compared to some baseline methods. The genes returned by our model uh, agreed much more strongly with ground truth labels than those returned by some baseline interpretable methods. Then after evaluating the model on this simulated data set, we then applied it to a real world data set consists of epithelial cells collected from different regions of the mouse cell intestine. And so our goal here in our analysis was after disentangling the shared versus region specific effects, could we identify some region specific trends in the data where maybe some genes have very strong region specific effects. And so before embedding our data, we just made a couple of UMAP plots here and we can see that we both have a pretty strong separation by cell type as well as also by region. And so if we then train multi-group BI using the region labels as our group variables, and we inspect its shared latent space, we find a similar kind of good separation by cell type, but we see much stronger mixing across regions, indicating that the model is capturing the pan-region variations here. Now, on the other hand, if we look at the region-specific latent spaces, we, for the most part, see mixing across cell types, but we also see some notable exceptions. So for example, in the ileum regions, latent space, we see a pretty strong separation of the enterocytes from other cell types, indicating that there might be some ileum-specific expression patterns in enterocytes that aren't found in other regions. And so we investigated this using our interpretability procedure, and we found that when we looked at the normalized expression values returned by our model's decoder, when using all of the latent variables versus just the shared variables, our top genes indeed exhibited pretty different expression patterns depending on which variables you used for decoding. And so interestingly, on the other hand, for enterocytes from the other regions, we don't see these same differences, indicating that the patterns that we saw just on the previous slide were indeed specific to ileum enterocytes and are not shared across the regions. So in summary, uh, in this work, we developed a deep generative model named multi-group BI for isolating shared versus group-specific variations in these grouped single-cell RNA-seq datasets. We found that it outperformed less expressive previously proposed baseline models on a simulated task. And we developed an initial basic kind of interpretability procedure for understanding some group specific variations that are captured by the model. And for future work, uh, we want to focus 
more on the interpretability of the learned latent variables. There have been some very cool recent developments in the VA literature that allow you to more explicitly tie specific latent variables to different groups or clusters of features, which beyond just identifying kind of single genes as we did in this work, would allow for the discovery of different gene programs that are either shared across groups or potentially specific to individual groups. So now quickly before taking questions, I just want to thank the people that made this project possible. So thank you to Abid Regev for hosting me this summer, as well as to Roman Lopez and now Christian Hooter who are also supervising me and providing a lot of wonderful feedback and ideas from this project. And so our code, our models are available at this GitHub link over here. So feel free to try multi-group VI to analyze your grouped single cell data and let us know what you find. Thank you. Thanks for the talk, Ethan. Um, so to get us started, uh, Salil was asking, did you consider using a more general combinatorial decomposition? So for example, including variables uh, corresponding to sharing between pairs of groups uh, instead of only shared by all groups or only present for one group. Um, and could perhaps the right sharing structure be learned by adding more terms one at a time using the uh, base factors approach? So in this specific work, we did not consider that. Although we do have that in mind for future work, either for, I think it'd be relatively straightforward to add kind of pairwise like shared latent spaces. Um, and then we have some initial thoughts on how you might kind of learn group assignments, let's say, different latent spaces, but nothing too concrete yet. Great. Any other questions? We still have another five minutes. Don't be shy. So I had a question as well, actually. So is there a scenario in which you think that the shared encoder would actually not capture shared programs, but just still specific to one group? So for example, like suppose that you, you know, you're training this model on with like say two cell types and one is kind of much easier, to, like much easier to learn. And the other one is kind of just a lot of random noise. Like, do you think the model would tend to just take both the shared encoder and the, you know, group specific encoder and just kind of use them both to model one cell type rather than everything in the data? So I guess like, um, let me go back to the simulated data set. Um, so when we initially designed this simulation, we wanted specifically like, it's kind of hard to interpret these map points too carefully, but we tried to make sure that the variations across cell types, like the shared variations, were greater than the more like subtle group specific variations. It's the reason we did this is we found especially with the baseline models that you often got like variations that distinguished cell types would kind of leak into the private spaces just because that helps you reconstruct the data better. Um, and like we also found that initially with multi-group BI, we found a similar issue. And so that was why we had to introduce some of the additional kind of regularization tricks that I talked about previously. Um, Although interestingly, so we tried both using the regularizations with multi-group BI and then also like with the linear models. And it didn't seem to help too much actually with the linear models. It seemed like we needed the additional flexibility of the neural networks to really get the benefits of that regularization. I see. Um, another question. So can we use this model for gene imputation and also to find information about cell-cell relationships? I think for gene imputation, so our model is an extension of the SCBI model, which I believe in their original work was validated as working quite well for gene imputation. So since we're just building on top of that, it should work. So what was the second part of the question? Uh, they're wondering, the person was wondering if it could also be used to find information about cell-cell relationships. I'm not quite sure what they're referring to. Uh, I suppose, so if there are like some strong region specific effects that maybe obscure that cells are part of the same cell type, maybe like the shared latent space would help kind of clarify that since cells from the same cell type would probably tend to be on top of each other there. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure if there's a more specific question. Not sure. Uh, David? Yeah, uh, great talk. Um, so I was, Curious with the how you're setting up the model and having the one shared 
decoder. So is that, I think actually it might, maybe it's equivalent to having, because of this like setting to zero uh, that you do for the, in, for, you know, for the output of the encoder that is not the sort of the correct encoder for the current data that you're looking at. So mm -hmm. the, presumably you could write this alternatively as there being, no, I guess not because it's not linear. I was going to say you could write it, the, the, the decoder as there being a decoder component coming from the shared and from the group specific. But mm. the point here is you want to have a full neural network. So you need, so you can model interactions between the two. So you, yeah, exactly. you can't write it as separate decoders. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's interesting. And, um, yeah, and the, the other the other one question I had about the setup here was, I think this is obvious, but you're not constraining the output. It's the output is set to be zero when it's the wrong encoder, but it's not like you train for the group specific encoder to output zero when it's on the wrong group. That's not like you don't like back propagate from that. So we do. Sorry if this wasn't clear in the original talk. So we do have a penalty term where, for example, if you got this group one specific encoder here, so we both are manually setting the group one specific variables for the blue group two cells to be zero. But then we also are embedding them here and encouraging those values to be close to zero using a penalty that we talk about in the full paper. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. In the interest of time, we'll uh, move on. But Ethan, there's a question in the Q&A about uh, GitHub, if you could just kind of answer that separately. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, everyone. Great, thanks again, Ethan. Uh, next up, we have Hong Shi, uh, who will talk about multimodal single cell data integration using graph representation learning. Uh, yeah. Take it away, Hong Shi. Thanks. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, are you able to see my screen now? Yeah, that's good. Okay, thanks. thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Hong Zhiwen from Michigan State University. I'm a PhD student advised by Professor Jidang uh, Tang. Today, I'm going to present our work, Advancing Single Cell Multiomics Data Integration with Graph Representation Learning. Um, so this is the outline of my today's presentation. So I'm, I'm gonna starting from providing some background of single cell multi-omics data integration uh, to illustrate what, the, what is the problem that we want to solve. And I will um, illustrate why we need graph representation learning in single cell analysis. And now I'm gonna introduce my, uh, our model, which is called SEMOGNN, is a graph-based model. And uh, lastly, I would also like to introduce our dance package where we integrated our method into this package and we want to provide a benchmarking and deep learning tools for single cell community. Okay, um, so I'm gonna start with uh, introducing the background of uh, the multi-omics integration. So the multi-modality in the single cell analysis um, typically refers to the multi-omics data. For example, the RNA seq, uh, attack seq, or uh, the protein ab abundance. Um, so we, we actually have different practices of integration. For example, if we have several unimodal data sets, like we have some SC RNA seq data, we have some SC attack seq data, and we try to integrate them to make a multimodal data set. This could be called multimodal integration, but it's more like an alignment where we try to identify the correspondence or similarity between the cells from different modality space. And what if we have already have uh, aligned multimodal data sets? For example, if we use site-seq techniques, we can measure the RNA-seq and protein in the same cell so that the data is already aligned. So we don't need to do the alignment, but we might still need to do the integration because in the downstream analysis, we don't want the features from more than one modality. We just want a unified embedding for the cells. So in this way, we want a low dimensional a representation for each cell uh, to be directly used in downstream analysis, 
and this representation should encode the information from more than one modality. And this is more like an embedded learning. Um, so given that the cutting edge techniques like SiteSeq, the 10x module only can mirror more than one modality in the same cell. So we actually can use this kind of aligned data sets or multimodal data sets as a benchmarking data set for multimodal data integration, no matter we are doing um, integration to a single modality data set or multimodal data set, we can use this kind of multimodal data set um, to benchmark our integration methods. So there are several tasks, benchmarking tasks are designed for uh, this kind of integration. For example, the modality prediction, where we're given one modality and to predict the other modality and modality matching, which is uh, just the alignment we, we, we mentioned. So we're given two modalities and we try to identify which cells uh, from two data sets are actually the same cells or uh, same, very similar cells. And in these two tasks, if we are using the multimodal data sets, it means that we, we already have the ground truth so that we can evaluate, evaluate our methods. And for the third benchmarking task, the joint embedding, there is no ground truth. So it's a little bit harder to evaluate the, the method. Uh, so the, the uh, goal in joint embedding is to find a low dimensional representation for each cell so that it can preserve the complex biology for the downstream analysis and it can also remove the batch effect. So in this case, we need to use some um, comprehensive metric, more than one metric to, to evaluate our method. We consider that these three tasks are all very important for uh, a integration model. And we target as at these three, me, uh, three tasks in our method. And we use these three tasks to demonstrate the power of our method, graphic me method. These uh, three benchmarking tasks are actually proposed in a single, uh, single cell multi model integration NIPS computation last year. And we won the first prize in the modality prediction task. And after the computation, we continue to work on this and now, they, uh, now our model can outperform us, uh, all the other models on the previous leaderboard. Okay, so this is the background for the data integration. And now I'm gonna introduce why we need graph representation learning in this kind of tasks. So graph is actually very ubiquitous in single cell analysis. For example, we can have cell-cell graph by constructing the k-nearest neighbor graph to add some regularization for the method or to capture some structural information. And uh, we can also use gene-gene graph to represent some gene regulations or gene networks. We can also construct the spatial graph based on the spatial location of each cell to exploit the spatial um, transcriptomics data. And we also can uh, construct the cell gene graph, which we will propose it in our method. So I will talk about it later. So given that there are so many graph knowledge, uh, so many domain knowledge that can be represented by graphs in single cell analysis. So it's very natural to create a unified graph framework for single cell analysis. So this is our big plan. So as we demonstrated in, in this figure, we can have cell nodes and the, the feature nodes, for example, the gene nodes for rna seq the peak nodes for ATAC-seq, and we can transform the observation into the edges between the cell node and the feature node. And of course, we also have some other relations between the features. For example, for example we can have cross modality uh, relations. For example, if we know some peaks uh, corresponding or related to some certain genes, then we can connect them in a graph. And, um, and we can also have intro modality relations, for example, the gene regulations, and we can directly incorporate them into our graph. So this is, a, this is our big plan, but it's uh, still work in progress. Uh, but but uh, we already implemented a simplified version of this framework. That's what, we, what I'm gonna present it in this talk, uh, which is our method SEMO GNN. So in addition to the, the benefit that we can incorporate the domain knowledge and different types of knowledge into the graph, we, we actually have some more benefits from this kind of 
graph-based method. For example, if we construct a cell gene graph, we can target some challenges in multimodal integration. For example, some um, modality are very sparse and high dimensional. For example, ataxic data could have very large dimensions. And the sample size of the data set, especially of the multimodal data set, could be very limited. And it could, there could be a lot of noise in the data. That's why we want to construct the graph and use some graph-based methods, for example, the graph neural networks to exploit the higher order structural information and to introduce additional denoising effect to target those challenges. So if we construct a cell gene graph, then uh, the cells that connected to the same marker genes would be close in the graph because they are second order neighbors. And by stacking the graph neural networks layer, we are not only capture the first order or second order structure, we can, we can even capture the higher order structure similarity to identify the similar genes or similar cells. And also, as we mentioned in the beginning, we can incorporate the domain knowledge naturally into our graph-based method. For example, what we currently use is the hallmark gene sets from the molecular signatures database. And this kind of, this data sets um, provided several pathways and this pathway are, uh, each pathway is a, a group of genes that affect each other. So we know that there's relations between them. Uh, however, if we directly connected all these genes from the same group, from the same pathway, it would be very dense. And there, the, all the connections would be considered as the same. That's why we calculate the cosine similarity between genes and use the cosine similarity to filter, to filter the connections between those genes. And uh, eventually we plug in this kind of changing relations into our graph. So as a summary, this is how we construct the graph. Uh, first, we take the observation matrix, put it into our adjacency matrix to become a bipartite graph. And we also plug in the, um, the, the it has components, which is the relations between genes and genes or features and features, which, which is obtained uh, from both the observations and the domain knowledge, and, and we put it in also into the, our graphs. And uh, so this is the first design in our model, which is uh, the enhanced components. And the second design is the batch features, which is to overcome a very big problem, batch effect uh, in the integration task. So batch effect, as we know, is that due to differences in equipment, cell donors, tissue types, the data distrib distribution in different batches could be very different. That's why we use utilize a uh, simple yet efficient design, which is the batch features, to let our models aware of be aware of this kind of batch effect. So we first calculate the cell level features by some um, statistical aggregation method, like the, the mean variance sparsity. And we aggregate all the cell level features um, within all the cells within the same batch to, to become a batch level features. And this kind of batch level features or batch features will be used as the in initialization of all the cell nodes. So after we constructed the graph, we calculated the batch features, and then we're stacking the heterogeneous graph convolutional layers. So the heterogeneous graph convolutional layers means that for each type of edges, so in this graph, there are different type of edges. So for each type of edges, we use a separate parameter in the aggregation um, so that different, uh, different node type, different edge type could have different information distribution or interaction. And after stacking the convolutional layers, we take the cell embeddings and we add a task specific head for the downstream task. For example, if we are doing the modality prediction task, we simply add an MLP readout layer to do the prediction. So in this way, our method uh, achieve a very good performance in the, in the last year competition. And um, for other tasks, for example, the matching task, we don't need to modify the overall structure. We just need to replace the task specific head with a similarity kernel, for example, the uh, cosine similarity. 
So we calculate the cosine similarity between the re cell representation from different modalities. And uh, we can do the matching in this way. We, and um, our model consistently outperforms the other models from the leaderboard. Uh, and for the joint embedding, we simply add some reconstruction loss and uh, some auxiliary loss. And we uh, use the cell representation as our embedding. So as a conclusion, I think I believe our framework consistently outperforms other methods in all three tasks. And our method is an official winner of last year's newer IPS competition. And this year there's a new cargo competition, which is also multi-model integration, which is a modality prediction task. And our single model ranked top 2% two, two uh, in the leaderboard. Um, uh, so uh, uh, unfortunately we didn't get the first, uh, we were not ranked top three because the top three teams are, or use very heavy ensemble models without the domain knowledge here, I'm sorry, without domain knowledge. Uh, but so, so we can still improve our models, we believe. Uh, but oh, I think it already shows the power of our model. Okay, furthermore, we release our models along with a dense packet. So this is the last part of my, of my presentation which is the introduction to our dance package. So dance package, uh, in dance package, we try to target some specific issues. For example, the reproducibility issues of computational methods in single cell analysis. Because we find that many uh, computational methods, their codes have some issues or they're they uh, very hard to reproduce their results. And, and also there is lack of deep learning tools for single cell community. So that's why we provide this dense package uh, as a bench, benchmark platform for single cell analysis and as a deep learning tools or framework for uh, method development in single cell analysis. This is the overall structure of our dense package. So we collect uh, many different tasks in three model, modules, single modality, multi-modality and spatial transcriptomics and we provide different preprocessing and graph construction methods and we unified all the methods into Python implementation. So if some, some methods are originally implemented in our language, we will re-implement it in Python. So currently we have 30, more than 32 models in this package. And we also uh, unified the, the IO, the API, so that we can easily do the benchmarking. Uh, so this is a demo for our current uh, dance package. So if uh, you're interested in this, uh, you can you can scan this QR code or uh, you know scan our uh, browse over GitHub. Uh, I hope this kind of effort could uh, contribute to our single cell deep learning community. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Great, thanks for the talk, Hongju. Um, let's take some questions. So uh, Tian Yu is asking. Uh, they wonder if for the design of dance, did you try different graph convolution networks to find the best option? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good question. So so basically uh, in our official release, we are currently using SageCom. Uh, what we tried is graph convolution, which is, uh, we tried GCA and SageCom, but we, we didn't explore too much, but yeah, this is a good direction to explore in the future. Okay, uh, James. Great talk. It's really nice to use a unified graph, graph representation for all these different modalities. So I'm curious if you have some ablation studies to look at for which data modalities do you convey the most benefit by representing it with the graph structure versus some other representation, like for example, like tabular structures? Yeah, we do have some ablation study to uh, each component inside our model. So uh, we presented it in our papers, but yeah, I think you are more curious about the difference between the, the, the other methods and our methods, for example, the tablet learning you just mentioned. Uh, that part we didn't explore, but we, we, we believe we definitely need to explore that part to compare the representation of, of different methods. and. You know, fortunately, I think dance package provide a very good framework to compare different methods. So we're definitely gonna pre um, do that in the near future. Thanks for your question. Thank you.
And Jacob? Hi, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the presentation. So in this talk, you focus very heavily on describing the methodology, all of the various edges, all the various tweaks of the method in order to get good global performance on these measures. I guess the question that I always have when I hear talks that are very technical on this is like, have you found anything interesting biologically? Like, what, what is the point of getting better performance here? Um, is the better performance actually producing models that are going to be more useful in practice? Have you discovered anything that would be useful for biologists? Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. And that's why we haven't published this work on any top journals or biological journals because we are lack of this kind of biological interests or uh, discoveries. But that's definitely what we are currently doing. And we, we do want to make some discovery based on this kind of um, graph-based methods. And uh, we, we do have an interesting discovery in this year's competition that, uh, as I mentioned here, we, we are considering combining the hallmark gene sets with a string database. And uh, in, in this year's competition, we do find that last year we didn't use string database, but we, we found that if we can somehow combine the string database, uh, this kind of protein networks uh, or gene networks into our model, uh, it significantly improved the performance. We're, we're continue to uh, to explore why and how it contribute to the modality prediction. And hopefully we can get some insights later. We'll, we'll, we'll be continuing to publish our idea. Thank you very much. I see. <laughs> but I, I guess a follow up on that, like just including more data sources and saying like performance improves, like is that a biologically interesting question or is it interesting to see like, I, I guess to me, like if you included that in performance went up, I don't know what I would conclude from that. Potentially there's some sort of weird batch effect or covariate that hasn't been accounted for or something like that. It seems like, it seems weird to me, like pursuing a leaderboard centric approach rather than a science centric approach. I, I, actually, I'm really interested in this kind of talk or discussion. So maybe we can have some offline discussion. Because uh, yeah, personally, I, I think this kind of benchmarking could be important because nowadays people does not trust, do not trust this kind of new method or deep learning methods. Uh, I think benchmark could be a way to convince people that some methods are really, um, can't really outperform some other methods uh, with respect to the, some certain metric. And uh, I'm not sure, does that make sense to you guys? But Maybe we can have some offline discussion. Thank you very much. I think you could make a conference out of this kind of discussion, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we I have to cut it off here since our session's over. But uh, thanks, King Hongjun, for your for your great talk. Um, so yeah, so that that concludes concludes this session. Um, yeah, you guys have a twenty minute break, and then we'll come back uh, and meet at two twenty to hear a few more talks before our poster session. Great. So see you soon.
Hi, everyone. We'll start again our third session today. So our first speaker is Pinar Dimechi from Brown. Um, they will talk about jointly aligning cells and features of single cell multi-omics data set with co-optimal transport. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'll be sharing my screen now. All right. Um, yes, I'm Pinar and I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in computational biology at Brown. Um, I will talk about jointly aligning cells and features of single cell co-optimal, um, single cell multiomic data sets with co-optimal transport. And this is a joint work with our collaborators from France, namely uh, Hugh Tran, who is also a PhD candidate, and Yevgen Redko, who is an um, associate professor of computer science. So I'll start with a background on why we care about aligning single cell multiomic data sets. All cellular processes are regulated by uh, specific gene expression programs, and these expression programs are determined often by um, reversible changes at multiple levels of the genome, like the changes in 3D chromosome structure or chemical modifications, which affects the accessibility of chromatin and in turn determines the protein binding on the DNA and so on. These together control the level of expression of each gene. And with the current single cell sequencing technologies, we're able to profile all these different aspects of the genome in individual cells. And jointly studying these um, can help us understand how they co-vary um, in cells to regulate cellular processes. One experimental challenge here is jointly profiling multiple features together in the same single cell. And this matrix shows the availability of co-assays, which are experimental protocols that profile multiple features together in the same cell. As you can see, for most combinations, we actually don't have a co-assaying protocol available. And um, every new combination requires a new experimental protocol to be developed. Recently, there has been a number of computational methods developed to integrate these separately profiled single cell data sets. So we can, have, we can study multiomic features without requiring co-assays. And uh, mo most of these methods find some correspondence between cells and uh, align them, align the data sets in a shared space in an um, unsupervised manner. But one remaining challenge uh, to better understand these cross-modality cross relationships in the genome is to also find correspondences between the features across the modalities beyond just matching features from the uh, same chromosomal region. Unfortunately, existing single cell multiomic alignment methods only align cells, not the features, with one exception. Um, this is BindSC, uh, and BindSC is developed as a cell alignment tool, but also relates features while aligning cells in its formulation. And although it doesn't give you directly the um, feature alignment matrix, it's actually possible to compute it from the returned uh, results. Um, but BindSC requires gene activity matrix to be given as a prior for the feature alignments. And this can be easily computed for certain modalities like chromatin accessibility, for example, but um, it's not very clear how it will be computed for, for example, 3D chromatin conformation data sets. So we approach this problem of aligning both cells and features of multiomic data sets with optimal transport. An optimal transport is a mathematical framework for relating and aligning probability distributions or discrete measures with one another. Um, in the case of single cell sequencing data, we can treat the data sets as uh, empirical discrete measures by defining marginal distributions over the samples um, or the cells and use this framework. The goal of optimal transport is to find the probabilistic correspondence matrix that will transform one distribution into the other at the lowest cost possible. And each entry in this matrix describes the probability of alignment of two samples across data sets. But the cost in the classic optimal transport formulation is defined over uh, the samples directly. And since these data sets come from different measurement modalities, uh, their samples live in different metric spaces and cannot be directly compared. Uh, existing optimal transport based single cell alignment methods, namely Scott and Pomona, overcome this problem by using a specific formulation of optimal transport called Gromo Wasserstein optimal transport where they, um, they both construct K and N graphs on the input data sets where the cells are nodes and then compute shortest distances between nodes to get pairwise cell to cell distances in each uh, domain. Um, then they defined uh, the cost matrix, the 
the cost of the transport uh, over the pairwise distances instead of the, cell, uh, instead of the samples themselves. And this way, they're able to compare data sets from um, different metric spaces. But a negative, co negative consequence of this uh, for our purposes is that the features are discarded. And the method only considers the pairwise distances and the probability distribution um, set over the cells when computing the alignments, which means uh, we don't, since we don't have the features, we can't use this formulation to get um, an understanding over the um, correspondences between features. Um, I'm just going to skip. <laughs> uh, so we employ a different formulation of optimal transport called co-optimal transport, uh, which can also compare metric spaces without uh, discarding features. But it does so by um, looking for a second correspondence matrix, this time between uh, features. And with this formulation, since we're also trying to align features, we define the probability distribution over the features as well. And then we use an alternating scheme to first solve for feature alignment correspondences and then uh, sample alignment correspondences and basically um, alternate between them and iteratively optimize both matrices. You can initialize matrices randomly, or if there is prior information, it's also possible to um, incorporate that information in the initialization. You know, uh, on my screen, okay, sorry, your slide was a half of it was not showing, but it's fixed now. Oh, actually, um, I'm glad you stopped me because I'm getting a low battery error or not an error warning message. Um, I wanted to plug in my computer, sorry. Okay, yeah, go for it. Okay, it apparently just fell out. Um, great, so with this alternating optimization procedure, we basically solve for two optimal transport um, problems. Uh, I mean, the first one, we transform the um, samples to align the samples according to correspond sample correspondence matrix, and then uh, with this transformed version of the data sets, solve for the feature correspondences, and then uh, we do the opposite in the uh, next part of the iteration. So we basically um, created a pipeline using the co-optimal transport formulation, where we take in count matrices directly prune the cells, uh, prune the features in order to account for only most um, highly variable features, and then solve for these two correspondence matrices and use the cell correspondence matrix to align cells in a shared space, either with barycentric projection or co-embedding them with TSNI or something similar. And then uh, use the feature uh, correspondence matrix to investigate these relationships by um, looking them up in um, publicly available, a few publicly available data sets that uh, provide API interfaces. And supervision can also be optionally provided during the alignment, um, where we would scale the cost matrix for either cell uh, alignments or the feature alignments um, by multiplying by this M matrix. Uh, M matrix is basically a matrix of ones, but whenever you want the correspondences between two cells or features to be encouraged, you basically assign it something lower than one, um, the entry in that matrix, so that the cost is scaled down of aligning those. Um, so we benchmark um, our alignment tool with existing methods using uh, a few real-world data sets. <laughs> the first one is SCGM. Um, the name comes from the um, sequencing technology, which measures DNA expression and, um, sorry, gene expression and DNA methylation on the same cells. The second is CiteSeq, uh, which has data on gene expression and antibody abundance, and SNARE-seq with gene expression and chromatin accessibility modalities. So all of these come from co technologies, which means uh, we have ground truth information on cell alignments, and we use that ground truth information for uh, benchmarking the alignment performance. When we move on to feature alignments, though, we um, drop a CGEM because we couldn't find a way to get ground truth um, information on feature correspondences here or an alternative way to reliably like produce um, some predictions to benchmark against. Lastly, I will talk about um, a non co essay data set where um, single cell RNA sequencing has been um, apply to two different um, 
tissues from two different organisms. So that's not a multiomic alignment uh, method, sorry, multiomic alignment task, but um, I will demonstrate some application of the supervision on that data set. So first to cell alignments, um, here I'm showing you the original um, visualization of the original domains. And uh, we align the data sets by projecting one modality onto the other according to the cell alignments uh, found by uh, Scooter. And here I'm visualizing the um, aligned um, domains. And as you can see, um, cells are, cell type clusters are generally preserved um, upon alignment. Moving to quantitative benchmarking, um, we use a metric for measuring alignment error that has been used by existing tools um, over and over again called um, fraction of samples closer than true match, which basically um, looks at for each cell, uh, how many other, what fraction of the data set it's more, more closely aligned with than its um, true corresponding cell. And we have averaged it across all of the cells in alignment to get one metric per alignment. So the lower values are better here since it's an alignment error. And we see that um, Scooter, which is cell, single cell co-optimal transport, um, compar compar gives comparative um, cell alignment results. Moving on to the fe uh, feature alignment benchmarking, um, I think the most robust ground truth information we have between the feature relationships is for the uh, site seek data set. In this data set, we have 25 antibodies, and we expect features to be um, a feature alignment to be as, at least aligning these antibodies with their um, encoding genes. So in this metrics here, um, I. I've ordered the genes and the antibodies such that the um, encoding gene, genes encoding antibodies uh, lie along the diagonal in these um, green boxes. And uh, we perform this alignment in an unsupervised manner. And we see that all of the antibodies are aligned with their en encoding gene with a non-zero probability. And then about 68 of them are assigned the um, highest alignment probability. When we compare this to bind the C results, uh, we similarly see that antibodies are correctly aligned with some non-zero score um, with their genes, but 52% of them are assigned the highest co uh, correspondence probability. And also, we generally observe that um, bind the C has a formulation based on canonical correlation analysis. This tends to give us more dense matrices, whereas um, optimal transport gives more sparse alignment results. When we looked at the feature alignments for the SNARE-seq data set though, things get a little bit more complicated here because of two challenges. Um, one, defining ground truth is more difficult. And two, what we found is that we actually need some supervision for discovering any sort of um, feature relationships here. When we looked at the feature relationships we were getting in the uh, completely unsupervised um, setting, a lot of them were very difficult to interpret. But what I'm showing you here is with 100% supervision on cell type alignments. So we assume that people have um, information on cell types from the um, gene ex expression in the chromatin accessibility data sets. And that's provided to the algorithm for um, aligning the features too. As you can see, um, some of these genes and these four genes are the uh, marker genes for the four cell types we have um, for example col one a is aligned correctly with its own gene body which makes sense um, and similarly hla drb1 is aligned with the region in its promoter uh, region um, many of these alignments ended up um, giving some annotation for um, cell type specific transcriptional finding transcriptional factor binding predictions on the um, UCSC browser. Um, if a few of them, we didn't really find any annotations for, but we think um, Scooter is able to give some hypotheses for um, then looking into regulatory relationships uh, in a downstream analysis. So for quantitative benchmarking, um, like as I said, ground truth is very tricky to define here. Um, what we did is look at an alternative way to generate uh, these relationships. 
and used Saloracle, which is a gene regulatory network inference method that uses both chromatin accessibility and gene expression data um, to infer these regulatory relationships, and also takes into account uh, transcriptional binding sites. Um, so in the regulatory, re regulatory network for the top 1,000 most variable genes we're looking at, we look at each gene's neighbor, and we expect to recover correspondences with the um, chromatin accessibility region um, of the neighbors in the gene regulatory network. And basically, this is how we calculate um, accuracy. As you can see, with increased um, level of supervision on cell type alignments, we also get better uh, feature alignments. So the alignment, so the supervision doesn't really have to be given on the same level. Um, and the bind SC comparison here, um, the gene activity matrix is calculated based on um, SURA. And the last application is giving supervision on the other side. So this time we provide supervision on uh, paralogous genes between two um, species. We have data, we have some sequencing data, um, RNA-seq data on mouse prefrontal cortex here and um, bearded lizard uh, pallium. Those are the two data sets we're trying to align. Um, and we have some prior information on uh, which genes in the data set are paralogous. So that's how we provide the supervision. And um, cell type Cell type labels aren't exactly the same, but there is quite a big, quite a bit of overlap here. So we expect excitatory cells to be aligned with excitatory cells, uh, inhibitory cells with inhibitory cells, and so on. So we use these six cell types for accuracy calculations, but we actually see that, for example, astrocytes, I think, are supposed to be glial cells, and they're aligned strongly with ependomyoglial cells. So it seems like there are some um, biologically relevant uh, results. So in conclusion, this is a framework for aligning both cells and features for um, hypothesis generation. And um, we think the cell alignment performance has it seems to be competitive with existing tools. And um, supervision on one al alignment level, like cells, seem to improve the supervision, so, sorry, the alignment performance on the other level. Um, so the Whichever level you have some supervising information will improve the alignment results. Our, currently, we are investigating ways to um, automatically incorporate publicly available prior information so that the users wouldn't have to deal with that. Um, investigating when supervision is needed. Our um, preliminary results show that how sparse the correspondences are and also um, how sparse the input data sets seem to matter. Um, and we're working on a neural network formulation for potentially accounting for more complex relationships. Uh, we're not yet sure if that's going to be uh, giving any sort of uh, leg up. Uh, I would really appreciate any feedback you might have about um, how to conduct more robust benchmarking, given the um, difficulty I had with defining ground truth correspondences. Oh. And yeah, I'd like to thank my um, lab members and also Rebecca, Nicholas, and Remy, who had very useful discussions with us. Thank you so much, Pinar. I think we have time for some questions. So I say question in Q&A. Uh, Tiam Hedari asks, uh, what are the underlying assumptions when using OT between two different types of data? I see. I think one of the assumptions is that there's going to be a large overlap in um, how, that one data set can be de uh, described in terms of the other data set because we're assuming that there is an un underlying manifold um, that accounts for both data sets. This is true for what this is true for both aligning cells and also aligning features. If that assumption doesn't hold, they'll I mean, yeah, you're probably not going to get high quality alignments. Um, so I think a common manifold is, uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, there is a question from David. Yeah, um, nice talk. Um, it's sort of a related question to TMs in a way, which is I missed whether there's like a single objective function for your like simultaneous optimal transport over the 
you know, cells and, and features. So where you could interpret the alternating updates that you're doing as being, mm -hmm. oh yeah, okay, you do have so it here. Yeah, is, right, cool. Um, this term here actually defines when the optimization is going to stop. Mm. When you transform both the cell samples and the features, um, and you look at the Euclidean distance between the two data sets, um, right. is, that, uh, is that updating and like changing a lot or not? Um, so I think that could be considered the uh, common object. Yeah, no, 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 that's exactly it. Yeah, I, I guess my follow up to this would be, so for optimal transport for the cells to cells, that's sort of very intuitive to me that you're saying, you're asking like how you have to assign cells in one data set to the other data set to get kind of the same uh, distribution effectively. Mm -hmm. But I was trying to think what that means for features, because then that's something, it's like the expression of this gene has to be like moved to the accessibility of these peaks or something like that. So I was wondering if you could just talk a bit about like how you should think about interpreting that. Yeah, um, yeah, our collaborator, Yevgen Redko said, um, I think he gets that question pretty often. Um, and I think that's a very fair question to ask because it's a little, yeah, it feels a little weirder. I think of it as I have a data set in a high dimensional space and I am transforming this high dimensional space into a new high dimensional space. Um, yeah. But I think how much you can express features in one domain based on the features in the other domain definitely matters a lot in whether you are getting informative alignments. Um, and that might be one of the challenges with the snare seek results too, because after pruning, we got rid of a lot of features and maybe um, we don't have enough features to express the features in the one uh, domain. Yeah, I guess it's like, since chromatin accessibility and gene expression are, they have like a biological connection in the sense that chromatin accessibility um, affects gene expression. So yeah. because of that relevance, I think we're able to transform the two sort of feature spaces. I'm not entirely gotcha. sure if this uh, answer is satisfactory <laughs> because- No, that, that definitely I helps. I think what I was basically wondering is whether there's- yeah. Yeah, no, whether there's like some constraint on the features to features mapping that you're learning that's like too, like kind of too strong almost because you have, you know, it like you can't sort of gain mass going in one direction and maybe you actually should be able to and that's in that for the features to features part. But, oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, interesting. Actually, we... I think that comes to the maybe unbalanced formulation of optimal transport so that you can, as you said, gain mass or mm. lose mass. Um, right. And yeah. that was a separate um, work that was led by Hugh. Um, we didn't want to really in intersect too much, so we didn't do any um, unbalanced stuff here. But technically, you can formulate both OT problems as uh, unbalanced OT problems, and that might actually help. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you for, um, to keep the time, we'll move on. Pinar, there's another question for you. Maybe you can um, just type in your answer. So okay. next up, uh, our speaker is Alex Lind from Harvard, and he will tell us about batch normalization and how it improves general, generalization in microscopy images. Hi, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so uh, like Sarah said, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Harvard. Uh, and this summer, I interned with Alex Liu at Microsoft Research, um, and he is also my co-author on this paper. Um, and today, I will be talking to you guys about incorporating uh, knowledge of plates in batch norm and how that improves um, generalization of deep learning for microscopy images. Um, to start off, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, fluorescent lens microscopy. So I think um, fluorescent microscopy is a very exciting modality that allows us to uh, highlights biologically informative parts of a cell, um, for example, the nuclei, the ER, the actin, et cetera, and assemble those into an image um, where we can really kind of understand what is happening to, uh, let's say, a, a cell or a, several several cells under uh, genetic or chemical perturbations. And in recent years, um, high throughput microscopes have allowed us to really scale up the extent to which we can collect these images. Um, this has allowed us to 
uh, accelerate different um, applications such as drug discovery, uh, functional genomics by basically um, applying small perturbations to uh, many different samples um, in parallel and then kind of collecting the results of that and then systematically analyzing it. Um, and the reason why deep learning is, is exciting is because it allows us to process this enormous, uh, enormous amount of data. And um, in such a way, it can also help us uh, accelerate these applications. Um, and to give you like a very concrete example, so one area that deep learning is very ex uh, exciting for microscopy is morphological profiling. So imagine I have two drugs, drug A and B, and maybe drug A is a, a drug that I know about, um, and drug B is like a drug that I invented, or I, I want to know if it has kind of the same efficacy as drug A. Um, so one way that's kind of morphological profiling can help us is it takes these images and it kind of transforms them into vectors. And then once I have vectors, I can kind of, you know, do any comparison with them. Um, so I can take, you know, some, some sort of metric between them. And then maybe if these vectors are close enough, then I can conclude that these drugs uh, kind of have the same effect. So now, now the question is, is that, you know, how do I go from these images to vectors? And that's where deep learning um, can really help us because uh, deep learning has, has kind of, uh, at least for natural images, it has shown that it can learn kind of these very informative um, uh, representations that are useful for classification and other tasks and so on. Um, and the question is, can, can we also use deep learning to learn these informative representations for microscopy? Um, okay, so this is, this is all really cool, but one kind of issue that comes up in microscopy that might not be as uh, prevalent when you analyze natural images is that of batch effects. Um, so this is a problem that all like biologists will know very well, which is that if you go on one day into the lab, you collect like a set of images, um, you might get images that look like this. Um, you go another day into the lab, um, collect, maybe you use the same same perturbations, kind of the same cells, right? Um, or same, same cell types, you get images that look uh, pretty different. Um, and images within one batch look closer to each other than images um, across different batches, uh, even if the treatments are the same. And the reason for this is because, you know, there are certain things that happened on day one, and I'm just giving some examples here. So for example, the temperature, the humidity, um, there might be certain other factors like kind of the knob at which you set your microscope, um, maybe like the kind of the, how, how well your cells are able to, um, are, are, you know, have how well your cells are able to absorb your perturbations versus not like on a certain day, um, et cetera. But there are many kind of these like batch effects that occur. Um, and what the main point being that these batch effects change um, when you go collect different data on different days. And so that will cause your images to look uh, slightly different. Um, so the reason why this might be a problem is because um, if you were to, let's say, train a model on images you collected from one day, um, let's say I'm training this model here, this classifier that takes the image and tries to classify, you know, what is the, the drug that I use, right? Um, then I try to test it on uh, data that I collected on, on another day. Uh, the model will have a difficult time generalizing. And um, so there's, there's been many, many papers that have highlighted this. Um, so there's, there's one recent one in particular talking like, you know, you can have like a kind of a train test uh, generalization gap um, that, that is quite large. Um, and batch effects might not be the only reason for this, but it's definitely one of the reasons. And there are systematic ways where you can ablate and, and figure out how much batch effects are affecting you. But in general, they will hurt the ability of your model to generalize. Um, and if you look, for example, into the representation spaces that your models are learning, so on, uh, now what I'm doing is I'm taking all my different images, I'm taking those representations that I learned for each image, I'm projecting it down into this two-dimensional space, I'm cover coloring every image based on um, which batch it came from. What I'm finding is that images within a certain batch artificially look closer to each other. Um, and on all the images here, they have like the same treatments. Uh, so you, we don't expect them to, you know, for any... Uh, particular reason to actually cluster according to their different batches. Um, but, but we see that they do. And, and the reason being that, you know, we have batch effects here in play. Uh, so um, that kind of leads us to the next point, which is how do people deal with batch effects in practice? And uh, the classical solution for dealing with it is uh, very simple, this idea of normalization. Um, so basically, you know, we collect images in different batches and, um, what, what is commonly done is you take your images in one particular batch, um, you can compute certain statistics on that batch, for example, the means and the variances across, um, uh, across your different images. So for example, your, your, your mean of your first batch might look something like this, mean of your second batch might look something like this, um, and they're, they're, slightly, they're going to be slightly different. 
And what you can do is you can kind of subtract out these, these means or divide by the variances and standardize out these effects. Um, so this is a very commonly used um, and popular method. Um, but, but the issue being that, you know, for these uh, deep learning models that are becoming more and more used um, in microscopy, um, even though this method is simple, it's not quite as effective as these uh, as alternative methods that are being designed. And kind of the the reason for why we think this is the case is because um, in general, these normalization methods, they're only going to affect, let's say, your pre-processing process where you, or you're taking the raw data and you're standardizing it, or like post-processing process where you take your representations and you standardize those. Um, but you don't kind of affect uh, different internal representations of, let's say, a deep neural net. Basically, this, this method is independent of deep learning, right? Um, so it doesn't, uh, it does, it's not necessarily especially adapted for deep learning. And the question we try to ask is, you know, can we design something like this, but adapt it uh, for deep learning? Um, deep learning being that, you know, we have kind of these multiple operations in sequence. And, um, you know, can we do something where we're applying normalization, not only at the inputs or the outputs, but also in between? And that kind of leads us to our proposed idea, uh, which we call batch effects normalization, um, or BEN for short. And uh, at a high level, it's just, we're gonna apply normalization while training a neural network, and this normalization is going to be applied at many different layers. Um, so in terms of implementation, it's very simple and it requires minimal changes to existing deep learning pipelines. And the reason why is because uh, we are exploiting a commonly used layer that is exists in many neural nets uh, in convolutional neural nets in particular and that layer is called batch norm um, so this is like an example of a typical cnn and if you look inside there are these kind of uh these white boxes which i've highlighted in red uh, these are the batch norm layers and we are going to repurpose these into something that can uh correct for batch effects um, so at a high level um, i'm first going to go into a quick primer on what batch norm does, and this will help me explain um, what our method does. So in a typical deep learning pipeline, what you do is you have your training sets, and let's say each dot here is an image and you have uh, different colored dots. Um, so each color is a different batch. Um, so what you'll do is you typically randomly sample from this da training data set, um, and you'll get like a, a training batch here. Um, and then you'll pass this training batch to your neural net. And then inside a batch norm layer, what happens is you have a representation for every single image and you're going to collect, compute these statistics, the means and the standard deviations across um, your different uh, inputs. And then you're going to use those to standardize. Um, but uh, the key here is that, okay, batch norm was not initially designed for any batch effects correction. It was designed to kind of stabilize the training of our neural network by kind of putting all of our features on the same distribution. Um, so kind of in, in vanilla batch norm as implemented in your standard deep learning pipeline, it's not going to do, it's not going to correct for batch effects. But there's there's one simple idea we can use to kind of repurpose uh, this batch norm to connect correct for batch effects. And that has to do with how we sample data. So if instead of sampling our data randomly like this, let's say we sampled exclusively from one experimental batch. And this is, um, this is kind of the essence of our idea, uh, which we call Ben. Um, so what if we did this, then what ends up happening is that inside your neural nets, uh, inside your batch norm layer, um, all of your uh, inputs will be from the same experimental batch, which means that your means and standard deviations that you compute using batch norm will be representative of kind of the means and standard deviation of that experimental batch. And then when you standardize your data by, by, by these uh, statistics, you're kind of uh, subtracting out the overall effect of the, of the red batch. Um, and let's say you go to the next training step, you can do the same thing with, let's say, the blue batch and, and the same thing. You're, in your outputs, you will kind of subtract out the, the batch effects of the blue batch. Um, so kind of just doing this one effect of sampling exclusively from a single experimental batch will, in a sense, automatically turn your batch norm layers into a way to collect, correct for batch effects. Uh, and um, so the three simple steps that we, we do for, for Ben are... Um, one, during training, we sample exclusively from one experimental batch, which I just talked about. During inference, you have to kind of do the same thing um, to keep in line with training, which is you're going to take your entire experimental, experimental batch and feed it to the network at once. And the third thing is that during inference, you want to unfreeze and recalculate your batch norm statistics. So traditionally, you don't actually 
um, recalculate these statistics. Um, but in order to enforce that batch of effects correction, um, that's what we do. And if you do these three things, then we have our method. Um, so the first thing we did is that we, we tried to apply our method to this data set called RxRx1Wilds, which is a large uh, fluorescent microscopy data sets that uh, studies batch effects. So it takes like 125,000 or so images. And the goal is to kind of classify these as one of 1,000 or so treatments. Um, and the key being that these images are collected over different batches um, or different experiments. Uh, each experiment has several different plates. So we treat each plate as a batch. Um, and the difficulty in this data set is that in order to perform, perform well, you have to be able to overcome batch effects because your training batches or your training plates are different from your testing plates. Uh, so what we saw um, just at a high level is that if you train your standard ResNet, you get a particular accuracy of around 30% on the test sets. Um, if you just apply our kind of simple three-step process of then, uh, you kind of get a near 10% boost in accuracy. And this happens to be uh, kind of the best reported number that's available for this data sets. Um, and in particular, I want to highlight that our method outperforms some of these other methods that um, are more complicated in how they correct for batch effects. Um, so some of these methods, they require training like a separate network just for batch effects correction, or they require, you know, um, heavy augmentation of your data. Um, and our method is, is just about how you sample data during training. Um, so it's encouraging that it's able to outperform these other methods. Um, and we, all, we didn't just look at supervised learning. We also looked at, you know, how can we use Ben for unsupervised learning, uh, which is becoming increasingly popular in uh, microscopy. And the idea in unsupervised learning being that you want to kind of go from this image to representation process without using labels. Um, and so one of the methods that people have been using a lot is uh, this, this method called SimClear, um, which has shown to be effective for other microscopy data sets other than this RX, RX1 wilds, which, which we've been experimenting on. Um, and um, once you have these representations, the way you evaluate them is you see if they're predictive of, let's say, treatment or some biological factor that you're interested in. Um, and what we were able to show is that um, on, on this, on, on this uh, unsupervised learning uh, method, um, our method is able to lead to, uh, again, similar to supervised learning, uh, substantial increases in accuracy. Um, and also, uh, we also propose a new method, which I won't go into detail about, but it's in our, in our paper about uh, a new unsupervised learning method. Um, and we were, we were able to show that Ben also improves that as well. Um, and one um, kind of image I want to get to is that um, is the representation spaces that you learn from uh, these methods with and without Ben. So without Ben, you kind of see that um, batch effects have an effect on the different representations you learn. So you'll see clusters of, of different colors um, be, being, and this is a result of um, the model thinking that images from a particular batch are more like each other than images of another batch. But with Ben, the representation space kind of gets smoothed out among the different batches. Um, so this is kind of like um, some signal that we are correcting for what we want to correct for, which is, you know, we want to get rid of these uh, ar arbitrary uh, differences between these images that are due to batch effects. Um, yeah, and then just add, add, just I'll quickly wrap up and say that we also applied this method to transfer learning. Um, and we were able to show that um, we tra train a model on one data set and evaluate it on another data set. Um, we are um, able to also apply this batch effects correction method to obtain better results. Um, so uh, right now in the literature, uh, there's this uh, BBBC021 data set, uh, which is a morpholog morphological profiling task. Um, and uh, there are many different uh, data sets that people have used to kind of transfer and, and see how well uh, they perform. Um, and in general, like images or commercial images have been better at transferring for this task than uh, mic microscopy images, which is surprising because it's a microscopy data sets. And um, we were able to show that with our method, we can kind of match state of the art on, on this metric. Um, but then also show that when we do add Ben versus not add Ben, we lead to a significant improvement um, in our uh, classification accuracy um, for the, for this for this morphological profiling task, um, and I'll just conclude. Um, so we introduced batch effects normalization to help deep learning models uh, adapt to batch effects. Um, it's really simple, easy to implement. It's only three steps, um, but despite this, it can lead to significant performance gains. 
And um, in the future, we want to explore how we can also use this method um, in situations beyond just uh, microscopy, because batch effects are a problem that come across all different levels of uh, ex experimental biology. And um, we, we are hopeful that this method could also be applied elsewhere. And uh, I would love to talk more. Um, for more information, please check out our paper, our code, uh, and I will also be at the closure session later today. Cool. Thanks so Thank much, uh, Alex. So uh, first question is from James. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Really nice talk. So uh, if if there are real biological differences between these between images from different batches, then what do you think will happen right. with this? And also, I'm curious, how does the size of the batch affect these results? Yeah, yeah. So those, those are both great questions. So I'll, I'll uh, take the first one first. So the first one is, if there are actual biological differences between the different batches, right? How do you, how do you like, um, I guess, not eliminate those uh, when you standardize? Um, so that is actually something we also ran into. And um, uh, maybe that's, that's like kind of a, a point that I was not able to expound upon earlier. But basically, like, um, you can kind of choose which data points you use for batch normalization. So if I go back to my graphic here. Um, so right now, in typical batch norm, you kind of take all your data and you standardize it this way. Um, we have also tried variants of this in which instead of taking all of your data, you do something that's more similar to what's typically done in normalization, which is you have kind of a control set and then you don't expect that control set to vary across different batches and you use those to calculate your statistics. And in certain cases, we actually see that using that control sets um, instead of using like, let's say the whole training batch to calculate these statistics um, performs better than uh, if you were to use the whole uh, batch, if, if that makes sense. Um, and then your second question, can you remind me what it was? I, I just forgot. What is the size of batch? Oh, the size of batch. Yeah, so that's also, a, that's also a great question. And that's also a question we explore more in our paper through ablation studies. So um, yeah, so like these, these statistics that you calculate will be, uh, the stability of them will, or, or the variance of them will definitely depend on how big your batch is. Um, and we have some ablation studies showing that if, you're, if your batch or your training batch is not like large enough, then you're perf you will suffer in terms of performance. And it's, it's unclear right now, like what exactly is the cutoff, right? For what is the large enough batch that you need, training batch that you need in order to calculate these statistics. Um, but but you do see that relationship, which is that you do need a sufficiently large um, training batch in order to uh, have good performance. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, David has a question. Go for it, David. Yeah, uh, really cute um, idea. Um, I was curious. So in some settings, you have covariates that are not like discrete batches right so you have you know individuals at a different age or you have you know maybe for this setting you have you know you had a figure showing temperature earlier so maybe you have that measured so i was curious if you have ideas about how you'd extend this sort of idea to if you have some covariate that you want to control for that's not like a discrete like group of your samples i see okay uh I don't know if I totally understood the question. Maybe if you could expand a little bit. So I know you were saying, so you were talking about temperature, right? And you were saying if you yeah, had a discrete so, covariance. So basically that, you can think of yeah. one way of thinking of batch would be that it's some categorical covariate. Sure, sure. That sure. you have for all of your samples. And here you have a way of, you know, as if you have those discrete groupings and you have a way of controlling for that um, within... A, across uh batch effects right but if you have you know if you have some other the sort of generalization of that would be that there are multiple possible confounding factors so maybe there's batch and maybe there's yeah temperature um that uh, oh i see what you mean and there could be other could be other things as well um so i was wondering if there's yeah. like ways you could think of extending this to those sorts of settings yeah, so yeah, that's that's also a great question. And um, yeah, so I, I haven't thought too much about like what we could do in those settings. Um, but I think the problem the problem you bring up like happens a lot. So even like let's say within a particular batch, like on like let's say a a plate in which you're collecting, you know, many different samples, you might expect for there to be like 
batch effects, internal batch effects within that plate. And, you know, maybe as you go away from the center of that plate, you will see certain effects that you don't see at the center of the plate. And that's more of like a continuum as opposed to kind of discrete groupings. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's, that's like a very important problem that comes up. Um, I, I don't know how exactly you would generalize this specific idea, but I agree that that's an important problem that needs to be uh, addressed. Right. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. So now we're going to move to our spotlight session. Hopefully all the presenters are here and the timing didn't somehow uh, mistranslate. So our first speaker um, is Hao Tian. I hope you're here. Okay, what we can do is move on to our second speaker and then meanwhile, we'll look for the first one. Um, so second speaker, Luca. Yes, that's me. Perfect, go for it, Luca. Okay, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Great. So hello everyone, and thanks for this great opportunity to talk about my work. I'm a PhD student in Lyon at the Laboratory of Biometry and Evolutionary Biology. And I'm here today to present our work, Philoformer towards fast and accurate phylogeny reconstruction with self-attention networks. So the problem at hand is that of phylogenetic reconstruction that is given a set of homologous sequences who want to find the phylogenetic tree, that is the uh, tree that describes their evolution from a common ancestor. One issue that makes this problem hard is the fact that the number of binary and rooted uh, tree topologies grows uh, super exponentially with the number of leaves, the number of sequences that we have. And this entails the fact that state-of-the-art methods as maximum likelihood and Bayesian inference need, need to explore a, a huge tree space, which makes them computationally very costly. And for the same reason, existing deep learning approaches which frame the problem as a classification one are limited to trees with only four leaves. So our another class of methods works rather computing distances between sequences. Indeed, one can see the branches of a phylogenetic tree as labeled with uh, branch lengths, positive weights, which represent the expected number of substitution per site, uh, taking place in, the, in a sequence evolving along that branch. This naturally defines a metric on the set of uh, sequences, on the set of leaves, with the distance, distance between two of them being given simply by the cumulative sum of these branch lengths along uh, the path which goes from one leaf to the other. Distance-based methods are fast and are guaranteed to recover the true tree topology given the correct evolutionary distances in input. But the problem now becomes, how do we compute these distances? So distance estimation is typically <clears throat> always uh, performed in the still in the maximum likelihood framework. But um, one disadvantage is that uh, it usually only involves uh, two sequences at a time. It only considers two sequences at a time, uh, failing to exploit the information contained in the full uh, alignment. And uh, this reflects in a worse reconstruction accuracy with respect to a full maximum likelihood approach. Furthermore, these distances, they're not independent. They need to satisfy constraints as the triangle inequality or the four point inequality. So our goal is to train a um, <clears throat> neural network uh, based on a transformer architecture to jointly predict the, all the evolutionary distances given a multiple sequence alignment and in input. Um, this can be, uh, to do so, we train uh, our network in a supervised learning setting, framing the problem, therefore, as a, a simple regression task with a mean squared error loss. And once trained, our network's predictions can be used uh, along with a standard distance-based uh, uh, algorithm to reconstruct a phylogenetic tree. So the attention mechanism in the transformer blocks allows the, the pair representations to interact with each other, exploiting therefore the information contained in the full alignment to improve the predictions. Furthermore, a high degree of parameter sharing allows to use the same model for inference 
uh, no matter the number of sequences in the in the input alignment or the sequence length. And also the network uh, structural equivalence allows to recover the same tree, uh, the same evolutionary distances, and thus the same phylogenetic tree for each permutation of the input sequences, which allows us to use fewer parameters and training data points as no delta augmentation is needed. So in the field of phylogenetics, the applications of machine learning methods is still uh, very underdeveloped. Nevertheless, the reconstruction of a phylogeny is already an important uh, step in the pipeline for different biological prediction tasks. Uh, so one interesting feature that I wanted uh, to talk to you uh, about is the fact that actually the problem framed in this way is um, <clears throat> actually not that different to the um, much more popular one of structure prediction. Indeed, in this context, we have a multiple sequence alignment and we wish to compute distances between the sequences, uh, that is, uh, between the rows of the alignment. Whereas in the context of structure prediction, we often have a component uh, having the goal of uh, predicting distances between uh, sites, uh, namely between the columns of the multiple alignments, which gives complex maps that can be used to infer uh, uh, protein structure. And indeed, uh, for our task, we used a similar architecture for the uh, <clears throat> to the MSA transformer. Um, the main difference being that uh, we do not train our model on a masked uh, <clears throat> language mo uh, modeling task, but um, directly end to end to predict these evolutionary distances. Uh, in a way, more similarly as uh, to what AlphaFold does in its Evoformer module. So uh, we've tested our model with um, several simulation schemes, both for the tree topologies and for the module model of a probabilistic model of evolution used. And uh, we've mostly seen the same. The following. Uh, here in this graph, we have uh, compared the results of uh, in terms of Robinson full distance, which is um, a metric of the error between the true and reconstructed trees. And uh, here we compare three methods, um, maximum likelihood, a full maximum likelihood implementation, and IQ tree in orange, um, a standard distance-based method, which computes the maximum likelihood estimate of the distances and then uses a uh, distance-based algorithm to reconstruct the tree uh, in violet and our method field former. And uh, we kind of always see the same trend uh, obtaining uh, performances that are comparable to those of maximum likelihood and consistently uh, better than the standard-based methods. The advantage here is that uh, we get performances that are close to maximum likelihood, but in a fraction of a time. So here we have the performances, uh, the performances in terms of speed uh, of our network uh, compared against uh, the other two methods that we've seen before. Uh, we can see that we are one uh, or two order of magnitudes faster than uh, the state of the art method while having uh, performances which are very close in terms of accuracy. Um, furthermore, uh, this model has been trained on only alignments with 20 sequences, but here we're testing it on uh, alignments with up to 100 sequences, which so shows the ability to generalize. And as I mentioned before, the potential of application of the same, exactly the same model to alignments of uh, no matter which size. So, Luca, sorry you. to interrupt you, um, but okay, I hope you're yeah, done. Yeah, we're yeah, that was the end. <laughs> okay, thank you for listening. So I've tried to give a bit of, of an, an overview of the problem. I didn't go too much into the details of the methods and the network architecture, but I'm here for my poster, so do not hesitate to come and ask questions. All right, thank you. Um, our next speaker is Kyle. Okay, let me share my screen.
Perfect, go for it. Okay, great. All right, so I'm Kyle, and I'll be giving an overview of our paper, which is called Predicting Immunescape with Pre-trained Protein Language Model Embeddings. And this is joint work with Howard Chang and James O. So immune escape is a major challenge that we face when we're confronted with rapidly evolving viruses. Uh, the process of immune escape works as follows. Once a virus infects a host, then the host immune system fights back by creating an antibody. The antibody binds to a part of a viral protein called the antigen, and this allows the immune system to neutralize the virus. Um, but in response, the virus mutates the antigen to prevent antibody binding, and this results in immune escape. These escape muta mutations are especially dangerous since they allow the virus to circumvent antibodies uh, from a previous infection or a vaccination. And our goal in this work is to predict which mutations lead to immune escape. And here we explore the use of protein language models or PLMs to predict immune escape. PLMs are trained in an unsupervised manner on large databases of protein sequences, and they implicitly learn fundamental information about proteins, such as which amino acids are in contact in the 3D protein structure. And this could potentially allow them to understand the binding of antibody and antigen. PLMs also learn to predict the likelihood of each amino acid in a protein sequence. And prior work has shown that these likelihoods can be used to perform zero-shot mutation effect prediction by computing the log likelihood ratio of the mutated amino acid over the wild type amino acid. However, likelihoods assume single protein chains with a single protein function. And in the case of immune escape, antibodies and antigens are two separate chains and antigen binding differs for each antibody, meaning likelihoods are not appropriate. So we propose to replace likelihoods with PLM embeddings to model immune escape. And here we specifically use the model ESM2 as our PLM. We test our methods using a SARS-CoV-2 immune escape dataset. The dataset contains one antigen with every possible single point mutation tested against each of 247 different antibodies. And this results in nearly 1 million escape scores measuring how much each mutation reduces binding to a given antibody. We split our data in four ways depending on the difficulty of the task and the potential applications. These include splits by mutation, antigen site, antibody, and antibody cluster. And in these slides, I'll show results on the antibody split. This split is particularly important since it evaluates the ability of our model to analyze and potentially guide the design of new antibodies to make them robust to escape mutations. To provide a point of comparison for our PLM embedding models, we developed four baseline models. The first two are statistical models based on the average escape score for each amino acid change or antigen site. And then next is a recurrent neural network trained from scratch on the full mutant antigen sequence. And finally, we test the PLM likelihood method of comparing the mutant and wild type amino acid likelihoods in the masked antigen sequence. And note that all four of these models are actually agnostic to the antibody and are therefore missing some crucial information. The PLM embedding models that we develop uh, take several forms depending on the information that we choose to include. The simplest is the antigen sequence embedding. And here the PLM embedding of each amino acid is averaged across the sequence. And this embedding is used as input to a small multi-layer perceptron, which then predicts the escape score. An alternate formulation is to replace the sequence average of PLM embeddings with just the embedding of the mutated residue. And another option is to actually compare the mutated antigen sequence with the wild type antigen sequence by embedding both, either at the sequence or residue level, and then computing the difference of those embeddings. And finally, the antibody can be included by embedding both the heavy and light chains using the PLM, and then concatenating those embeddings with any form of the antigen embedding. And this allows the model to reason about the interaction of the antigen with the antibody. Our results highlight four key points. First, the PLM embeddings consistently work better than likelihoods. And second, the type of PLM embedding matters. We see that difference embeddings beat mut mutant embeddings, residue is better than sequence, and including the antibody embedding is helpful. However, simple baselines such as the site model and the RNN perform comparably to the embedding models, and all models perform relatively poorly. This indicates that PLMs do not fully solve immune escape, so more work is needed. Thank you for listening, and please come to our poster if you have any questions or would like to learn more. Thank you so much, Kyle, very much on time. Okay, moving on to um, Umberto. Hello. Yeah, so let me share the screen here.
Yeah, we can see it. Great. All good? Yeah. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Umberto, and this is recent joint work with Daniel Garbosa and uh, Florence Bidbol at EPFL, in which we propose using masked language modeling to correctly infer protein interaction partners among paralogs. So as a lightning introduction, let me recall that genes of proteins are said to be paralogs if they lie on different branches of a gene duplication event when we look at their common evolutionary history. For instance, in the evolutionary tree shown here, an ancestral gene A gets duplicated into an A.1 and an A.2 gene. Therefore, the A.1 and A.2 genes become paralogs in each of our two organisms. Once duplication occurs, paralogs can actually evolve to perform different functions compared to their ancestral gene and to one another. Let's now consider a variant of this evolutionary process. This time, two distinct genes A and B are simultaneously duplicated, and hence different AB pairs are inherited by the terminal organisms. In our work, we consider cases in which the A and B genes code for proteins which actually interact. Now, since the detailed evolutionary history is generally unknown, a paralog matching problem arises when looking at the genome or proteome of terminal organisms. This matching problem is relevant for inferring the protein interactome and for protein complex structure prediction, especially with evolution-based methods. A solution to this problem for prokaryotes that is often sufficient there is to use genomic co-localization, because in prokaryotes, functionally related proteins are frequently coded in the same operon. In the general case, some existing approaches involve orthology networks and comparing phylogenies, as in the mirror tree method. Some other approaches exist, which are also based on coevolution ideas. Now, in the language of protein multiple sequence alignments, this problem can be phrased as follows. Given one MSA for protein family A and one for family B, match each sequence from A with its correct interaction partner from B. Now, in general, several duplication events can occur throughout the evolutionary history. Uh, this leads to several paralogs per species and to a factorial scaling of the number of possible one-to-one -one matchings. Another way to visualize this problem is that we would like to construct a concatenated quote-unquote AB MSA in which correct interaction partners are in the same row. Now, in our work, we propose a new approach to this matching problem based on using a pre-trained MSA-based language model and its masked language modeling loss. The model we use is the recently introduced MSA transformer, also mentioned by Luca, which was trained to correctly predict randomly masked residues in single family MSAs, such as the one for fam family A shown here. Now the model's masked language modeling loss is a cross entropy loss for the masked residues. Now, even though MSA transformer was trained on single family MSAs, we're free to feed it concatenated MSAs from pairs of interacting protein families A and B. In this case, the model will attempt to use information from B to predict residues in A and vice versa. We can hope that the model will perform better at predicting masked residues on correctly concatenated MSAs than on incorrectly concatenated MSAs. So we went ahead and tested this possibility on a couple of concatenated MSAs consisting of pairs of histidine kinase and response regulator proteins. We found there that indeed the MLM loss decreases fairly sharply as more and more of the pairings are correct. This suggests a solution to the parallel matching problem that is very simple to state, namely simply find matchings which minimize the MLM loss after concatenation. The key idea here was to look for, uh, sorry, using methods uh, uh, introduced at ICLR 2018, we can avoid a brute force search, which would be uh, unfeasible, by formulating a differentiable optimization problem, which we can solve by gradient descent. And the key idea here was to look for optimal permutations by smoothly parametrizing nearby quote unquote soft permutations. Come visit our poster for more details on this. We tested an iterative variant of our method against several MSAs from two interacting systems. Since these interacting systems are prokaryotic, we could actually evaluate our method against ground truth matchings given by genome proximity. Each of our MSAs contains around 50 interacting pairs, and the expected accuracy of random pairings is 9% for one system and 20% for the other. Furthermore, the state-of-the-art accuracy for coevolution-based methods is less than 30% or 20% depending on the method. In this regime of shallow MSAs, we were able to consistently outperform these approaches. 
And we also observed that using some ground truth matchings as fixed unmasked context improves performance considerably, all the way up to almost 70% or more. In the near future, we plan to perform more extensive benchmarking, particularly with eukaryotic MSAs for which gene proximity is not available as a ground truth. Furthermore, we also plan to combine our approach with other methods to provide better initializations. And with this, thank you for your attention and see you at the poster session. Thank you so much, Umberta, and thank you so much for staying up so late in your time zone. Um, okay, <laughs> next um, we have Alexandra, I believe, from Australia. So um, I think timing should be okay for you. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, let me just share my screen. Yeah, it's about 10.30 a.m. here, so perfect timing for me. I was very lucky. Um, all right. Are you able to see this? Yeah, we can see it. Excellent. All right, so yes, my name's Alex. I'm from the Australian uh, National University and I'm a PhD student. Uh, and I'll be presenting my work on language informed base calling architecture for nanopore direct RNA sequencing. So nanopore is the first sequencing technology to directly sequence full length RNA molecules without converting to cDNA first. It works by passing an RNA strand through a nanopore that has an ionic current running through it. And as the strand moves through the pore, the resistance inside the pore changes according to the nucleotide sequence, resulting in disruptions to the current. Base calling is the process of decoding this current signal into the nucleotide sequence. And it's a challenging computational problem. So at any given time, the pore contains five nucleotides, and this means that each current value corresponds to one of four to the power of five possible kamas. Each kama is associated with a distribution of current levels, and the distributions for different kamas overlap. Also, noise arises from the nanopore sensing system, which obscures the signal. Uh, importantly, the molecule transits the pore at a variable speed, and as a result of all of these factors, the same nucleotide sequence can generate uh, very varied signals, as you can see uh, an example here. So base calling algorithms have been an active area of research for many years. All base callers developed to date use the raw nanopore signal as the only input, and the innovation has really been in the pre-processing and decoding of the signal. But despite these efforts, RNA base calling accuracy remains at around 93% and existing models can't always confidently resolve every part of a signal uh, resulting in base calling errors. So a crucial insight for our study is that messenger RNA sequences contain biases in each region of the molecule. Since nanopore always sequences RNA from the three prime to five prime direction of the molecule, these mRNA sequence patterns are implicitly encoded in the signal. So since the majority of RNA in a direct RNA sequencing library is mRNA, our hypothesis was that we could leverage the unique patterns and content, content of mRNA sequences as an additional layer of information during base calling. So shown here is our proposed architecture. Uh, a raw nanopore signal is normalized and segmented into overlapping chunks. Each chunk is then fed into a model trained using CTC loss which outputs for each time step in the input, the probability distribution across the possible, nucle across the possible nucleotides. We then uh, propose an efficient approach to assemble the overlapping CTC matrices before decoding the matrix into the final nucleotide sequence. So to do this, we proposed a modified CTC beam search algorithm, which conditionally incorporates a model of mRNA language to guide the decoding when there's sufficient entropy in the signal prediction. So I'll just show an example of uh, how the mRNA model can assist with the decoding of the nanopore signal. So the upper panel shows the normalised signal segment, which is what gets fed into that signal to sequence model. Then the lower panel visualises the CTC matrix that's output by that model. And this gives, as I said, a probability distribution across the possible bases for each time step with the blank symbol B also required um, to denote a null prediction, which is required by CTC to distinguish between repeated nucleotides. So beneath uh, are the nucleotide sequences obtained from decoding the CTC matrix 
without the mRNA model, which is the first row. The second row is with the mRNA model. And then the third row is the reference sequence. So in this example, the mRNA model resolves the substitution error at the last nucleotide. Um, the signal to sequence model you can see outputs similar probabilities for A and G with those orange and green spikes, um, but the mRNA model favours inclusion of the correct nucleotide G given that context that's come before it. So we optimised the RNA model and decoding hyperparameters um, and then tested it on an independent test set and overall found um, that the mRNA model provides a very small improvement to overall base calling accuracy and a reduction in error rate. So although this accuracy improvement is really modest, we think that this work opens up an interesting area of research in the utility of biological language models for nanopore signal processing in general. And future research directions include the incorporation of RNA modifications or other sequence features into the language model. So this study provides the first framework for language informed direct RNA base calling um, and lays the foundation for what we hope will be further dedicated RNA based calling developments. So if you want any more details or you're interested, come check out my poster or preprint article um, online. And I'd just love to thank my supervisors, at the John Curtin School of Medical Research. Um, and thank you for giving me the chance to present. So that's all from me. Thank you so much, Alex. So um, we're going to have a 30 minute break. And at 4 p.m. Pacific time, which is in 30 minutes from now, we'll have our poster session. Um, and so that um, you guys all know, so we're, we have two poster sessions. It's all the same posters. We're encouraging all the presenters to present at both sessions in case some people can make it to one but not the other. Um, so see you all at the poster session and thank you so much for the nice presentations. Uh, and just as a, for people who don't have the link currently, um, I'm just putting that up on the uh, website for the poster session. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, the link is also in the, inside the schedule. And um, if you look inside the schedule, you'll see a list of all the posters that will be presented.